day one. I still remember the night before. I'd gone out to celebrate a friend's birthday. We had no idea it would be the last normal night of life on Earth. At just past 6 in the morning, I was woken up by a massive roaring sound and a bright flash of light. It felt like a giant body slammed me as I got picked up and thrown out of my bed. Good thing, too, because the ceiling came crashing down where my bed used to be. The entire side of my three-story apartment building ripped away and a hurricane-force wind as hot as an oven washed over me, giving me first and second degree burns, and I was one of the lucky ones. Anybody caught out in the street was instantly vaporized or torn to shreds by the pressure wave. I found out later that it was a quirk in our local geography that saved my life because the buildings 300 feet north of me and toward the detonation point just happened to be on a slight hill about 45 feet higher than my apartment building, causing the hill to absorb most of the pressure wave, sparing me and a few other survivors. When my hearing came back, I thought about trying to save people but remembered that immediately after a nuclear explosion, you have about 10 to 15 minutes to find shelter from the fallout. So I immediately grabbed what few supplies I could get my hands on and ran for the underground parking garage of our apartment building. On the way, I yelled at a few survivors to join me, but only four of them did. The rest were too dazed or confused to pay attention, or were too busy trying to dig out buried friends and family from the rubble. Sadly, it would soon be too late for them as well as a massive cloud of radioactive fallout crashed over the city after being swept miles up into the air by the initial blast. There was nothing we could do as the five of us huddled in a storage closet on the second basement level of our apartment building. I don't even know when night came, I just remember finally falling asleep from pure emotional exhaustion. Days 2 through 7 In my first week surviving nuclear war, there wasn't much to do except make our shelter better. Luckily, the people I was with had been as fast thinking as me, so we had barely enough water between us to survive a week if we rationed it. Food was something else. Even rationing it, the food would only last about four days. That's okay. Water's more important than food. Every 24 hours that you can remain away from radioactive fallout, the danger level drops exponentially, so we knew we had to stay in our shelter for at least a week to get to survivable levels of fallout. The power had gone out immediately after the bomb's impact from the massive EMP blast that it caused. It had burned out all of our electronics, including phones, so even if we had reception, it would have been impossible to get news from the outside world. Inside our shelter were me, my two neighbors, Lilith and Alexis, and the elderly couple who lived down the hall from us, Mr. and Mrs. Vasquez. We tried to piece together what had happened to us, and Mr. Vasquez was sure that shortly after the first blast, he heard a second one in the distance. That confirmed it for me. Whatever happened to LA wasn't an accident or a nuclear terrorist attack. The fact that there were multiple impacts means this was an attack by a modern ICBM carrying multiple warheads. This left only Russia or China, which left us with a bigger question. Was the world at nuclear war, or was this just a single attack? With no working radio or telephone, it was impossible to tell. We huddled in that basement until the end of seven days, lit only by an old flashlight that Mrs. Vasquez had brought with that had incredibly survived the EMP blast. Days 8 through 12. I knew it was dangerous to leave our shelter even after seven days. Ideally, you want to remain in place for 10 to 14 days until radioactive particles have lost most of their energy, but we were out of water and Mrs. Vasquez was looking really bad. Me, Alexis, and Lilith had all given up our last two days of water rations for her, despite her initial refusal, but eventually she accepted. At this point, the danger comes from inhaling radioactive particles, or having them land on exposed skin, and getting into cuts, scrapes, or even wounds. Once inside, they bathe your body with radioactivity, and despite being very low yield, it's still dangerous enough to kill you if you breathe in a lot of particles. We used the very last of our water to soak up several rags and put them around our mouths and noses and did our best to cover up any exposed skin. When we finally dug our way out of the parking garage and into the city, we were shocked by what we saw. The famous LA skyline was gone. Only a few skeletal remains of our big downtown buildings remained. Our neighborhood had been completely devastated by the impact. It was an absolute miracle we survived. But that also meant that we were in the most dangerous fallout area, being so close to the point of detonation. We had to move, and we had to move fast. What affected us the most was the bodies. There wasn't much left of the people who'd been caught in the open when the bomb exploded, and what was left now was the remains of the people who had choked to death on radioactive dust or burned from within after inhaling vast quantities of it. These people had survived the impact but hadn't taken proper shelter. They were probably forced out into the streets in a desperate attempt to find help or food or water. Instead, they found more radioactive dust. It was a sober reminder that we needed to take decontamination of our clothes and bodies very seriously once we found a better long-term shelter. We decided to head out of downtown LA and head toward the San Fernando Valley. It was unlikely that the valley would have taken a direct hit, 
since there wasn't really much of commercial or military value there. Plus, the Bob Hope Airport is a federal emergency response site, meaning this is where the government would send rescue and supplies in an emergency. It's likely whoever attacked us might have known this and targeted the valley anyway, but it was the best course of action available to us. However, we needed water and food, as we were all feeling faint, so we picked our way through the debris and traveled just over a mile before we found a corner store which had been blasted open. Luckily for us, there was still plenty of sealed water and other drinks, as well as food on the stock shelves. The plastic would be enough to keep things from being contaminated, but to be safe, we only took items from the very rear of the shelves, stuff that would have had the least amount of radioactive dust sitting on it after a few days. I insisted we hunker down, now that we had food and water, and wait for the weak mark so that nearly all of the most dangerous radioactive fallout would fade to acceptable levels. We found a garage just outside the blast zone and packed it with food and water, then closed the door behind us, and we waited. Days 13 and 14. We had plundered some extra clothes from the ruins so that we could change out of the radioactive dust-covered clothing, and we were careful to seal up all the outside openings with duct tape so that the dust wouldn't blow in. We even wasted precious water to carefully wash ourselves free of the dangerous dust. That required the buddy system, and I have to admit, I was glad that Alexis chose me as her buddy. She lived next door to me for a few months now, and I'd always had a crush on her. I guess there's worse people I could have gotten stranded in a post-apocalyptic world with. But was it really the apocalypse, or was it just a local event? Maybe the US and Russia or China just exchanged a tit-for-tat attack, and then the powers that be thought better of plunging the entire world into nuclear hell. There was just no way of knowing. Before we entered our shelter, we had scanned the skies looking for any sign of air traffic, but never saw or heard a single plane or helicopter. That bothered me. But the military and government could very well be busy dealing with catastrophes elsewhere. It didn't necessarily mean the world had come to an end. Mrs. Vasquez had been hiding her hurt foot, but eventually the pain was too much for her and she came clean, showing it to us. She must have injured it sometime during the attack and when we ventured out of our shelter, radioactive dust had gotten into the wound. It looked brackish and brown, and the brown was spreading. Plus, she'd started coughing and looking pale. None of us wanted to say it, but we all knew she was dying. The radioactive debris had entered her bloodstream and spread around her body. Radioactivity was burning her alive from the inside out. Days 15 to 20. Mrs. Vasquez died on day 15, just as we decided it was finally safe enough to walk around outside. The group would have to get used to people dying, if the worst had really happened, but it hit us really hard. We'd become a small family in the last two weeks, and as far as we knew it, we were the only survivors in a city of millions. We were literally all we had. We couldn't bury Mrs. Vasquez because that would mean stirring up the radioactive dirt, so instead we sealed her inside the garage and marked the door with spray paint, promising to come back and give her a proper burial when we could. The group took extra precautions against dust and debris. Just because most of the radioactivity had died down by now, it didn't mean travel was safe. But we had to keep moving. Our supplies would only last a few more days, so we had to find another safe location to raid for food and water. Plus, all of us were eager to make it to the valley and find out if the rest of the world had survived or not. We kept traveling east, away from downtown, eventually making it to the 101 freeway. It was hard going through since it was choked with all kinds of cars and debris. Sometimes we had to climb over stacks of cars, like they were small mountains, though most of the time we were forced to detour to find a way around, because there was no way Mr. Vasquez was getting over them even with the help of ropes. Days 21 through 22. Alexis and I had been talking a lot at night, away from Lilith and Mr. Vasquez. We were all doing everything we could for Mr. Vasquez, but he was getting slower by the day, and there was nothing wrong with him physically. I think he was just too heartbroken and overwhelmed to go on. I couldn't imagine living through a nuclear attack and then losing the woman I'd loved for over 50 years. I guess maybe I too would want to give up. Alexis asked me if I'd ever leave anyone behind, even if they were slowing the group down. I told her absolutely not. She smiled and grabbed my hand for a second, giving it a firm squeeze. I couldn't help but smile back. But despite our constant encouragement, Mr. Vasquez was slowing down. He insisted once or twice that we go on ahead. He'd catch up with us, but we refused. On day 22, just before setting up camp inside a destroyed city bus, I heard something shuffling around outside. When I went to investigate, I was shocked to find a dog. It was a poodle something mix. You could tell he was really hungry from how skinny he was. I was amazed we hadn't found anybody or anything else that had survived yet in the last three weeks. Just tons of corpses, of people who had died trying to flee the city only to run into the fallout. He was nervous. Obviously, he'd been alone for the last three weeks. But his instincts to seek out people eventually won, and he came over when I called him. The group gathered together to meet him, and incredibly he was still wearing a collar with a tag that read Lucky. Well, 
He was definitely lucky to have survived the explosion and the fallout, so the name suited him perfectly. Having him join us really lifted all our spirits, and we needed it badly. Even Mr. Vasquez smiled for the first time since his wife died. The next day we set out again with renewed vigor. Days 23 through 26. Traveling from downtown to the San Fernando Valley on a normal day can take up to an hour thanks to traffic. It was taking us over two weeks because of all the wrecks, debris, and need to stop and constantly replenish our supplies. Mr. Vasquez wasn't helping matters either. He had briefly perked up after Lucky joined our group, but he soon was lagging behind again. I didn't blame him. His heart was broken. I couldn't imagine the pain of losing someone you've spent half a century with. But when I did try, I caught myself looking over in Alexis's direction. Sometimes I caught her looking back my way too. On day 26, we met another two survivors, a brother and a sister duo, who had the same idea as us. They'd survived inside a house just outside downtown, and Annie, the sister, had been smart enough to make Ben, her brother, shelter in place with her until after the fallout settled. Annie told us she was sure there were other survivors still huddled up in houses around the city, but there were so many corpses in the streets that we were sure most people had died from fallout poisoning. We were glad to have more company, especially Lilith, who had been feeling a little lonely since me and Alexis were hanging out so much. Day 27 Mr. Vasquez didn't wake up on the morning of the 27th day. There was nothing physically wrong with him, he'd just given up. It was still far too dangerous to dig, so we laid him to rest best we could and said a few words, promising to try to get word to any surviving relatives. Days 28 through 32 we were moving slightly faster now, but the freeway had suffered serious enough damage in parts that we were forced to leave it and head to the side streets, which slowed us down again. However, that's where we found something truly chilling, a body. But this wasn't like the other bodies we'd been finding since we left our shelter. This was different. It was fresh, maybe just a few days old, and the cause of death was obvious. Someone had shot this person and left them to die. The fact that the body had been stripped of anything valuable told us everything we needed to know. Everyone's worst fear had come to pass. There was at least one group of looters out here, preying on travelers. I suppose it was inevitable. I remember a quote from somewhere that went something like, Civilization only lasts as long as the lights are on. We were now on the lookout for weapons to defend ourselves with, and we decided to take a detour to a local gun shop that Ben knew about in the area. Given the condition of the roads, it would take us a few days, but if it was still standing, it'd be more than worth it. Days 33 through 35. It took us just over three days to get to the gun shop, which took us way off course. When we arrived, though, it was clear we weren't the first to have this idea, which was kinda good news as it meant more people had survived multiple nuclear detonations over Los Angeles. It was also bad news, though, given the evidence we'd seen of someone killing and looting survivors. The front of the gun shop had collapsed in on itself, so we had to force our way in through the rear. Ben and I went first, and we were shocked to be greeted by the business end of a shotgun. A dirty, crazy-looking old man was in there, and he thought we were after him. Luckily, we managed to calm him down. Turns out we'd gotten to the shop shortly after he did and inadvertently startled him. I didn't want to, but Alexis insisted on offering that he join our group. I had a weird feeling about him. I mean, it's good he didn't blow our heads off, instead talk to us, but there was just something off about him. My guess is he already had been suffering from some kind of mental illness, and the nuclear attack pushed him right off the deep end. He had no problem with us helping ourselves to what was left, but he insisted on taking all the shotgun ammo he could carry, which didn't leave much for us. Then he crawled out the same way we crawled in and just left, waving away Alexis's offer for him to join us. She sighed a breath of relief when he declined. Then I got embarrassed. I could tell back in the real world she'd been a genuinely good person, and she probably felt guilty about being relieved that the crazy old man had ignored her offer. Lilith had some firearms experience since she'd grown up hunting with her dad in Ohio, and I had some due to a few years in the Army Reserves when I was younger. Between the both of us, we did our best to train Alexis, Ben, and Annie on how to use the handguns we gave them, and then taught them how to shoot in an alley a mile and a half away. We had plenty of ammo, so there was enough for target practice on the few handguns and two rifles we looted. We thought about setting up camp at the shop. It was definitely a secure place and we'd have ready access to more weapons and ammo, but then we thought twice about it. If we knew this place existed and the crazy old man knew the location of the former gun shop, it's likely other survivors would too, and I didn't like the idea of us attracting attention. Days 36 through 40. Alexis didn't like that I was trying to avoid other people, but I just wanted to keep our group safe. We decided that we'd sleep in as long as we could in daytime and then travel mostly in the latter half of the day and at night. It would help us avoid any unwanted attention. Alexis complained about this. I could tell she really wanted to help anyone that might still be out there. But just as we got back to the 101 freeway, we saw another fresh body. 
That put an end to Alexis's complaints about us purposely avoiding other survivors. I could tell Alexis was scared after finding the second body. She refused to leave my side when we finally set up camp late at night. I tried talking to her about the old world, reassuring her there was no way the entire world went to war with nuclear weapons. All we had to do was get out of LA and we'd find civilization again. That made her feel a little bit better and she held my hand again. It was weird feeling so happy in the middle of an apocalypse, but holding her hand and having her fall asleep next to me just felt right. Days 41 through 46. Annie and I had discussed the two bodies we'd found, and when we found two more bodies, this time laying side by side, where they'd been gunned down, we came up with a plan. She had hunting experience, so she took point and led the way a few hundred feet ahead of the group. That way, she could scout out any trouble before we actually ran into it. I didn't think that there were bandits out there setting up ambushes, there just weren't enough survivors around. We'd heard people in the far distance once or twice but never actually came across anyone, so it was probably an unfortunate coincidence that us and whoever was killing the other survivors were traveling in the same direction. We likely had the same idea, get to the valley where there was bound to be safety. Day 47 On day 47, we finally reached the part of the 101 that passed in front of Universal Studios. We were officially in the valley, but things did not look good. There was plenty of destruction all around us, with the Hollywood Hills between the valley and the explosions in downtown LA and elsewhere. Most of the buildings here should have been spared. The best thing to do was get a good view of the local area. So we decided to climb up to the top of Mulholland Drive where there were a few scenic overlooks that couples used to go park their cars at night and look at the lights of the valley below. Days 48 through 51. It took us three days to make the climb up the hill because the hills were an absolute mess. Before nuclear Armageddon hit Los Angeles, the hills had been full of houses that were perched perilously on the steep Hollywood Hills landscape. This was dangerous enough given how frequently SoCal got rocked by earthquakes, but the nuclear blast had caused seismic activity so intense, most of the houses had slid down the hills and crashed into the streets below. This meant that climbing the lower portions of Mulholland was like trying to traverse a deadly obstacle course. Once we got to the upper portion of Mulholland though, we had a different problem. Here, entire sections of the road had been washed away by landslides, so we often had to find a completely different way around. Eventually though, we managed to get to the backside of Mulholland Drive where you could overlook the entire valley on a clear day. What we found made our hearts sink to the bottom of our chests. I'd been right about the enemy, whoever it was, targeting Bob Hope Airport because it was a federal emergency response location. You couldn't quite see the airport from our vantage point, but you could see the decimated ring of destruction that represented ground zero of an atomic blast. There was a similar ring over in the direction of Van Nuys, where another airport had once existed. In between the two rings of total annihilation was miles and miles of lesser but still overwhelming destruction. We set up camp as night fell so we could collect our thoughts. There'd be no help coming, it seemed. So our next course of action was clear. We had to get out of the city, but where to go? As we considered our options, we all heard a strange noise, something like the sky slowly tearing in two. Looking around us, we spotted two blinking lights far off in the distance, traveling south. That's when it hit us. It had been so long since we heard any air traffic that we'd almost forgotten what a jet engine sounded like. It was impossible to tell what type of aircraft it was, but we knew where it was headed and that was San Diego. Our spirits soared that night. And even Lucky must have felt it because he started happily barking along to our cheering. Someone had survived. The world hadn't ended after all. The attack was probably just on Los Angeles, maybe one or two other major cities, and a conventional war was still probably going on. But that's why there hadn't been an emergency response yet. The military was too busy. The rest of the US must still be humming along. That night, Alexis and I kissed for the first time. I guess the euphoria of knowing civilization had survived got the better of us, but I could tell she didn't regret it. In fact, she pulled me straight in for another kiss. I only wish we'd been more reserved about our celebration. I had no way of knowing that somebody else had not just seen the same airplane overhead, but heard us cheering wildly in the distance. Days 51 through 56. We had a new plan. Head south out of Los Angeles and follow the 5 freeway all the way to San Diego. It was a bit concerning because there were some important military installations there, but the fact that we saw a plane headed in that direction really lifted our spirits. Besides, the sad truth is we didn't have many options. It seemed like most of LA County had been obliterated in a nuclear strike, and the terrain around Los Angeles is not very hospitable. We could have headed north and tried to reach some of the smaller communities, but we figured that our best bet was to go somewhere the government would be invested in securing, and that meant San Diego. The way down the Hollywood Hills took us twice as long as the way up because the route was so unsafe, but at least we were able to raid the abandoned houses for supplies. We even found some new camping gear in one home and replaced some of our worn out tents and sleeping bags. 
What was really holding us back was the fact that we had to carry everything we owned on our backs, so we were limited on what we could take and how fast we could move. Days 57 through 62. Getting to the 5 freeway was an ordeal in and of itself. We decided to head through Burbank to get to it and past Universal Studios and the Warner Brothers film lots. They were nothing but smoking debris now, since we were so close to the impact site near Bob Hope. But it was incredible to think that just over two months ago these places were full of movie stars and thousands of people all making hit movies that would be watched around the world. Our group had gotten close in the last few weeks and Lucky was our de facto mascot. He really helped keep our spirits up. And with a goal in mind and the hope of seeing civilization again, the mood was generally positive, which is weird when you're passing by dozens of human remains every day. I could tell that Annie and Lilith were getting close, and that made me feel better because I was worried Lilith would think I had stolen Alexis away from her. Day 63 On day 63, Annie warned me that she thought someone was following us. She'd taken to scouting around us as we traveled. Sometimes she'd be out ahead, sometimes to one of our flanks, other times far behind us, catching up a few hours later. It was when she'd been lingering behind that she caught sight of a small plume of smoke a few miles behind us as we set up camp for the night. She spotted it three nights in a row, so she didn't think it was a coincidence. Then again, the 5 freeway would be the obvious choice for anyone traveling to safety in San Diego, so I wasn't convinced it was a threat. Besides, we hadn't run into any more fresh victims from whoever was out there killing people. She reluctantly agreed, but I could tell she wasn't convinced. I wish I'd listened to her. Days 64 through 68. We were finally outside of LA County and here the destruction lightened up. We caught sight of two more planes and that sent an electric shock of excitement through the group. The US had survived after all. Travel was faster outside of the main blast zones, but it seems as if multiple warheads had leveled not just most of LA County, but the surrounding cities as well. That makes sense. SoCal is obviously one of the most economically important parts of the US, especially Los Angeles, so it's obvious an enemy would try to destroy as much of it as possible. We picked up some bicycles from a mostly intact sporting goods store and managed to use them to carry more supplies, which made life a lot easier. Lucky had a blast keeping up with the bikes, and we had to ride slowly most of the time anyway because of all the debris, but we were making good time. By my count, we can make San Diego in a week or two at most at this rate. Day 69 Somebody took Lilith shortly after we set up camp for the night. She excused herself to use the bathroom, and we heard a brief struggle in the distance and then nothing. We immediately set out, but we couldn't find her. Annie picked up a trail, though, of what she thought was at least three people with a fourth being dragged. Her old hunting skills really came into play as she immediately set out to track Lilith's kidnappers, but I had to stop her because my own military skills warned me against rushing straight into what could be an ambush. Annie and Alexis were both adamant that we set out right away, but I calmed them down by pointing out the fact that whoever took Lilith wanted her dead, they would have just attacked our camp. Finally, they agreed, so we waited until it got really dark, then followed the trail. I followed the group from the left flank though at a distance so I could remain on scene with my rifle. Turns out though that whoever took her had horses. How would they manage to survive through the attack and fallout I'll never know, but there were clear signs of where the horses had been tied up and then the tracks that led north into the wreckage of the city. Now I felt stupid because my insistence that we wait until it was fully dark had cost us an hour of pursuit time. Maybe we could have gotten to them before they got to their horses. At least we had tracks to follow. Day 70 and 71 it took us a day and a half of following the tracks to finally catch up with the kidnappers. They had holed themselves up in a surviving strip mall in the city of industry right outside LA. I guess they didn't expect us to follow for so long and so far because it didn't look like they were expecting visitors. Now we just had to hope that Lilith was alive. Annie and I were the best qualified for a rescue mission so we waited until nightfall again and snuck up to the edge of their little compound. You could tell they were starting to secure the area because there were makeshift barricades in the middle of being constructed. But there were no guards posted. Instead, we heard laughing and some screaming coming from one of the buildings. Then suddenly the screaming cut off into a choking gurgle. With growing pits in our stomachs, we snuck over to the building where all the sound was coming from. Peering in through a broken window, we spotted a group of five all huddled around a fire, with a sixth figure chopping something up. To our horror, we realized what he was chopping. A person. That must have been who had screamed before being butchered. With a sigh of relief though, we spotted Lilith chained up against a far wall. Whoever was being butchered, we guessed, about to be cooked, at least it wasn't her. Annie and I came up with a plan. We were both pretty good shots and angry as hell, so we waited until this crew of six settled into their disgusting meal and then split up. She attacked from one side while I attacked from the other, catching them between us. Annie opened fire first, shooting one of the cannibals in the chest, and then I started unloading. We dropped three instantly, with the third reaching for a pistol and taking a shot in my direction. Annie got him clean between the eyes as I ducked for cover. 
then finished off one of the two survivors who took off running. I immediately gave chase for the surviving runner. I didn't want any part of this evil troop to survive and prey on other innocents. Annie, meanwhile, went to rescue Lilith, in case there were more around somewhere. The survivor turned a corner a few dozen feet ahead of me, and then I heard two gunshots almost simultaneously, followed by a scream I recognized as Alexis. Turning the corner, I found the surviving runner laying on the ground, clutching his leg. Across from him lay Ben, dead, from a gunshot to the chest. Ben had come to try to help when he heard gunfire, and when the two ran into each other, the cannibal had been the better shot. With a roar of rage, I turned my gun on the survivor and pulled the trigger. Days 72 through 76. If there were other cannibals around, they didn't bother to give chase after the rescue. We didn't bury Ben either, because of fear of contaminated soil. But we covered him with rocks and a makeshift cairn like our ancestors used to. Annie was inconsolable, but having Lilith back helped. Our world had become cruel and deadly faster than any of us could imagine. Days 77 through 82. The road to San Diego was harder than we expected. The freeway had been packed when the bombs fell, so there were a lot of vehicles getting blown around by the superheated hurricane winds. We spotted another group of travelers in the distance heading north, and Alexis wanted to make contact with them. However, both Annie and I put our foot down and absolutely refused. We weren't taking any more risks. Days 83 through 89. The freeway was now running near the beach, and the sound of the ocean was almost comforting. Or it would have been if the beaches below us weren't covered in debris that had been washed out to sea and then right back on the waves. As far as the eye could see, the beaches were covered in the debris of an entire coastal city, destroyed in nuclear hellfire. Back in LA, the skies were perpetually covered in black sooty clouds. Out here, the ocean winds created gaps in the clouds, but most of the time, all we had over our heads was thick brownish clouds. We all knew that trillions upon trillions of pounds of debris had been blown up into the sky in the attacks, but could there really be so much that it covered the entire sky in dust and debris? As we neared San Diego, I was getting more and more nervous. Day 90. We spotted another airplane overhead, this time unmistakably a fighter jet. It came in from the ocean and seemed to head in the direction of San Diego before coming up north in our direction and curving back out to sea. Looking through a set of powerful binoculars we'd looted, Lilith swore that she could vaguely see the outline of an aircraft carrier out there in the horizon. We had to take her word for it, she had the sharpest vision of us all. She'd quickly taken to learning how to shoot the two rifles we'd brought with us and was proving to be a crack shot. Lilith was determined to never be helpless again. Days 91 through 96. Progress slowed down again due to debris and the fact that we got caught up in a severe storm. This is rare because SoCal almost never has bad storms in the summertime. We noticed that the temperature had been dropping slowly over the last three months as well despite it being the middle of July. We thought about setting out rain catches to help replenish our water supplies, but I thought better of it once I saw how greasy the rain was as it fell. My fears that the skies above were still polluted with debris from the bombs proved true. The rain had come down hard for two full days, and when it finally cleared there was no sunshine, just big puddles of sick smelling water left behind. Luckily, we could still find plenty of convenience stores left abandoned with shelves full of drinking water. Days 97 through 99. Something wasn't right. The lights from San Diego should have been visible at night for the last two days despite the heavy cloud cover. Alexis figured it could have been the EMP blast from the attacks on Los Angeles. I wanted to believe her, but I couldn't shake the gnawing feeling at the bottom of my stomach. Even Lucky felt it too. His normally happy self was looking increasingly worried, probably from picking up on the group's stress. Day 100. There was no denying it. San Diego had been hit by a nuclear attack alongside Los Angeles. That explained the lack of lights or traffic coming from the city. We finally traveled close enough to see it for ourselves. The skeletal remains of the iconic San Diego skyline far in the distance. The group was too crushed to do anything but set up camp early. If there was no safety in San Diego, then where could we go? Just how far had the war spread? That night, we got our answer. Far out at sea, somewhere in the direction that Lilith swore she'd seen the outline of an aircraft carrier, came a blinding white flash followed by a dull roar a minute after. I knew what I'd just seen, but it took me a while to pull myself together to explain it to the group. Whoever had attacked the United States with nuclear weapons had just struck again, this time destroying a carrier battle group just off the coast of Southern California. LA hadn't been the victim of a single attack, and nuclear war hadn't destroyed the entire world. Nuclear war was destroying the world, because it was still being waged. A half hour after the explosion at sea, three plumes of fire from somewhere deep inside the United States lit up the night sky briefly before disappearing into space. Nuclear intercontinental ballistic missiles from fields in the American heartland to strike back at whoever just hit us again. The war was clearly ongoing. While everyone had expected World War III to be over in an hour, we were dragging it out over weeks and even months, hitting tit for tat as one major city after another got wiped off the map. How far had it gone? 
Where would it stop? What was even left? Day 101. Nuclear war had devastated the west coast of America. Los Angeles and San Diego were gone, wiped off the map by multiple impacts by either Russian or Chinese nuclear weapons. Off the coast of San Diego, an entire carrier strike group, probably the only one left in the entire Pacific, was wiped out a day ago by another nuclear strike. That's how we found out the war wasn't over. It was still going on. Our group was down to me, Alexis, Lilith, Annie, and our loyal dog companion, Lucky. In just a hundred days, we'd have lost so many already, and it seemed impossible to believe that just three months ago, I was living a normal life in a normal modern city. Now I was trying to figure out how to rally the group's spirits. We'd seen the dangers of giving up already. That's how we lost Mr. Vasquez, shortly after the bombs fell. San Diego was not an option for us. The ruins would be still too irradiated, and besides, it suffered from the same problem as any SoCal city. No real natural resources. SoCal gets most of its water from elsewhere, but that intricate system of aqueducts and pumps largely requires electricity and maintenance to function. We had to get somewhere we could survive long term, or at least last long enough, to make a real plan. Our best option was Big Bear, a small mountain community in the mountains outside Los Angeles. It has a large lake for fresh water that's well stocked with fish, and the local mountains are teeming with wildlife. Back in the old world, it was a getaway for Angelinos. Now it was our best chance at survival. With vehicles no longer working due to bad fuel and the EMP blasts, we'd be on foot, using our bikes when we could. And it wouldn't be a short journey. Plus, we already knew of at least one dangerous cannibal community in Los Angeles outskirts, and there was no telling what else was waiting for us out here. With heavy hearts, we turned around and went back the way we came. Days 102 to 106. It was good to be on the move again. It helped get everyone's minds off the crushing disappointment of finding out the world was waging a nuclear war. During our rest breaks, Lilith took to practicing with the rifles we looted. After being abducted by the cannibals, she was determined to never be that vulnerable again, and thanks to me and Annie's coaching, she was becoming pretty proficient. Deep down inside, something told me she'd need those skills. At night, we'd see the occasional moving bright spot of light, which could only be a high-flying military plane. There were no more commercial airliners in the sky, and I wondered if that was only in this part of the country or everywhere. The way I figured, us and whoever we were at war with were striking each other's cities one by one in the most destructive game of one-upsmanship in history. It makes sense the West Coast got taken out first, and I was willing to bet the story was the same on the East Coast. America's most important government and financial centers were all on the coasts. The heartland was probably relatively untouched, and I imagine that the enemy, whoever they were, was slowly bombing its way inward from the coast until one side admitted defeat. We were probably doing the same to them. Day 107. We spotted him long before he saw us, a distant figure coming down the highway toward us. Through Annie's binoculars, he looked as if he might be in his late teens or early twenties. Definitely looked worse for the wear, unarmed and carrying only a backpack. Lilith immediately wanted to hide and let him pass by us, sparking a fierce debate. I can't blame her for not trusting strangers after almost being eaten alive by cannibals, but Alexis refused to let this world change us the way it did those cannibals. If civilization was going to survive, it needed good people to stand up for what was right. Besides, he was alone and unarmed. She made a convincing point. Annie and I went ahead of the group while Lucky, Alexis, and Lilith stayed behind. Lilith covered us with a rifle. She'd become a good enough shot that if this kid tried anything, I was confident she'd put him in the dirt. The kid didn't seem surprised to see us, but he was definitely a little bit apprehensive. He said his family got killed by raiders two months after the bombs and he'd been walking south to San Diego, hoping that at least the military base there had survived. We broke the bad news and his shoulders slumped. He had nowhere to go, and I couldn't just let him walk off alone. Besides, the bigger our group, the stronger we would be, so I offered he'd join us. With a big smile, he happily agreed, and introduced himself as Robbie. That night at camp, I noticed Lilith was keeping a close eye on Robbie. She'd changed since her ordeal. She used to be… lighter. Now she was serious most of the time. It scared me a little. Having Annie helped, and for her part, Annie barely budged from Lilith's side. Losing her brother Ben had been a huge blow, but having Lilith near really helped. I couldn't help but wonder if Lilith felt guilty considering Ben had died trying to rescue her. But I pushed those thoughts out of my mind and instead let my focus be on the positive. Lilith and Annie weren't the only ones to find love in the apocalypse, and I snuggled in to sleep next to Alexis, waiting to get woken up for my turn to take watch. Days 108 to 112. When we told Ben our plan to get to Big Bear, he agreed wholeheartedly, 
and even suggested that we take the desert roads instead of the 5 freeway to cut down on travel time. Plus, it'd be less likely we'd run into cannibals or raiders on the move in remote roads. That was a good idea, so we left the 5 behind and headed east into the desert. Luckily, there are still desert communities out here, and gas stations popped up regular enough that we could top up on supplies as needed. Some of them had been scavenged pretty hard already, but we had plenty of supplies to make it to Big Bear even if we didn't find anything on the way. For the millionth time since the bombs fell, I found myself shaking my head. Four months ago, my biggest concern was Diablo Immortal being a microtransaction hell. Now, I was in literal hell, and my biggest concerns were radiation poisoning, cannibals, and dehydration. Days 113 to 117. Despite relatively open roads and our bikes, we weren't making very good time. The heat during the day was oppressive, so we traveled at night, but it was still hot enough to sweat. Besides, we didn't have a bike for Robbie and had yet to find one, so we were forced to move at his pace. We were getting near the Salton Sea. I knew it because you could literally smell it. If there was anywhere in the world that resembled a nuclear apocalypse before the bombs fell, this was it. Once it had been a vibrant resort community after the Colorado River flooded over irrigation canals in 1905 and poured into the Salton Basin, humans did what humans do best and took advantage of the impromptu giant lake as a vacation spot. A sprawling resort community sprung up along the banks of the sea and it was a popular getaway destination for decades. But soon the only water flowing into the sea was agricultural runoff which made the sea 50% saltier than the ocean. The wildlife began to die off and massive blooms of algae poisoned the water. People left the once thriving community around the sea, letting the desert retake the land and leaving homes, hotels, and shops completely abandoned. Now the sea was so overrun with toxic algae and dead fish that it stunk for miles around. It was an ecological disaster, but I guess that didn't matter much anymore. Robbie warned us about Slab City, a rough and tumble lawless community that existed before the bombs fell on the east banks of the Salton Sea. He said he'd heard rumors that it had become a focus for bandits and raiders, and he was sure the group that killed his family had come from there. We decided to set double watch while we slept, just in case. Day 118. I woke up to a rifle in my face. On the other end of it was Robbie. Please, you don't understand. Don't make me shoot you. I should have listened to Lilith. That's what you get for trying to be good in a post-apocalyptic wasteland. He'd subdued Lilith and Annie already and chased Lucky out of the camp. I was surprised I'd slept through what must have been a brief struggle. Both girls were handcuffed and gagged and glaring daggers at him. But Lilith's knuckles were bruised, Robbie's right eye was rapidly swelling and turning purple. There was also a bite on his arm from Lucky. Well, there was nothing I could do, he had the drop on me. I could only cooperate and try to find an opportunity later. Doing something now would mean he'd shoot me and then probably shoot Alexis next as she lay sleeping next to me. He tossed me handcuffs for myself and Alexis. And once we were gagged as well, he rounded up all our group's weapons. Then from his backpack he pulled out a flare gun and fired it into the air. A minute later there was a response from flares somewhere in the desert. Robbie stayed quiet as he waited for whoever was coming, avoiding our gazes. We'd been kind to him when we could've left him to fend for himself on the road except, of course, he wasn't really by himself. He'd been an infiltrator sent to gain our trust and disarm us, probably to steer us in the direction of the Salton Sea. But he didn't look happy about the situation. The one time he looked at me and we locked eyes, he apologized again, shaking his head and repeating what he'd said earlier. I'm so sorry, you just don't understand. I could swear he was on the verge of tears. But then we heard them, the sound of people approaching, a group of about eight, all of them armed and looking surprisingly well. I guess I expected bandits or raiders or cannibals or whoever these people were to be dirty and disheveled, but this group looked clean and healthy. For a moment I hoped that this was a different group possibly coming to our rescue. Those hopes were dashed when the apparent leader stepped forward, a giant of a man with a wide smile on his sunburned face. He clapped Robbie on the shoulder hard enough to nearly topple him over. Good job, boy. It just brought you and your sister a few more weeks of life. He had a cruel smile as he looked over us. All of you look healthy. Good. We won't have to eat any of you. You're my property now. I'm Billy. Remember that name. You're coming with us and you're gonna work. And if you don't, you die. Simple as that. They dragged us onto our feet and prodded us forward and into the desert, heading east. Day 119. Billy had proclaimed himself feudal lord over a large swath of what was once the most productive farmland in the country, just on the southern end of the Salton Sea. This area had grown everything from oranges to avocados, all fed by the mighty Colorado River. The system of canals that fed the water all the way here to California had apparently been damaged somewhat and farmable land had shrunk, but there was still a surprising amount of rich farmland here, and Billy controlled all of it. A slabber, as residents of Slab City used to call themselves, 
He left the big city life and headed out for the anonymity of living in the desert, outside of the law. When the bombs fell, he saw his opportunity and he took it. Now the farmers who used to work this land still did, alongside their families, along with large groups of wanderers and other survivors, all of them slaves. And we were the newest additions. The rules were explained to us on the way. If you didn't work, you got shot. If you talked back, you got shot. If you tried to run away, well, it was the middle of the desert and outside this patch of oasis there was nowhere to go. They still didn't come to look for you, but the desert would probably kill you before they found out. And if it didn't, you got shot. The women and men were split up at night, but worked together during the day. Billy explained that if we behaved ourselves, he'd eventually let us live together with our family or friends during the off hours. It was a reward for good behavior. But no matter which way he painted it, it was clear. We were slaves and his property. We now existed only to keep the farms alive and producing food. It all made sense now. These guys were living well off this rich farmland and their slave labor force. Without a doubt, most of them were living better than before the bombs fell, back when they were just slavers out in the desert. Most of them had criminal records, so the transition to killing and slavery had been an easy one. I fought down the growing pit in my stomach as they dragged Alexis away to join the rest of the girls. If anything happened to her, I'd kill everyone here, starting with Billy. Hell, I was already planning on it, I just had to find a way to get free first. Days 120 to 127. A surprising variety of crops grow here, and the prevailing winds meant that the radioactive fallout largely avoided settling along this stretch of desert. This made the fertile soil here possibly some of the most valuable real estate left in America, and it was run by a bunch of thugs. We worked from sunup to sundown. I'll give Billy's crew this much, they weren't outright cruel, but they punished you harshly if they thought you were being lazy. And of course, there was the ever-present threat of being shot for breaking any of their rules. I got to see Alexis, Annie, and Lilith during the workday, and it hurt my heart to only have a few brief moments with them before we were forced to return to our duties. While the men and women both worked the fields, they were segregated so the women worked one side of the fields and the men the other. I guess this was to keep the former families and friends from colluding, but all it did was fill me with a terrible rage. I can't believe how quickly humanity had fallen. There were about 70 slaves kept here, and Billy and his crew numbered at just over 20, so the odds were roughly 3 to 1 in our favor except they had all the guns. I'd have to find a way to fix that somehow. Day 128 to 132. Got to see the girls briefly today. Annie had a few bruises, apparently she stood up to a guard that was beating on one of the older women. She grinned wickedly though and proudly showed off her bruised knuckles. She'd obviously gotten her licks in too. I warned her to keep her temper under control. I didn't want anyone dying. I got to meet one of the other women as well. Her name was Ruslana. She was a Ukraine war veteran, had fought on the front lines against the Russians. When she was wounded, her family here in the US bought her a plane ticket to come live here. From what I hear, they practically had to drag her away from the war. Now she walked with a limp, the only real reason she'd been forced to leave. But one look in her eyes told me she was not done fighting. She told me she'd fought bullies before and she was going to do it again, but refused to elaborate further, simply saying in her broken English, when time come, you will know. She had steel in her eyes, and I later found out her name means lion. I believe it. The work was hard, the heat unbearable, but we had no choice but to keep toiling away until Ruslana's mystery plan went into action. Day 133. A group of us younger, more fit men got woken up early on day 133 and told to grab a few changes of clothing and be ready to march. I learned that we were going out to the old aqueduct system to conduct repairs. We'd be gone for several days. And that worried me, what if something happened to Alexis while I was gone? I got to see her before we left and she looked worried but I told her watch out for herself and the girls and I'd be fine. I even got to give her a quick kiss when no one was looking. On our way out, I caught sight of Ruslana grinning quietly her eyes flitting between each of the guards assigned to this special detail. There were 12 of us escorted by 5 guards, and I knew instantly what she was thinking. 5 less guards at the main camp. I knew Ruslana was going to make her move, whatever it was she was planning. I just prayed Alexis would stay safe, Annie and Lilith too. If Ruslana was planning an uprising, those two were guaranteed to be part of it. Day 134 through 137. It took us three days on foot to reach one of the damaged aqueducts that provided the crucial water the sprawling farms needed. Then it took three days to carry out general repairs, which largely consisted of moving huge slabs of concrete and rock after breaking them up with sledgehammers. One of the guys on our crew had been a civil engineer and he led the effort to conduct the rudimentary repairs, but he warned they wouldn't hold for longer than a few years at best. That was good enough for our guards who just shrugged their shoulders. There was no way to know what was going on back at camp. Without cell or satellite phones, there was no communication this far out. I barely slept at night. 
Knowing Ruslana was up to something dangerous. On the first day of repairs, I did spot a familiar yellow figure in the distance. I squinted my eyes, and to my surprise, it was Lucky. I can't believe I'd almost forgotten all about him. I was so stressed out since our capture that I completely forgot about our trusty canine companion. He'd fled shortly after biting Robbie when Annie yelled at him to get away. And now here he was, tailing us. But he wasn't coming near, it was like he had his own plan and was waiting to make a move. Days 138 through 144. Our guards grudgingly admitted we were in no shape to march back after five days of hard work and gave us one day off. Then on day 144, we started the march back to camp. I kept spotting Lucky in the distance and knew he was still trailing us. I didn't know what was going on back at camp, but I knew that Ruslana must have made her move by now. With five guards away, this was the best opportunity she'd have, and I couldn't let us get back into radio range so our guards could check in. If they found out the camp was overrun, they might just shoot us all, or try to use us as hostages to subdue everyone again. I couldn't let either happen. I got close with one of the other captives, Rob. Like me, Rob was a veteran, and in hushed conversations I told him what Ruslana had been planning, and what she'd likely done by now. He agreed we couldn't get into radio range. We came up with a plan. I'd love to say it was a good one, but it really wasn't. That night we agreed that I would say I had to do a number two and take one of the guards with me. Like we used to do when traveling, the guards slept in shifts, typically three slept at a time while two watched over us. That would leave only one guard awake. I didn't know exactly what he was planning, but he told me it was critical I neutralize my guard. I was eager to. The only shame was that Billy wasn't here, where Solana had probably gotten him by now. I said I had to use the bathroom, and with a disgusted grunt, one of the guards nodded at the desert as he stood up and grabbed his rifle. I scanned him real quick, and was relieved to see he wasn't carrying a sidearm of any kind just a knife down by his boot. Good though, I'd have to beat him to that knife. I egged him on to go further out than usual, telling him I had the Hershey squirts and this was going to be a real mess. None of us wanted it close to the camp. Reluctantly, my guard agreed and we went out about 100 meters from the camp. Then I dropped my pants and squatted. Predictably, he turned his back to me, not wanting to see me paint the desert floor in chocolate tones. I made my move. It's surprising how quickly old military training comes back to you. I'd spent years outside the wire on deployments in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Often, I had to spend the night outside the wire too. I knew how to move quietly. I must not have been quiet enough though, because he turned around just a second before I was ready to make my move. I'd been planning on silently choking him out from behind, but plan B would have to suffice. With all my strength, I delivered a right jab straight into his solar plexus, knocking the wind out of him. Then before he could recover, I sent an uppercut with my left hand that clicked his teeth together. When he hit the floor, he was out like a light. As if on cue, there was a series of gunshots back at the camp. I ran as fast as I could, grabbing my guard's rifle and flicking the safety off. There were two guards face down on the ground, and I spotted Rob and a third guard firing at each other simultaneously. Rob's aim was true, and he put one square between the guard's eyes, but the guard's sloppy shooting was still good enough to hit Rob as well. He went down clutching his chest. The fourth guard loomed over Rob and raised his rifle when I yelled and raised my own, getting his attention. Then I gently squeezed the trigger, and nothing happened. The old rusted slabber rifle had jammed. With a mean grin, the remaining guard turned his rifle toward me and raised the iron sights to his eye. I exhaled, and then a blur of yellow fur smashed into the guard. With a ferocious snarl, Lucky attacked the man, knocking him down to the ground, biting him and ripping at his arm and forcing him to drop the rifle. As I ran up, he was reaching for his sidearm, but I got there first. My rifle was jammed, but there's more than one way to kill with a rifle. I turned mine around, and as I'd been taught to do years ago, I introduced the guard's head to my solid wood buttstock. It was over in two hits. Day 145. Rob had been Air Force pararescue in the old world, so he knew enough about medicine to know he wasn't going to make it. The wayward shot had hit him far left in his lung, but it was accurate enough to leave him with a sucking chest wound and lungs slowly filling with fluid. There was nothing we could do for him. He asked that we leave him a pistol with one round and make it back to camp safely. I thanked him for what he did, and he shook it off in his typical way. With a heavy heart, we set out. Day 145 to 146. We moved a lot faster on the way back, motivated by the thought of our friends and family either being free or all dead. If Ruslana hadn't put a plan into action or if somehow the plan had failed, me and the other guys vowed to free them somehow. There were four rifles and a few handguns between us. We were hardly an army, but I'd studied and fought against insurgents for years. I knew how to fight superior numbers if it came down to it. Day 147. To my surprise, Ruslana's plan had gone off nearly without a hitch. The girls had used their charms to seduce the guards in small numbers to their quarters, and then subdued them. Starved of any real female attention after the end of the world, it worked like a charm, 
and before the rest of Billy's crew figured out what was going on, the girls had amassed enough firearms to equip a dozen experienced shooters. The violence had been brief and overwhelmingly in Ruslana's favor. Three of the workers had been killed along with four of the guards, the rest were now prisoners. I was overjoyed to see Alexis safe and sound, and threw my arms around her the moment I saw her. Annie and Lilith hugged me too, but I didn't hold them nearly as long as I held on to Alexis. The fear of losing her had been crippling. Lucky got plenty of hugs and kisses, especially when I told the girls how he'd saved me at the last moment. For his part, he gave plenty of wet sloppy kisses right back. Days 148 to 155. There was the question of what to do now that Billy and his crew had been overthrown. Plenty of the captives wanted to kill the lot of them, but Ruslana wasn't having any of it. Back home, she'd fought against lawless thugs invading her country and she wasn't about to become one herself. For various murders, kidnappings, and other crimes, Billy and his crew would live out their days in a makeshift prison. Tough, but fair, I suppose. I couldn't shake the feeling it was a mistake to lock Billy up. I would have probably put a bullet in him. Many of the former captives wanted to stay and make a home here. I couldn't blame them. The land was good, they'd have fresh water coming in via aqueducts for at least a few years more. But after a quick discussion, our group decided unanimously we'd be moving on. This place was an oasis for sure, but that was exactly what made it so dangerous. If Billy and his crew had noticed, so would others. I felt like we'd be safer. Alexis would be safer at Big Bear. Nice and remote, high up in the mountains. I even offered Ruslana to join us, but she refused. She was going to stay and teach these people how to protect themselves, make sure they were never slaves again. There was the question of Robbie. Robbie had been the one to lure us this way, and he'd been the one to disarm us and ensure our capture. To my great surprise, Lilith spoke up in his defense. Billy had been keeping Robbie's sister captive, threatening to kill her if the innocent-looking Robbie didn't lure in travelers to add to Billy's slaves. What would you have done if Alexis's life was on the line? Grudgingly, I admitted that it'd be unfair to punish him. But there was a problem, the rest of the former captives didn't trust him. Nobody wanted him here. Alexis said, fine, we'll take him and his sister with us. My jaw about hit the floor, but Alexis had a steely look in her eyes. She wasn't backing down from this one. Reluctantly, the rest of us agreed. It was either that or die alone in the desert. The poor kid had few if any real survival skills and his sister wasn't much better. After a week of rest, we said goodbye to Ruslana and I once again offered that she join us. I understood why her name meant lion. It was well deserved and I felt safer if she came with us, but once again she turned us down. She did promise though that one day when these people could take care of themselves, maybe, maybe she'd see us up in the mountains. Then she clasped me on the shoulder in a soldier's farewell. Days 155 to 159. We traveled north out of the southern Salton Sea area, sticking to the west side of the sea. Since we knew Slab City was on the east bank, there was no telling what other groups from the former lawless, unofficial city were still around. I imagined some of them might try to make a move on Billy's former territory, but they'd be sorry to run into Ruslana and her crew of Amazons if they did. I got to know Robbie better as we traveled, not because I wanted to, but because Alexis was making it a point to engage him in conversation. The rest of us may understand why he did what he did, but we weren't too happy about being betrayed like that. To my surprise though, Lilith was warming up to him, and I was relieved. After her abduction by cannibals, both me and Annie noticed she was becoming colder, more distant. I was worried we'd lose her forever after this ordeal, but the opposite seemed to be true. The former high school and college cheerleader wasn't as warm and bubbly as before the bombs fell, but she was making her way back to her real self. Robbie's sister was named Megan, or just Meg for short. She had asthma and was a bit sickly. Robbie had gotten used to taking care of her their whole life, and I guess I understood now why Billy's threats drove him to betray people like he did. Robbie would do anything for his sister, and I admired that in a way. None of us had any family left in this new world, and it would crush me to lose any of my friends. We were family now, the four of us, and of course Lucky, my fluffy guardian angel. Maybe in time Robbie and Meg too. Days 160 to 163. We didn't see the nuke go off, it was too far away, but we knew another bomb had struck thanks to the clouds. After a massive nuclear explosion, the type that kills cities, the clouds get blown outward for hundreds of miles as massively powerful wind gusts blow outwards from the epicenter. Far off in the distance toward the eastern skyline, we could see the edge of the telltale concentric ring of clouds, the pattern of a nuclear detonation powerful enough to wipe out a major metropolitan city. Judging from the direction, it was probably Las Vegas. The next two nights we saw bright streaks of light in the sky over our heads, rising ever higher until they disappeared into space. Our retaliation. One of our cities for two of yours. Then they'd hit two of our cities, and maybe we'd try to de-escalate by only hitting two of theirs, but how many cities were left to even hit anymore? 
Somewhere out there, far to the east, America was still alive and kicking, fighting World War III. Days 164 to 168, we traveled alongside the 10 freeway toward Banning, and then north up to San Bernardino. We didn't really want to travel anywhere near a freeway, where more raiders and bandits might be looking to prey on people, but we really had no choice. None of our paper maps showed any good routes to Big Bear aside from Highway 18, and to hop on there, we'd have to get to San Bernardino. Until we were well outside of the Sultan Basin, I insisted we travel only at night, which really slowed us down. Water was starting to become an issue, but luckily on the horizon I could see the urban sprawl that originated out of Los Angeles and spread south like a massive amoeba. That meant there'd be shops where we could refill our supplies. Days 169 to 172. It was still hazardous to walk through the ruins thanks to all the dust that laid everywhere. While most of the radioactivity had died down, some of the longer-lived elements would make the soil and dust poisonous for decades. We used t-shirts wet with water to breathe through the dustiest areas, but it wasn't a perfect solution, and Lucky refused to let us wrap one around his muzzle. In the end, we were all breathing in dangerous fallout, and would have to live with the fact that our lives would be shortened by several years at minimum. This was the new reality. Day 173. We came across another group today, and both of us immediately reached for our weapons. We'd been resupplying in an abandoned big box store when we sort of just ran into each other. The situation was real tense for a minute, as both groups sized each other up. Then I lowered my weapon slightly and said we were just passing through. There was enough supplies here for both groups, and they were welcome to them. The leader of their group, the older, grizzled man, seemed reluctant, but the woman, I'm assuming was his wife, egged him on. Then he lowered his rifle. She gave us a huge, warm smile, and for a moment my heart hurt. Kindness, so rare in this new world. But then I put my guard back up. I'd been fooled once before, and I couldn't help but glance at Robbie bitterly as I thought it. Couldn't afford to be fooled again, and put the girls in danger. The woman asked us where we were going, and Annie gave her a vague answer about heading up north somewhere. Alexis asked her where they were headed, and she seemed about to answer until she got a look from her husband. Somewhere east, she said. Then she looked at Alexis sadly, and I understood why. She saw a kindred spirit in Alexis, two women who both wear their hearts on their sleeves even after the world's gone to hell around them. It hurt me to see that look, knowing what me, Robbie, Annie, and Lilith had done to survive up to this point and what we'd do again if it called for it. Then the groups bid each other goodbye and good luck and parted ways. We'd set back out on the road with full packs and I vowed to protect Alexis, not just to keep her safe, but keep her from becoming like the rest of us. Days 174 to 176. It took us two days to make it to the foothills of San Gabriel Mountains, and I knew we were in for a hell of a climb. When people think about LA, they think beaches, sunshine, and surfing, but less than an hour from the city is an entire mountain range rising up to over 10,000 feet, and Big Bear Lake was 6,000 of those feet up into the mountains. There was nothing to do but grit our teeth and start the long, winding path up Highway 18, hoping that safety and sanctuary lay at the top of our long climb. Days 177 to 182. Winter was starting, and at sea level you'd hardly notice in the rest of SoCal, but up here in the mountains, winter is very much a thing. The temperature dropped dramatically as we climbed higher and higher, forcing us to put on warmer clothing. We even got some light snow, and soon there'd be much more on the way. There's ski resorts in these mountains, and Big Bear can get several feet of snow in the winter. But the snow that fell was just wrong, grayish and clumpy, leaving behind ashy slicks as it melted. Billions upon billions of tons of debris had been vaporized in the ongoing war and choked the atmosphere all over the earth. Now when you looked up, even in the clearest of days, there was a distinct gray smoggy haze between you and the sun. I know that Cold War reports on nuclear winter had been found to be overblown, but I couldn't help but wonder how bad things were going to get if more cities went up in plumes of fiery ash. Modern estimates said the temperature could drop by 10 degrees, which doesn't sound like much, but would kill off a lot of crops. Humanity wouldn't go extinct, but most would die. Day 183. A cougar attacked us today. It came at night, like a bolt out of the blue. Its target was Annie. She'd excused herself to leave the fire we made and use the bathroom, and then it struck. There was a roar and a scream, and the rest of us were on our feet in a second. Lucky was the first one there, and despite the big cat outweighing him by a hundred pounds, he threw himself at it regardless, forcing it to release its hold on Annie. He got several good bites in, and the cat swiped him across the face, but Lucky stayed in the fight, keeping the beast off Annie. To my surprise, Timid Robbie beat the rest of us to the scene of the attack, and didn't hesitate to throw himself at the cat. He was armed with only a knife, but with a ferocious scream, he jumped on the cat and began stabbing it wildly. He'd gone so crazy he almost slashed us with a knife when we tried to pull him off the corpse. 
Luckily, Annie was wearing extra layers, and aside from a few cuts and bruises, the cat hadn't done much damage. Despite her protests, Alexis wrapped Annie up in a blanket and gave her a big hug before tending to her wounds, doting over her like the mother hen she was. I don't like what Robbie had done to us and the other travelers, but in his situation, what would I do to keep Alexis safe? Either way, that night he proved he was one of us. Robbie and Meg were now officially part of the family. Days 184 to 188. Lucky had earned himself some nasty cuts across his face, narrowly missing his eyes. Alexis tended to him as she did to the rest of us, and surprisingly he sat absolutely still for her, even when she used rubbing alcohol to clean his wounds. To his credit, Lucky was a bona fide hero twice over, and now looked the part with three badass scars across his face. Now he looked like a proper post-apocalypse guard dog. But that didn't stop him from showering us with kisses and asking for belly rubs at every rest break. Annie had warmed up to Robbie considerably as well, and I could see a big sister type relationship blossoming between her and Meg. Meg was acting a bit tough too. I guess Annie was rubbing off on her. She required more rest breaks than the rest of us and her asthma was always an issue, but you could tell she was really trying not to be a burden. I couldn't stop thinking about that cougar attack though. Normally, the big cats avoid humans and only attack when you stray too near their cubs. This one had taken the risk of attacking a human right outside a camp full of them. It must have been desperate. Did that mean prey like deer was gone from the mountains? What kind of condition was Big Bear in? Was I just leading everyone to their doom? Days 189 to 191. Progress was painfully slow, the climb was taking a toll on everyone, and the road was winding, adding extra miles to our journey. Plus, Meg's asthma was really giving her trouble, thanks to the increasing cold and physical exertion. We found a wooded copse with a small creek near the road and decided we'd take a day or two rest. We've been going for weeks now, everyone deserved a break, and it would give Meg a chance to better acclimate. It was cold and uncomfortable and I was really looking forward to taking over one of the many empty vacation rentals up in Big Bear and cuddling up into a real bed for the first time in months. But despite that, I found myself really enjoying our two-day break. The creek ran cold and we used our survival life straws to drink from it. And we had plenty of food we'd brought to last us months if need be. Granted, most of it was canned or MREs and I was really looking forward to fresh caught fish, but it was nice to just relax for a change. I took one of the bikes and scouted a bit but the road up was too steep to pedal far. By my estimate, we were days from Big Bear at this rate. Days 192 to 196. One of the bags tore open thanks to poor stitching dumping supplies all over the road. That was tough because we didn't have anywhere else to store them. We made as much room as we could in the rest of our bags, but we were forced to leave the rest behind. I insisted on hurling what we left behind into the woods though. I didn't want to leave fresh evidence of our passing, though that was getting harder to do as the snow began to fall harder and actually stick around this time. We were now in half an inch of grayish, sickly looking snow, and I wondered what effect this poisoned snowfall would have on the lake and the fish population. If the lake water was tainted, we had ways to filter it, but if the fish died off, well, that'd be a real problem for us. Days 196 to 199. We were seeing signs for Holiday Inn, sleepy forest resorts and other vacation rentals or hotels more and more frequently, and we knew we were getting close. It seemed to fill Meg with renewed vigor. I hardly noticed her asthma bothering her as we made the final climb up to Big Bear. There would be almost definitely people here already. Big Bear was a small town after all and there was little evidence it had been hit by a nuke. There was little reason to even expend a nuke on it in the first place. There might even be other survivors who made their way up here, but Big Bear was a lake and there were plenty of vacation homes that would be empty. I guess I was hoping anyone up here would be far more hospitable than Billy and his crew, seeing as other than losing electricity, civilization should have remained relatively intact up here. But I really didn't know what we were wandering to, and it made me nervous. Day 200. It started with a low whine, and then a steady thumping sound. We hadn't heard anything like it in months, so it took until it was nearly on top of us to realize it was a helicopter. Well, not a helicopter, but close, it was an Osprey, a tilt rotor aircraft used by the US military to move troops around and conduct reconnaissance. I couldn't believe my eyes as the big, beautiful machine flew barely 500 feet over our heads. We all jumped and shouted, waving our arms. The pilot saw us, or at least I thought he did, because I thought he wagged his wing to signal he'd seen us. But then the whine of the engines changed tone and I felt a lump in my throat. He wasn't wagging his wing, he was fighting to retain control. The pitch of the engine whine changed dramatically and then the Osprey lurched to one side as the engine lost thrust. The big aircraft clipped a tree with its sagging wing and the entire body spun wildly before falling out of the air with a thunderous crash half a mile away from us. Days 201 to 204. The world had ended. Well, not quite. Nuclear war had started and was still raging. 
the United States and its enemies destroyed one city after another in a slow death spiral that was doomed to push the whole human race to extinction unless someone stopped firing nukes in retaliation, but that was unlikely. The day before, we saw a U.S. military Osprey crash land a half mile away from us as we neared the mountain town of Big Bear, California. We'd seen one or two military aircraft since the bombs began to fall, but this was the closest one had ever come to us. Rushing through the thick forest and half a foot of snowfall, we found the smoking wreck. I kept Alexis back as Annie and I approached the burning aircraft. I'd been in the military during the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, so I knew what kind of carnage probably awaited us. Neither Annie or I wanted Robbie, Alexis, or Meg to see it. As we neared the crash, my worst fears were confirmed. The Osprey had torn open and it looked like at least four guys who'd been riding in the back didn't make it. Their broken bodies hurled out of the wreck and into the snow. I couldn't see inside the bay to see if there were others. The fire was too intense, but then Annie called out from in front of the cockpit. Rushing over, I was amazed to find one of the pilots had survived. For now, at least, the fire was growing and he was barely moving, groaning as he drifted in and out of consciousness. I climbed up onto the rack of the cockpit, trying to work at the restraints keeping the pilot strapped in and having little luck. And that's when I noticed a survival knife strapped to the dead pilot's leg, so I grabbed it and slashed the restraints. Now I had to lift a 180-pound man out of the mangled cockpit and to safety before the rapidly spreading fire reached us. Calling on superhuman reserves of strength, I managed to wrench him free. If he had any spinal cord injuries, I was basically killing him. But if I didn't get him out of there, the fire would kill him anyway. I had to slide him down the nose of the aircraft and down to Annie on the ground. He was too heavy for anything dignified. I grimaced as he landed with a thud on top of Annie. Seeing the open fracture in his right leg worsened considerably from the impact nothing I could do. It was either that or the fire. Right before I jumped off the nose and clear of the spreading flames, I noticed a backpack within reach so I grabbed it and hopped off. Not ten seconds later, the fire consumed the cockpit with the dead pilot inside. There was no time to waste. I called out for the first aid supplies we kept on hand. The rest of the group rushed over as I got to work. I'd done first aid before on the battlefield, but never for something like an open fracture. Still, I knew what to do. I knew how low the pilot's odds of survival were without a hospital or a doctor. I knew he wasn't going to get treatment for a while, and infection was a real risk, so I used a plastic bag to cover the area of the fracture after having bandaged it and sealed it to his leg with tape. It wasn't perfect, but it was better than nothing, and it would help to keep the elements out of his wound. We were just a few miles out of Big Bear, and the pilot's only hope of survival was that we get there fast, and they have a doctor. There was only one problem, it started to snow again. But this time it was different. Before we knew it, a blizzard had descended on us. Days 205 to 209. We'd been stuck in a freak blizzard for two days, and then once it finally lifted we had to spend one day creating a sled that we could use to drag the injured pilot with us. Thankfully he was still unconscious. That was a small blessing because if he woke up now, he'd be in a world of pain. We ended up using part of the wreckage and some parachutists 550 cord to create a makeshift sled and then all there was to do was drag him up the long road leading up to Big Bear. We ditched the bikes, they were of no use anymore in the deep snow, and trudged forward. The pilot's last name was Tomlin. I couldn't read his first name because his flight suit had gotten partially torn in the crash. He moaned and muttered in his comatose state, and we made sure to wrap him in extra blankets. His skin was deathly pale, and I feared the worst, but we kept him hydrated best we could, and fed him antibiotics by dissolving them in the water we carefully fed him. Lucky stayed by his side the whole time offering the occasional face lick for comfort. In the bag I rescued from the aircraft, I found an extra pair of ACUs that I put on. They fit me well, and given all the hell we'd run into in the last few months, I was grateful for the camo. You need every advantage you can get in this new world, and I hoped that we could eventually raid a military supply depot or surplus store and get some more for the rest of the group. With a whole lot of grit and determination, Robbie and I took turns dragging the injured Tomlin up the mountain road. And then we came face to face with a bunch of rifles aimed directly at our chests. Days 210 to 214. Big Bear was alive and well, dispelling our fears that it would be abandoned or destroyed, but the occupants were about as hospitable as we had feared. Given what we'd been through, it was hard to blame them. At first the armed group that met us on the road told us to turn around and go back the way we came, but then they spotted my uniform and seemed to hesitate. I told them there had been a crash and we had a survivor with us that badly needed medical attention. And that's when two figures stepped forward. The first was an older Hispanic woman with gray hair and a shotgun resting in her arms, but thankfully not aimed at me. The second was a tall, thin man, probably about the same age as our woman, with a very harsh look on his face, and a Smith & Wesson 357 revolver aimed in our general direction. You the one with the army? He spat out. I lied, nodding my head. 
My Osprey crashed. There was only one survivor. The group with me had to come to our aid. The lies were coming hard and fast, but I don't think they'd let us in if I told them the truth. I was right. They agreed to let us in and radioed for a truck to come meet us. I was in shock. They had working vehicles. I guess that made some sense. A mountain town like this would need tough vehicles and the ability to store fuel over long winters. We rode in the truck to town and, to my relief, a real doctor rushed out to meet us, taking Tomlin and rushing him to surgery. She let me know, though, that she couldn't make any promises. She only had a tiny medical staff and no actual operating room to work in, but she'd do her best and I nodded my thanks. And that's when the questions began. What were you doing? I told them we'd been flying recon over destroyed areas looking for groups of survivors. What's going on in the world? China and Russia had launched an attack against us. We retaliated. Now both sides sporadically destroyed one or two of each other's cities working from the coast inwards. What was left? Europe devastated. The US government had relocated to somewhere in Kansas. Millions were dead. I tried to be vague, making up as many believable lies as I could. I could see the emotions on the people's faces ranging from hope to despair to anger. I told them I couldn't promise help was coming. They had to be resilient and survive on their own. They let us stay with them, giving us one of the summer rental cabins by the lake. I was grateful to finally be somewhere safe and that my friends had made it too, well, most of them. I even got to sleep in a real bed again. But as I hugged Alexis close that night, I couldn't help but think, what if Tomlin survived? And what would happen when he woke up and told people the truth? Days 215 to 221. Tomlin's surgery was successful, or at least as successful as could be. The doctor had set his bones. She was pretty sure he'd be able to walk again if he ever woke up, though it would be with a limp. But will he wake up? I asked her. She shrugged her shoulders. She suspected he might have suffered a traumatic brain injury in the crash, and he was battling an infection. He might wake up tomorrow, in a week, a month, or never. I did my best lying to the people that hosted us, but individuals kept coming up to ask me questions. They mostly wanted to know how so-and-so city had fared. I knew that they were asking about loved ones, hoping they had somehow survived the ongoing nuclear holocaust. I responded a lot with, I don't know, I'm sorry, there's just so little information. It seemed to give people at least some hope, and it prevented me from having to lie more. Most of the people were welcoming, and they were glad to know our military and government still survived and might set things right again one day. I had been right to put on that uniform. I was pretty sure that without it, we might have gotten turned away. I was convinced the harsh man with the revolver, Stenson, would have taken in Tomlin for treatment, but turned the rest of us out. He seemed to watch me and the rest of our group everywhere we went, suspicious and wary. We did our best to assimilate into the town, knowing it was the only hope for being allowed to stay should the truth ever come out. Days 222 to 225. I went hunting with Gabriella. She was the toughest nails older woman we'd met alongside Stenson on the road. I could tell she'd invited me to vibe me out, get a feeling for the kind of man I was. Despite this though, she was far more inviting than Stenson. The two had gotten into very public fights about our presence, with him wanting us to leave once the snows cleared, and her making the point that if society was going to rebuild, they needed to grow again. I liked her. She was tough but kind. I couldn't help but think of Lilith when I was with her. Lilith had suffered a lot, first being captured and almost eaten by cannibals, then taken by slavers. She used to be kind of annoying, if I'm being honest. The typical millennial that in the old world probably spent her entire day trying to launch TikTok trends and become an influencer. But she'd grown hard and tough in the last seven months. Too hard and too tough. I worried about her. I'd seen it happen to combat veterans. The world was dark enough. It needed her light again. I hoped in time she could be more like Gabrielle, tough but kind. I paid close attention to her tracking skills, learning what I could. We ended up bagging a large deer I'd never hunted before in my old life, and she taught me how to dress it and then we brought it back to town. Days 226 to 232. There were about 90 survivors here, ranging in age from children to Stenson, who I was pretty sure was the oldest person here. I was also pretty sure he was the toughest too, and he kept that revolver with him everywhere he went, always ready for trouble. But this high up in the mountains, the only trouble was maintaining the instruments of survival. The lake provided plenty of fresh water, and the town had even created a series of filters using river rock, sand, and charcoal. It helped cut down on fallout contamination, but everyone had accepted that completely avoiding it was impossible. The average human lifespan moving forward would be significantly lower than it used to be. There were still fish in the lake, and the people carefully monitored how many they caught and ate, so as to ensure enough remained to replace their numbers. There was game to hunt in the mountains, though Gabriella confided in me that the game had been running thinner and thinner. Soon, she feared, there wouldn't be any left to hunt. That would leave them with their supply stockpiles and whatever they could farm in the spring and summer. 
I could see Stenson's point about adding to the community. But Alexis agreed with Gabriella. We needed to not just survive, but rebuild. That meant cooperation and growing our numbers. Annie and I stood somewhere in the middle, and Lilith seemed to side more with Stenson. Meg and Robbie kept their opinions to themselves. They were both just glad to have somewhere safe to sleep. My previous anger at Robbie had slowly faded. Sure, he had betrayed us and gotten us captured by slavers, but they were also holding his sister hostage. He'd suffered under them for months, and they'd killed the survivors he'd wandered out of the city with. I could see now that he really had no choice. Not for the first time, I wondered what I would have done in his shoes if they'd been holding Alexis hostage. Truth is, Robbie and Meg had kinda grown on me. Now I saw them as sort of a kid brother and sister. Lucky seemed to accept them too, and at night, he had taken to curling up with Meg in her bed. Days 233 to 236. Life was almost normal here. Other than the lack of electricity, of course, you could almost imagine you were back in the old world. We had our own supplies we dragged up the mountain with us, but we added those to the communal stash and everyone else gladly shared with us. Annie, always the survivor though, insisted that we hide away a small stash of our own, enough to at least last us a few weeks, in case we had to make a quick exit. I tried to tell her she was wrong, that she could finally relax, but I couldn't shake the feeling that she was right. Something was bound to go wrong. Days 237 to 241. A group of hunters went missing, young kids, about 15 to 19. They left the northern ridge outside of town hoping to bag a deer or an elk or pronghorn, but it had been 24 hours since they were due back. Gabriella came to me directly and asked me to join her in the search party and I was happy to oblige. Annie insisted on coming. She smelled trouble. If Gabriella was concerned, she didn't show it until we were well on our way. There was something clearly bothering her, but she wouldn't speak up. This only deepened Annie's suspicions. It took us a day to find their trail, and then another day to follow it through the deep snow to where they had made the camp. What we found made my own blood run cold. There had been a struggle. There were blood stains in the snow, and one of the tents had been crushed. Everything else was gone. Footprints leading out of the area told us six people had come into the camp, ten left, one of them bleeding badly. That makes our four hunters and six strangers. Annie had been right to be worried. At last, Gabriella opened up. The community had been dealing with encroachers. For months, they'd been running into small groups of people in the outskirts of town. Given the location of Big Bear, these weren't just wandering survivors, and they never attempted to make formal contact. That only left one explanation in my mind. These were either scouts, gathering intelligence, learning the strengths and weaknesses of the town, or they were bandits and raiders, hoping to prey on individuals who strayed outside the town's safety. Given the capture of our four teenagers, it was difficult to tell which. We were about three days behind the group, and we didn't have the supplies to push on and catch up with them. Regrettably, we turned around and headed back, moving as quickly as possible. We'd restock and then set back out on the trail. Days 242 to 246. There were worried mothers waiting to meet us when we returned, and Gabrielle assured them they probably just got lost. She warned me not to tell them what we found. Not yet. I disagreed. If there was a threat out there, then the people needed to be prepared, not coddled. But she told me that I didn't know these people like she did. Other than herself, Stenson, and a dozen others, the rest were just regular people, not fighters. Annie told her that they'd have to learn to be fighters if they were going to survive. She wasn't wrong. We had a secret meeting with Stenson and the town's inner circle and told them the truth. They agreed to keep it a secret and that we had to mount a rescue effort if possible. Stenson turned to me and thrust a finger in my chest. Well, you wanted to earn your invitation to our community, soldier. This is your chance. Bring our boys home. Annie insisted on coming with me, and to my surprise, so did Robbie. I tried to talk him out of it, but he refused to listen. Truth is, I didn't want him coming. Where we were going, bloodshed was inevitable, and I wanted to protect him from that, protect the entire group from it. But Robbie had already been through some rough stuff, I reminded myself. Plus, Annie's words ran in my head. They're going to have to learn to be fighters if they're going to survive. She was right. I didn't tell Alexis the truth, but she could tell something was seriously wrong. Finally, she wrangled it out of me, and her face went pale. She couldn't help but look over in Lilith's direction, remembering what had happened to her. Bring them back, was all she said. Then she gave me a long kiss. Lucky could smell trouble too, but I wanted him back here to protect the girls. With a heavy, worried heart, Annie, myself, Robbie, bid the girls goodbye, and hurried off to meet with Gabriella. She had one other man with her, someone I hadn't met yet, whom she introduced as Marcus. He was the best tracker in the community, and his talents would be invaluable. Plus, he knew the mountains better than anyone and figured we could catch up with the abductors by taking secret shortcuts. With dirty gray snow falling the entire time, we hiked our way back the way we'd come. It took us two days to reach the old campsite, and despite the falling snow, you could still see the signs of struggle. 
You could also faintly make out the trail that the group had taken on its way out of the camp. If we didn't have Marcus, we'd probably have little hope of following it, but he didn't need footprints. He looked for the signs of passage in the trees and bushes that surrounded us, a broken twig here, a branch bent in a certain direction from multiple people passing by it, and pushing it out of the way. He was a master of his craft, and I paid really close attention. These seemed like invaluable skills to learn. A day later, we found a corpse. It wasn't one of the hunters, and we breathed a sigh of relief. He'd obviously been shot, likely in the midst of the ambush on the camp. This must have been who had been bleeding on the way out. The corpse had been stripped of anything useful, even clothing. However, even more disturbing was the fact that chunks of meat had been neatly cut out of the arms, legs, and buttocks. The chest had been cracked open and the liver and kidneys had been harvested. Gabriella commented that he looked like he'd been field dressed. Annie and I nodded solemnly. We knew who'd done this and what that meant for our hunters. We broke the news to Gabriella and Marcus who both visibly paled. Then we'd set off with renewed vigor. Days 247 to 250. The thick snow made progress unbearably slow. I kept thinking about the teenagers and what might have happened to them by now, a fear we all shared that drove us forward despite physical exhaustion. Each night we only slept for six hours, the bare minimum needed to restore our strength and push on. This let us make good progress and soon we could see fresh signs of the group's passage. The boys had been literally dragging their feet, Marcus told us. They'd also been breaking branches and bending bushes. Smart kids. They were leaving a clear sign of their passage as possible, and doing their best to slow their captors down. Robbie had a particularly grim look on his face. He'd seen plenty of awful things since he and his sister had been taken captive and enslaved, but he'd never seen cannibalism. Sure, Billy had threatened to eat people, but it had always been a bluff. Just a scare tactic meant to keep people compliant. He was a monster, but at least he was a civilized monster. The group we were chasing, they barely registered as human anymore in my mind. I felt a dark rage building inside of me, and I was glad Alexis, Meg, and Lilith were nowhere near to see it. Days 251 to 252. We were close now. The trail was so fresh we expected to catch up with them every time we crested the next ridge. Then finally we set up camp and could see the telltale glow of a campfire just a few miles away from us. If we moved fast we could catch up with them by the next evening. There were five of us and five of them, unless they'd met up with another group while traveling but we didn't see any sign of it. As long as we moved quietly we'd have to drop on them for sure. We'd have to ambush them. We couldn't risk them doing anything to the teens. I had a plan, but I asked Robbie to stay behind at the camp. He refused, even when I was stern. He practically begged me to let him come. I knew what he was thinking. He was remembering being captured, his sister being helpless, being forced to work for slavers. I'd seen the same look on Lilith's face after we rescued her. I sighed. He needed this. He needed a chance to prove he wasn't a victim. Reluctantly, I agreed. Annie worried me too. She hadn't reacted much to her brother's death and I knew she was bottling it in. I was worried she'd snap one day, do something that she ended up regretting forever. Something really ugly. Day 253. We waited until nightfall and moved slowly through the thick snow. Each step was deliberately chosen so as to minimize the sound we made. The people in the rear stepped in the footprints of the person who came before them. Old lessons from my military days were returning to mind. I'd hoped to leave that life, the skill set, behind. Then the world ended. We could hear the cannibals up ahead. The night was still young and they were laughing and joking amongst themselves. Obviously, they never dreamt that the peaceful mountain community they'd been planning to raid would ever send a search party out, let alone pick up their trail in the thick snow. We could see the teens tied up around a tree. They weren't gagged, but with as much noise as their captors were making, they obviously didn't see a need for silence. They'd been beaten, one of them pretty severely. But it was all in the face. The cannibals didn't want to impair their prey's ability to travel wherever they were taking them. But something was wrong. There had been four teens, but only three were tied up. My blood ran cold. A quick head count of their captives showed one was missing as well. Things didn't add up. We waited until it got later. Gabrielle and Marcus slowly edged their way north while Robbie, Annie, and I stayed put to the east of the camp. This would allow us to fire into the camp without hitting each other or one of the tied up teenagers. However, the tents blocked part of our view so the opening shots would come from Gabrielle and Marcus. Robbie, Annie, and I would take down the rest of the cannibals as they exited their tents. They had left one person on watch, with one dead and one missing, that left three in the tents. This should be easy enough. Gabriella called over the walkie-talkie in a whisper, one single word. Ready? I acknowledged. A second later, a single shot ran out. The bullet struck the guard straight through the temple, a perfect shot on a very easy target. The 243 caliber rifle was good for small game, but not my choice for human-sized targets. But an accurate shot would drop a man in one hit, and either Gabriella or Marcus had put their round straight through the brain, killing him instantly. 
Immediately, the remaining three cannibals ripped out of their tents. One rushed out only to be greeted by a round I sent down range and straight into his chest, knocking him back inside the tent. My 338 packed a hell of a lot more punch than the 243, and I was confident this cannibal was dead or close to it. I immediately found myself wishing we'd salvaged an M4 from the Osprey, as I had to work the bolt manually on my old looted hunting rifle, seriously slowing me down. Two more shots rang out from Gabriella and Marcus's position, but I didn't see them score any hits. One of the cannibals was already firing out into the woods blindly. Robbie took a shot, missed. Took a second, and missed. I glanced over and saw that familiar rage growing in his eyes, like when he jumped on that cougar on the way up to Big Bear. Giving in to the rage, he stood up and screamed as he fired on the cannibal, missing him with one shot and scoring a hit with the second. I yelled at Robbie to get down, but it was too late. I saw the third remaining cannibal pop up and take a knee, lining his rifle up with Robbie. Instinct kicked in and I swung my sights on the cannibal lining up a center mass shot and squeezed the trigger. We must have fired at the same time because as my shot hit home, his did too. I heard a loud yelp as Robbie spun in the air and dropped to the snow, a spot of crimson quickly growing around him. My training was in control now though and I ignored Robbie for now. First aid is worthless if you're just going to get shot performing it. I put a second round into the cannibal even though he didn't get up from the first. Then I swung my rifle over to the tent of the first cannibal I put down. There was no movement, but I put two rounds into the tent just in case. Then I turned to Robbie. And he was already looking for his wound and assessing it for treatment. He was hit in the side. The bullet gone straight through just under the ribs. No deformation and probably no splintering. Though my knowledge of anatomy was rough, the wound was close enough to his flank that I was pretty sure the round had clipped his liver but not caused massive damage. He was incredibly lucky, and I tore open the first aid kit I carried and began to stuff both entry and exit wounds. The rescue was a success, even if we'd taken one casualty. Robbie would live, though the hike home was going to be incredibly painful. Days 254 to 256. The rescued teenagers gave us chilling news. The missing hunter had been taken by one of the cannibals. They left when the group made camp and the teens had heard something about a worthy offering. I had a bad feeling, a growing pit in the bottom of my stomach. Annie and I decided we were going to pursue. Gabriella and Marcus would lead the teens and the injured Robbie back home. The teenagers were in no shape to give chase even though they tried to convince us they were. After a forced march and having basically nothing to eat, they were on the brink of complete exhaustion. Gabrielle and Marcus built a sled to drag Robbie in, and after only a few hours of rest, Annie and I took off in pursuit of the missing cannibal. His trail wasn't hard to follow. They only had a six-hour lead on us. I hoped we could catch up and ambush him when he stopped for the night, but he seemed in as big a hurry as we were. Then I realized he probably heard all the shooting. We'd have a chase on our hands. Days 257 to 260. We tracked him for nearly a week, barely giving ourselves time to sleep. Eventually, though, we had to stop. This cannibal seemed to have superhuman endurance, and I had no idea how he was keeping his prisoner going. We'd be useless if we were too exhausted to fight, so Annie and I allowed ourselves an eight-hour rest. When we got up, snow was falling again. Dirty, gray, and foul-smelling fallout. We'd bundled up as best as we could to keep the fallout off our skin and set off. Annie's tracking skills were better than mine, and she led the way. His trail wasn't nearly as fresh, meaning he'd miraculously gained ground on us. This guy's endurance was incredible. Eventually, though, we followed the trail over a ridge and we could see down into the valley. We were now at least 20 miles away from Big Bear, and to our surprise, we found a whole campsite below us. It was sprawling, at least 20 large tents that could easily fit several people in each. If I had to estimate, there were 40 to 50 people down there. We'd have to be very careful going forward. Days 261 and 262. It took us a day to get down in the valley and closer to camp. Our prey had the advantage of knowing the route, so no doubt had made it already. That meant this group knew about the ambush, so now one of two things would happen. One, they would take it as caution to leave Big Bear alone and move on. Or two, this nomadic group of cannibals would decide to attack in revenge. There's no telling which might happen, but I had a plan to find out. As we came down off the ridge, we were able to circle south to get a better look at the camp, and then we saw it. They had built pens from logs and stakes, and looked like they were easy to assemble and disassemble. This was probably how they kept their livestock under control. That livestock included a few cows, some pigs, chickens, and people. At least half a dozen from what we could see at a distance. My blood ran cold, because these prisoners were obviously not being used for slave labor. They were being eaten. Annie and I discussed our options. Rescue would be impossible, the area was too well guarded. We'd have no chance against 40 or 50 well-armed cannibals. I told her my plan and she agreed. Then we waited for nightfall. Days 263 to 266. I'd learned patience in my days in the war. 
When your job is to slip behind enemy lines and gather intelligence, you have to learn to wait for opportunities. Eventually, I got mine. A cannibal wandered out of the camp looking for firewood. I figured this would happen eventually. They'd been set up here for at least a few weeks and had stripped all the nearby forest of usable firewood, so I set my ambush near a large patch of deadfall outside the perimeter that had been stripped clear of firewood. He heard me coming at the last possible moment, far too late to stop me from placing him in a rear naked choke. I squeezed my bicep as he clawed and kicked at me. In moments, he was out. I held it for a few extra seconds. Some people like to fake unconsciousness. Annie and I worked quickly to tie him up and gag him, then dragged him up to the ridge. I used large tree branches to cover our tracks and drag marks as best we could. It wasn't perfect, but hopefully enough to slow down trackers. Once we were out of immediate danger, I lifted him up and carried him over my shoulder, and Annie took over sweeping our tracks behind us. We moved for two days, keeping our prisoner bound and gagged, feeding him snow to quench his thirst. Once I was confident nobody was in pursuit, we decided we'd make camp. It was time to get some answers. Day 267. You don't have to be here for this, I told Annie. She hesitated. If I could count on anyone, it was Annie. She was tough as nails before the whole world ended. The apocalypse had only toughened her more. But what was coming was going to be ugly, and our group had seen enough ugliness already. Please, I don't want you here for this. She seemed to wrestle with some inner demon. I could see the pain of her brother's death on her face. Part of her wanted to be here. The other part, the part I wanted to save, didn't. Finally, with a slow, silent nod, she stood up. Before walking out of the camp and into the dark, she put her hand on my shoulder briefly and gave a small squeeze. Once I was satisfied Annie was out of earshot, I turned to my prisoner, cutting his gag free. He immediately unloaded a barrage of insults, which I ignored. He tried to spit, but was too dehydrated. That was on purpose. We'd give him enough water to march, but not enough to be strong enough to resist. The weakness would also make him more compliant. I removed a utility knife from its sheath by my boot. It was a small thing, several attachments on it like scissors, pliers, screwdriver, even a corkscrew for wine bottles. I'm sure you've learned how to cut people apart by now, probably gotten pretty good at it too. Want to know a secret though? I'm pretty good at it too. I let him stew for a moment. Now we're going to have a conversation. If I like your answers, I won't cut you. If I don't, I'll start with the fingers. Once I'm out of fingers, I gestured at his nose, ears, and eyes with a sharp blade. Your toes and feet will be the last. You need those for walking. The cannibal's previous bravado left him. To his credit, he tried to resist by betraying his group, but he inevitably became cooperative. I had only to take four of his fingers. Days 268 to 272. The cannibals were planning a raid on Big Bear, and our teenager that had been taken, they'd already eaten him. There was no rescue, only getting back and warning folks as fast as possible. But there was the question about what to do with our friend. Annie ended any debate by pulling her sidearm free of its holster and putting a round through his head. Then she turned to me. I love you like a brother, I really do. But I need you to know there's a difference between what I just did and what, uh, what you did. A big difference. I nodded. She was right. And I felt it in my heart, but we weren't getting answers any other way. I won't tell the group, just please don't ever do it again. I nodded once more. I hoped I meant it, but after everything we'd been through, I had to keep my family safe. We moved as fast as possible, knowing that the cannibals were probably also on the warpath, especially if they thought we'd taken one of theirs in revenge. I had no idea what sort of command structure they might have, but if they were working together on such a large scale, they were probably pretty well organized. Days 273 to 277. Worsing snow made travel difficult. Good news was that it made things more difficult for the cannibals as well, especially if they were traveling with their entire camp. I knew that what they'd probably do is move their camp closer to Big Bear and then send out their war party, leaving behind a small force to guard the livestock and supplies. News wasn't good. Our cannibal friend told us there were over 50 men and women in the camp, all of whom would fight. They'd probably only leave behind five to secure the camp, so we were looking at between 45 and 50 in the attack party. Big Bear had 90-something people in it, but just barely two dozen of them had any experience with firearms. As Gabriella had said, just over a dozen were fighters. We spotted smoke in the distance. The cannibals were on their way. My estimate, given how many people and supplies they had to move, might take them a week and a half to reach Big Bear. Days 278 to 283. Alexis greeted me with a huge hug the moment Annie and I returned, but I couldn't help but feel guilty as she did. It was so important to me that the darkness of this new world not spread to her, and she had no idea just how much of it I had brought back home with me. Would being around her, Lilith, Robbie, and Meg eventually infect them too? I shook the thoughts out of my head as I reported to Gabriella and Stenson. I told them about the approaching war party, told them the numbers, weapons, all the details I managed to wring out of my prisoner before there was nothing left for him to tell. 
I just didn't tell them exactly how I got the intelligence, though Stenson gave me a long, knowing look. The news wasn't good. The cannibals had at least a few heavy weapons, mostly M240s and M249s. They had scavenged from National Guard bases they had looted. These would be a significant problem, because we had no such firepower. Luckily, this was a community of hunters, and though the people weren't fighters by any stretch of the imagination, most knew how to shoot fairly well. Annie had been right all along. Everybody was going to have to learn how to be a fighter, and we had just a few days to teach them. We gathered the town council together to discuss strategy. Turns out Stenson was a Vietnam vet, and he and I aligned for the first time since my arrival. I turned to my experience combating insurgencies in Iraq and Afghanistan, and Stenson largely agreed with my plans given he'd been on the receiving end of the same strategies half a century ago. When facing a foe with superior technology and firepower, the best equalizer is to drag them into urban combat. Unfortunately, Big Bear wasn't a large built-up city, but the area around the lake was fairly built up. We'd evacuate the families from outer perimeters of Big Bear and send everyone who wasn't fit to fight out of town to camp down the highway for a few days. The plan was to use a mobile defense made up of multiple six to eight man squads. Those of us with the most experience would meet the advancing war party head on at the outskirts of town and then perform a fighting retreat to keep them lightly engaged and pressing forward as we lured them toward the lake. There, where the motels and shopping areas were, we could use the urban terrain to our advantage. Much like the Soviets in Stalingrad, we would secure the buildings with small squads who would retreat when overwhelmed. The plan was to constantly harass the enemy from multiple directions, luring him deeper and deeper into the town. Robbie and Tomlin would be moved with those who couldn't fight. Robbie was doing well, and Tomlin was thankfully still in his comatose state. The doctor was confident he'd eventually wake up, and I dreaded that day. A small part of me hoped he'd just slip away, but I quickly pushed the thought from my mind. Alexis wanted to stay. I absolutely refused to allow it. I sent her, Lucky, and Meg to go with the camp down the highway. Lucky seemed reluctant, almost like he sensed the danger we were in, but he followed Meg, whom he'd grown so close to. Lilith, though, would have nothing of being sent away with the women and children, as she called it. Truth is, a fair amount of women were remaining behind, and I could find no good reason why to deny Lilith. Not that she would have listened if I had. We trained as best we could with the time we had, while setting scouts along the only likely avenue of attack days 284 to 286. I had fully reverted back to my old role as a scout. When I found them, their camp was only four days away from Big Bear. They'd be launching their raid soon. I took the opportunity to start making them bleed. That first night, I snuck in close enough to set one of their own tents on fire, retreating to the dark. As they ran around trying to put the fire out, I put three of them down with my rifle before rushing off into the wilderness. The snow would make it easy to track me, but I had found a frozen creek which I used to confuse my pursuers. I wouldn't be able to get that close again though, so on night two I harassed them from a distance, putting down another four. Someone down there had thermals though, because suddenly I started receiving some very accurate return fire, so I rolled over to the other side of the ridge I was on. Every kill helped level the playing field, but if they were using thermals, I was worried about the level of technology they might be bringing to the fight. I knew they'd be on guard after my two raids, so I retreated and prepared for the battle to come. Day 287 and 288. It was quiet before the storm. Everyone knew what was coming. My scouting let me take a rough guess at their numbers. After putting seven down, I figured they had about 42 of the enemy coming our way, including myself, Annie, and Lilith. We had 39 defenders. We had the defensive advantage, but they had the firepower and tech advantage. Annie, Lilith, and I spent our final night before the battle eating together, enjoying each other's company. There was no telling who, if any of us, would come out the other side of this alive. Day 289. I led the point most squad, which included myself and five volunteers. Lilith and Annie were about 200 yards behind us with their own squad. In overall command was Stenson, a role he was reliving from his time in Vietnam. Gabriella headed up a small squadron in a building opposite from Annie's, and Marcus was in command of a team of sharpshooters whose job it was to keep the harassment of the enemy throughout the battle from long range, targeting anyone who looked like they were in charge and any heavy gunners. Eliminating their M240 and 249 gunners would be critical, or we'd be utterly overwhelmed. From what I'd seen during my recon mission, the entire group attacking us was armed with military-grade equipment, M4s, and body armor. They'd either killed a group of National Guard soldiers or looted their base, probably both. Either way, we were at a significant disadvantage. The morning was crisp, silent. If they were well-equipped, at least they weren't strategically sound. If they had been, they would have attacked near sunset when the sun was at their backs and in our eyes, and they would have attacked from multiple directions. I saw the first cannibal crest over a small hill outside town coming straight through the predicted avenue of attack. 
A few pounds of trigger pressure later and my rifle barked a welcome shot, which missed by inches. The cannibal immediately dropped to the ground behind cover, missing my first shot. Not an auspicious start to the battle for Big Bear. The enemy scattered. They seemed to have broken up into rough squads, but they were acting largely like a mob with poor command and no obvious infantry training. Some wore uniforms, but I doubted any of them have actually served. They were thugs with guns preying on those weaker than them. The last thing they expected was organized resistance. Me and my squad of scout snipers picked up our targets carefully, deliberately. Our job wasn't to hold them there, it was to put some harassing fire and then retreat, encouraging the enemy to pursue us straight to the first line of defense. My follow-on shots were far more accurate, but then an M240 opened up on our location, the heavy 762 rounds punching through the walls of the house we were holed up in. I heard one of my guys die. When you're around battlefields long enough, you know the difference between a wounded scream and a death scream. The 240 went quiet suddenly, and I guessed what happened. Marcus's snipers nailed their target. That was our chance to retreat, and the moment we rushed out the backside of the house, it got lit up again by another heavy gunner. The enemy was more cautious now, moving from house to house. Our force was mostly armed with hunting rifles, which gave us exceptional range and accuracy versus their M4s, but we had far inferior rates of fire. As we planned, the first line of defense put up volleys of fire until the cannibals got too close, so then we retreated to the second line of defense. There, we repeated, falling back to a third line. It was the same tactic the Russians had used in Stalingrad and it was incredibly effective, but that didn't mean we weren't taking casualties. Once those 240s opened up, anything short of brick wouldn't be enough cover. The 249s didn't pack quite the same punch, but they were more mobile, helping suppress our fire until their heavy gunners could move up. The plan was working, but casualties were mounting and lines of defense were running out. By noon, we'd fallen to our fourth defensive positions. Now we had no more squads in reserve. We were fully engaged and casualties were high. The enemy had suffered, and getting an accurate gauge of their strength was difficult, if not impossible. What we needed was a distraction, something to throw their assault off. I ordered the two survivors of my squad to retreat with the rest of the squads to the fifth and final defensive line, then I hid in one of the empty houses. The enemy was getting smarter and they were clearing houses as they advanced. I found myself wishing we had claymores or any of our old army toys. Booby traps would have thinned their numbers considerably. I could hear their main force outside pushing past the house as they sent a team into the home I hid in. I let them clear the bottom floor and work their way up the stairs toward me. These guys weren't pros, they had no clue how to properly move in tight quarters. Eliminating them was easy with my sidearm, as I ambushed them shortly after they cleared the stairs. Now I was behind enemy lines, but I could shoot and move quickly without a squad to worry about. Seizing one of their M4s and ditching my trusty rifle, I waited until I was confident the enemy had fully pushed past me and was engaged at the final line of defense. From a second floor window I could spot one of their squads taking cover behind a rusted car. They had a machine gun with them and were setting up to spray our guys. My shot hit the machine gunner in the shoulder. I've been aiming for the base of his neck. The M4's iron sights weren't properly dialed in, no surprise. I readjusted my aim and the next shot hit exactly where I wanted it. The rest of the squad ducked behind the rusted hunk, giving them zero protection from me. Three more shots and two more dead. The survivors now looked around confused. My M4's bark blended in perfectly with their own. It was the same advantage US Special Forces had enjoyed in Vietnam when they used AK-47s against North Vietnamese troops. The survivors didn't have time to figure out their mistake. I dropped them in quick succession. It was like shooting fish in a barrel. But somebody had noticed that they were receiving fire from the rear and I could hear shouts as other squads readjusted. I bolted from the second floor to find a new position. At least their attention was now split. Relieving pressure on our guys. I repeated my game of cat and mouse, moving from position to position. By now they knew something was up, but the confusion helped me stack my kill count considerably. They were panicking, and I heard over my walkie-talkie as Stenson called for the defenders to assault forward. I couldn't believe it. We were winning, and the enemy was breaking. His sense of battlefield command hadn't faded in 50-something years. When the enemy breaks, you seize the initiative and destroy them. With panic spreading in their ranks, the cannibals broke into a mad dash, retreating for the safety of the woods on the far side of town. Stenson and his forces were giving pursuit. The cannibals were literally rushing by my position. I could have let them go, but if I did, they'd just hurt somebody else. They weren't even bothering to return fire or be tactical anymore, just running away in a blind panic. It was easy shooting, even with my M4 sights off. It was Stenson who found me first. His eyes took in the six corpses in front of my firing position, all of them with obvious wounds in the back. He merely nodded and I sat down with a sigh, wiping the blood from the team I'd ambushed in the house at close quarters from my face. I hadn't even noticed until the shooting stopped. Days 290 to 291. Of the 39 defenders, half were dead. The other quarter seriously injured. 
We had only narrowly avoided catastrophe. Those heavy machine guns had chewed through our guys. Despite that, the town had survived and the refugee population returned. There was a lot of mourning to be done, but I was glad that Lilith and Annie had come through without a scratch, at least not on the outside. The fighting and dying had been fierce and close quarters, and that can inflict wounds on the inside. I was particularly concerned about Lilith. I would fought so hard to keep her from going over that edge. The town might have been saved, but I feared she was lost. Annie shared the concern. We gathered equipment from the fallen. If another attack came in the future, at least now the town would be properly armed. But half our fighting force was dead. Even Stenson had to start agreeing with Gabriella's lofty ideas of re-civilizing the world by rebuilding our numbers, but inviting outsiders meant risk. And after the events of the last two months, I was starting to see Stenson's point. You're not really here right now. Alexis and I were laying together in our bed. I apologized. She was right. My mind was wandering. Going over the battle, criticizing what I could have done better, what we would do if another attack came. You haven't been fully here since the kids got taken. She didn't know how right she was. Annie and I had kept our secret. I tried to act normal, but even I was aware I had changed in the last month. I just need you to be safe, I said as I kissed her on the forehead. And I need you to come back here, with me. Her words made it hard to sleep that night. Days 292 and 293. The older members of the population and the sick or wounded had lagged behind the main group of returnees, and this included Tomlin and Robbie. As soon as they returned, we got the news. Tomlin was awake. He'd been awake for a day, and he'd been answering a lot of questions. I thought I'd be surprised, scared, worried, I don't know. But when I joined Stenson and Gabriella, I felt nothing, almost relief. This had all been inevitable. He'd either wake up or not. Question was, what now? Gabriella looked disappointed. Stenson's face was crunched up in deep concern. There was silence between the three of us until he finally spoke up. You know, if you'd just been honest with us from the start, maybe. He shook his head sadly. You helped bring our boys home. You helped save this town, but you lied to us. And I've seen what you're capable of. I felt a twinge of shame, remembering the six bodies Stenson had found all shot in the back. The blood on the face from the men and women I'd killed in the stairwell at Point Blank Range. Because of what you've done for us, I'll allow your group to stay. But you have to go. You're no longer welcome in this town. Relief, then deep pain. Relief that my family would be safe. Pain that I would have to leave them. It was worth the sacrifice. I decided then and now I'd leave immediately, not telling the girls. They would insist on doing something stupid, like following me. No, they would remain here where it was safe, and I would leave no tracks for Annie to find and follow. Gabriella's disappointment cut me unexpectedly deep. The two agreed to provide me with supplies and keep news of my departure secret for now. Within half an hour, I was ready to go. M4, now properly sighted, over my shoulder. Gabriella pulled me into a hug. I wish you'd just told the truth, I really do. Her words stung. Stenson nodded his goodbye. Soon, both were behind me. Days 294 to 299. In a survival situation, the best thing you can do is remain motivated. If you give up, you die. You need a purpose if you're going to stay alive. I found mine. I'd keep my family safe even if it was at a distance. The fleeing cannibals were easy to track. Most of them were wounded or had fled in a panic and gotten lost. It was simple enough to find where they'd hold up. The last one I followed led me straight to where their camp must have been. But someone had gotten there before him or they'd gotten word over radio because the camp was gone by the time he'd gotten there. I could tell by the sign he left that he was wounded, traveling slowly in a desperate attempt to reach the retreating camp. I found him first. Day 300. He talked. Told me everything I wanted to hear. When I was done, I wiped the blood off my knife on his stolen army uniform and briefly considered burying the corpse. I didn't want anyone from Big Bear finding my handiwork, so I buried him in the snow. Animals would find him, or his body would rot in the spring melt. I shouldered my rifle and began my trek south, out of the mountains. With each step away from Big Bear, the cannibal's last words haunted me. There was an army massing out there, looting the cities for supplies and survivors. When the remains of this group reported back, they'd probably send a bigger force to take the town and any survivors. A man needed a purpose, as badly as food or water to survive, and I had found mine. I was going to keep my family safe, even if I couldn't be with them, no matter the cost. Days 301 to 304. We'd found safety, a place we could call home. We even fought and bled for it, but I had to leave. The town found out I'd been lying about who I was and, well, honesty was crucial in this new world we found ourselves in. So the town council asked me to leave, quietly. I never even told Alexis, Lilith, Annie, Meg, or Robbie. I knew they would just try to come with me, and I needed them to be safe. Everything I'd done so far was to keep them safe. I'd gotten intelligence from one of the raiders that there was someone out in the desert gathering an army. The old world had fallen and now there were groups who wanted to carve a piece of the new world for themselves. With the US government fortified somewhere in the heartland, 
retreating from the ever-advancing exchange of nuclear weapons with our adversaries, most of the United States turned into a lawless wasteland of nuclear debris. My family wouldn't be safe until I found out more about this threat. So I followed the trail of the retreating raiders through the mountains, knowing they'd lead me to wherever this army was gathering. What I'd do when I got there, I didn't know, but information is power, and I needed to know what I'd be up against. Days 305 to 309. The going was tough through these mountains, even with the use of various service roads and highways that intersected them. The snow had fallen early and thick, along with a hefty amount of ash caught up in the atmosphere. It was best to travel with breathing protection. The radioactive fallout wasn't dangerous unless it was against your bare skin or if you breathed it in. I was slowly gaining on my group of retreating raiders. These had been the guys who survived the attack on Big Bear, plus the few guards they'd left behind to watch over their supplies. Upon getting news of the defeat, they'd gotten the hell out of Dodge as fast as they could, even leaving some of their people behind. I was only a few days behind them now. Being on my own, I could move much quicker. Sadly, I found the remains of a campsite likely being used by survivors. In the snow was the corpse of a man, butchered, as I'd seen the cannibals do before. From the looks of it, two other people were with him, gone now. Part of the raiders' livestock, no doubt. If I hurried, I might be able to catch up to them and save them. Days 310 to 313. I could see their camp at night, miles away in the distance. They had no reason to believe they were in any danger, so they'd boldly set up fires that could be seen from miles away. Each day I pushed myself a little bit harder to close the distance between us. It'd do me no good to exhaust myself, though. There would be a fight on my hands. Last I remember, there were about five or six raiders left behind at the main camp, plus whatever buddies they picked up on the way out. With that many people on hand, I worried about the captives they took. The one they killed and butchered wouldn't last them very long. Days 314 to 315. I moved at night, approaching the raiders' camp through the cover of darkness. As expected, they had left out two guards on a night watch. There were two women tied up to a tree, one older, in her 40s I'd guess, and one younger in her teens. The corpse I found must have been the father. There were seven raiders in the camp, five slept while two stayed up to watch their captives and supplies. They didn't take their job seriously though, not expecting that anyone from Big Bear had followed them. Yet, I caught up with them. I couldn't ambush the entire camp at once, so I would bleed them a bit before I struck. The cold chilled me to the bone, but I waited, patiently. Then I was rewarded. One of the guards rubbed his stomach and made a joke about dropping a deuce. As he walked out of the camp, I followed, waiting until he was squatting behind a bush. He never heard the end coming as my knife found its mark in the dark. I was tempted to lure the other guard out and finish him too, then untie the captives and take off. But I knew better. I couldn't trust two civilians to keep quiet in the dark. And the last thing I needed was to fend off an entire camp of angry raiders with civvies in tow. One was enough. I'd learned a lot about the camp and gotten the chance to remove one. Picking his body up, I walked off into the darkness with it. I didn't want them to be alerted. Better he'd just mysteriously vanish. On night two, I made my move, confident that I knew how many I'd have to deal with. Approaching the camp was easy in the dark, and the snow helped muffle the sound of my footsteps. The two on guard were more alert than their counterparts last night, obviously spooked about having one of their own mysteriously vanish. Getting to within 30 feet of the tents, I raised my M4 and took aim. Four trigger pulls later, the guards were down, but the tents were coming alive with men and women scrambling for weapons. That's when I took out a little treasure I'd found on one of the raiders back at Big Bear. A fragmentation grenade. The old pineapple style, probably from Vietnam, which explains what it was doing in the National Guard armory the cannibals raided. I tossed it at the entrance to one of the tents just as it was getting ripped open. A second later, the grenade went off. It didn't kill everyone in that tent, but whoever survived wouldn't be in shape to fight. I switched my attention to the second tent, and with half their force neutralized, the survivors were easy enough to pick off as they tried to make their way out of the tent. I was glad I traded my hunting rifle for the M4. The superior rate of fire made all the difference. As the dust settled, I made my way into the camp. The first tent was still alive with the sounds of the wounded. I brought my knife out, then caught the eye of the older woman still tied up to a tree. I turned from the tent and cut their ropes away telling them to follow me into the darkness. I didn't like leaving loose ends like this, but I knew those raiders would die from their wounds during the night. Days 316 to 320. The woman's name was Clara, and her daughter was Alana. I'd guessed correctly, the corpse the cannibals had butchered and left in the snow had been the husband. I was torn about what to do with the two. They would slow me down too much in my original mission, and I thought about sending them back toward Big Bear, but they were far too scared to travel on their own anymore. That left me with only one option, so I turned from my objective and headed west back to the desert. I just so happened to know of a small community that would gladly take them in and keep them safe. 
Using my map, I was able to find a road that could take us out of the mountains and to the desert, but with no snow plows to clear the path anymore, it was going to be a hell of a hike to say the least. Days 321 to 324. Clara and Alana had fled from the north of Los Angeles after the bombs fell. Like many communities in SoCal, they were also dependent on electricity to pump water to them. Once the power grid went out, so did the water, prompting survivors to migrate by the hundreds. Many had gone north hoping to escape the bombs in more rural northern California. Some had gone east toward the heartland. Others, like Clara and her daughter, had gone south, like we originally did in the hope that the military bases in San Diego had survived. It had almost been a year since the world went upside down, and anyone left alive after that time was suffering from serious PTSD. The three of us tried to talk about our past in a funny way that people with trauma will do, where they dance around the painful bits. We didn't mention the old world or our previous lives, consolidating it to, I used to do this, or I used to do that. And we didn't talk about the people we'd lost since then. It was an unspoken agreement between all the survivors I'd come across so far. One thing we did discuss was the state of human affairs in the new world, how quickly people had turned on each other becoming predators. I told Clara and Lana about a quote I'd heard once, something about how civilization only survives for minutes after the power goes out. Whoever had said it had been dead right. Here we were, 320-something days after the end of the world, and I was chasing leads on some army gathering to carve out a slice of Southern California for itself, utterly unthinkable a year ago. Days 325 to 329. Alana twisted her ankle and ended up with a bad limp. I could see the horror in her eyes as she realized how much she'd slow us down. The part that upset me the most was that it was aimed at me, and I realized that she was thinking I would end up leaving her and her mother behind. The thought gave me a cold chill. Was this what the world had come to? Clara wrapped Alana's ankle and helped her isolate it as I whittled the crutch for her from branches and reassured them both that I wasn't leaving them in the wilderness alone. Clara didn't quite believe me, I think, because she kept highlighting her skills as a former nurse, skills that are extremely valuable in this new world. I pulled Clara aside that night and explained that her and her daughter were safe. I wasn't going anywhere and I wasn't leaving them behind. She didn't have to try to prove she was valuable to me. I'd made a promise to get them to safety and I'd die trying. Clara collapsed into tears and gave me a big hug. I held her for a bit, feeling that she'd been holding in those painful, racking sobs for a long time. When we made our way back to the light of our fire, she dried her eyes, putting a brave face on for Alana. Days 330 to 333. The trek down the mountains was tough, made worse by the mix of snow and ash that clogged the roads. We were good on supplies, thanks to the stuff we scavenged from the raiders, well, non-human food anyway, but Alana was slowing us down significantly thanks to her injury. After a week of travel, we spotted the telltale puff of smoke from a fire down a dirt road. I told the girls hide and made my way to the source of the smoke, looking to scout it out and make sure we weren't traveling near any danger. The trail led me to what looked like a small cabin, the puff of smoke coming from the chimney. I maneuvered around to get a look inside the windows from the tree line when I heard the click of a safety being flicked off and a deep, grumbling voice like gravel saying, Freeze, right where you're at. I slowly turned and came face to face with the business end of a shotgun. Wielding it was an older man, the rough and tumble type who spent their entire lives on the edge of civilization. For him, the end of the world had probably slipped by with little change. Who are you? How many with you? I answered him truthfully, told him that it was just me and two survivors I was escorting to safety. His steel gray eyes narrowed suspiciously. Charity was not a common feature of this brave new world. I told him the truth while he kept the shotgun leveled at my chest. I could tell he had no part with the cannibals prowling the mountains. For one, there was freshly skinned game drying on a tanning rack, which meant he ate animals, not people. He listened quietly without interjecting as I told him about our escape from the city, the community at the Salton Sea, even the attack on Big Bear. Then he surprised me with an unexpected question. How many people have you killed? I told him the truth, as many as I had to keep my people safe. He nodded, and the shotgun dipped slightly. Then he told me to follow him. He disarmed me, so I didn't have much choice. We went to his cabin briefly, long enough to pick up a pair of crutches. Then he turned to me as we headed out the door. If you're lying, you're good as dead. I appreciated his honesty. With him behind me and the shotgun at my back, I took him to the girls. At first they were alarmed. Then, upon seeing the terror in their eyes, he dropped the shotgun almost apologetically. A look almost like shame in his eyes. No, no, I'm sorry ladies, I didn't mean to scare you none. He introduced himself as Watson and handed over the crutches so Alana could walk more easily, then invited us to come stay the night at his cabin. Days 334 to 339. We ended up staying at Watson's cabin for a few days as Alana's sprained ankle healed, at his insistence no less. 
I learned quickly that he was a rather hard-baked man with a surprisingly kind interior. In his world though, even before civilization collapsed, it didn't pay to wear your kindness on your sleeve. Alexis would have disagreed. That thought triggered a deep pain in my heart, which I quickly buried. I asked Watson if he was concerned about raiders and scavengers moving through the mountains. He'd also tracked groups of them moving through what he called his land, and discouraged any that got too close. I believed him entirely. I thought I could move silently, but Watson had snuck up on me like an absolute ghost. It was good to eat real meat, though he lamented the fact that the game was becoming scarcer and scarcer up here. I told him that Big Bear was having the same problem. We both hoped it was just a temporary readjustment to the new world. That's when Alana surprised me by blurting out an invitation that he'd join us. You can't stay locked up in these mountains with game running out, you should come with us. He got that hard look in his eyes again. This was a man that was used to living alone, and I could tell the thought of a group made him very uncomfortable. We could really use your help. Then I saw Watson melt and go flush with color. The hard-edged mountain man had a real soft spot, and Alana had apparently nailed it. I couldn't help but wonder if maybe he had a daughter once too. Maybe she was out there in the real world, or had been before the bombs fell. I had my suspicions based off his tender behavior toward Alana during our stay, but I knew well enough not to probe. Watson seemed like a man that enjoyed his privacy. Days 340 to 345. When Alana was finally able to put weight on her foot, we set out once more. I was anxious every day on the road was one more day that the threat to Big Bear might grow. I had to find out more about this gathering army, how big it was, who was leading it, what its plans were. Would they attack Big Bear again, this time with far greater numbers, or would they hunt elsewhere? What would I even do if they did plan on attacking Big Bear? Lots of questions with no answers, and I was anxious to start finding some, but first, I had a promise that I had to keep to Alana and her mother. To my surprise, Watson agreed to accompany us. The way he looked at Alana only confirmed my suspicions. He once had a daughter, or someone like her at some point in his life. Personally, I was glad he decided to join us. He was clearly a very experienced tracker and woodsman, and skills like his could come in handy. We moved much faster now with Alana's healed ankle and Watson to show us faster routes, and soon we were out of the mountains and entering the desert. Our destination was just southwest of us, only a few days by foot now that the snow was behind us. Days 346 to 350. We took the long way around, skirting the lake by its western shore in order to avoid coming close to Slab City. Before the war, it had been a lawless community of drifters and outcasts. After the war, we'd been warned it'd become a growing hub for raiders and worse. At night, we were able to camp inside the abandoned buildings that dotted the edge of the old communities that once ringed the Salton Sea. It was nice to have shelter overhead again. Felt more secure, in case of a raider attack as well. Until we were near the safety of the farms, though, we lit no fires and ate our food cold. Watson slinked off one night muttering something about a feeling he had. The man disappeared into the desert as silent as a panther and just as deadly. An hour after sunrise, he returned, dragging with him a man dressed in worn traveling gear and with hands bound in front of him. Throwing him to the floor of our shelter, Watson spit on the ground next to him. Scout, had a feeling we were being watched last night. I was right. The man spit out a steady stream of profanities and Watson smacked him with the butt of his shotgun, warning him not to do it again in front of the women. When Watson turned the double barrels around to face him, the man quickly complied. We questioned him thoroughly and were chilled at the news. He was indeed a scout for a smaller force prowling the Salton Basin area, looking for survivors to scoop up. That force had clocked in on the farms and was planning a visit soon. The thought of what they might do if the community found itself unprepared chilled me to the bone. When we were done, Clara asked what we were going to do with the scout. Watson volunteered to handle the situation and catch up with us as we set off. There was a familiar look in his eyes, and I shook my head. No, where we're going, there's law and order. We'll turn him in there so he can receive a fair punishment. The group nodded in agreement. Internally, I agreed with Watson. But maybe, just maybe, the world needed a little less savagery if it was going to be re-civilized. Days 351 to 355. I was surprised when I finally laid eyes on the farms again after half a year. Things had changed. Ruslana had been an effective governor since our little group had left to go up to Big Bear. The entire area had a crude fence that you could tell was still a work in progress. Some parts were more complete than others, and even incorporated concrete barriers. They must have found some way of moving the heavy blocks, which meant they must have found a fuel depot and plenty of fuel stabilizer. Without it, gasoline goes bad within months, which is why most of the world could no longer drive despite there being billions of gallons of old gasoline just lying around. There were even guard towers being erected every few hundred meters, and we got spotted long before making it to the front gates. 
A delegation of riflemen came out to meet us. It was obvious the farms have been having issues with raiders and other bad characters. Luckily, several of the patrol that met us recognized me, and I was greeted with lots of backslapping and questions about how everyone was doing. I waited until they brought me into the camp so I could catch everyone up at once. They had radioed ahead, so Ruslana was there to greet me. We both embraced warmly upon seeing each other, and she looked worried and asked about the girls and Robbie. I told them about Big Bear and the attack and everything I'd learned since then. Ruslana's face went serious. I wasn't telling her any news. Her and her people had been hearing the rumors of a gathering army for months now. Plus, they kept having trouble with raiders from Slab City, hence the fences and guard towers. But what we could do about any of it, I didn't know. I was hoping Ruslana would help me figure that part out. Days 356 to 360. It was nice to be able to relax for a change, and the farms even had water heaters set up so you could take a warm shower. Felt like heaven on earth, especially after the weeks and weeks of trudging through the mountains. I missed Alexis and the rest fiercely, but I drove those thoughts away anytime they invaded. Ruslana and I deliberated on what we could do. She'd been growing the community slowly but surely, accepting survivors from the cities as they found them. The place had a name now. It was officially Farmbridge. A curious name, but she explained it had won by a majority vote. Farm, for obvious reasons, and the bridge part, because everyone hoped the settlement would serve as a bridge to a better future. One thing was clear. Farmbridge was some of the most valuable real estate in SoCal right now, and the raiders had taken notice. They fended off two attacks from Slab City before they gave up, but they caught scouts in the hills on a regular basis. Then we got word that a convoy bringing in survivors and supplies from the ruins of the city had been attacked by Slab City raiders. Two survivors had made the marathon run to get to us and try to raise help. Ruslan and I grabbed our gear as she delegated orders to her lieutenants. She grabbed four of her most experienced shooters and headed for the gates. Watson picked up on the commotion and was quickly beside me as we marched to join them. Once we got there, Ruslana held up a hand. I didn't have to come. This wasn't really my fight. Ruslana was a veteran of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but she wasn't a tracker. Watson and I could both do the tracking necessary to find out how many had attacked the convoy and which direction they'd traveled. Ruslana reluctantly agreed. She didn't like putting others in danger. Days 361 to 365. It took a few days to reach the site of the attack, though we moved as quickly as we could. The raiders had stripped everything from the makeshift wagons, rough constructions that had been built on top of an old car chassis by Farmbridge's engineers. We were having to remake the world with technology not very well suited for it. There were several corpses in the desert. Some were survivors and others raiders. At least Slab City raiders or slavers weren't cannibals. They hadn't butchered the bodies, but the survivors would be taken as slaves and potentially sold to the cannibals. We had to move fast. Days 366 to 368. The tracks led north along the coast of the sea, almost mirroring the route we'd taken on our way south. The slavers were steering clear of Farmbridge and going the long way around the massive inland lake. Once we got to the northern tip, our suspicions were confirmed. The tracks now turned south and east, to the direction of Slab City. Days 369 to 372. Salvation Mountain was visible in the distance, a massive artificial hill created by an artist and painted in brightly colored paint. It was a famous landmark and a real gem of the desert, a huge splash of color amongst the dusty decay of the Salton Basin area. But without someone to look after it, the bright colors had long ago faded. This was technically the outer perimeter of Slab City, and we moved only at night now. We had too few numbers for an all-out assault, and Ruslana didn't want to risk a war between Farmbridge and Slab City, though looking in her eyes she knew it was inevitable. My hope was that when it came, Slab City didn't have the backing of this mysterious warlord gathering an army somewhere in the east. Luckily for us, Slabbers were still largely disorganized. It was an every-man-for-himself settlement that rarely cooperated on anything except the existential threat to its existence. This gave us the advantage of teamwork. Watson and I scouted the settlement together at night, me wrapping around to the north and him to the south. There wasn't one main holding area for the captives, rather it seemed as if the slappers were organized into small groups and each group had its own pens. This was good news for us. Maybe we could get in there and make it look like a prison break. It was important the slappers didn't find out it was an organized rescue by Farmbridge. If they did, the entire settlement would then have a vendetta against Farmbridge. And though they didn't cooperate well together, they had the numbers on their side. Our people were on the northern outskirts of Slab City, which played to our favor. We should be able to get in and out, hopefully without causing much of a ruckus. And if we did, other slappers would be too far away to get there in time as long as we were fast. Days 373 to 375. The desert was wide open here, only a few wadis to hide in. 
That meant we couldn't sneak up close the way we'd like to. We'd have to hit them hard and hit them fast. Two of Ruslana's shooters stationed themselves several hundred meters out in the desert on small rises. The rest of us crawled along a wadi until we were as close as we could get, still leaving about a hundred meters between us and the structures housing about a dozen slappers. The nearest next group was half a mile away. We'd have to move fast. Ruslana spoke a single word into her radio and the shooters got to work. Almost simultaneously, the sound of two rifles firing split the nighttime silence. We were already up and running as two slabber corpses hit the ground, but there was a third we hadn't seen. He must have been napping outside or something, because he immediately poked up from behind a stack of tires and brought his rifle to bear. One of Ruslana's men was shot before we mowed him down with return fire. There was no time for grieving or first aid. More than one life was at stake here. I still had a few grenades left, so I tossed one in the direction of one of the structures as Ruslana went to work on the lock to the captive pen. A slaver happened to run out just a second before the grenade went off, cutting him down with shrapnel. The rest huddled by the doorway peering out to fire at us, fearful to run out into another tossed grenade. That was perfect. The fear kept the slavers holed up as Ruslana finally blasted the lock off the gate in frustration, freeing the captives. One of Ruslana's shooters on the high ground had night vision scope for his rifle and dropped a slaver none of us had seen as he snuck up on us, probably saved all our lives. The other riflemen kept up steady, accurate fire on the doorways to force the slavers to stay inside. We retreated in pairs, two of us lying down fire for the rest to rush back, then alternating. We couldn't win in the stand-up fight, so our goal was to keep them inside their shacks until we could get away into the desert. With blood pumping in my ears, I grabbed the hand of one of the survivors and rushed back into the wadi we'd taken on the way in. It gave us just enough cover to remain out of line of sight with the slavers behind us. Watson jumped in behind us, carrying the wounded squad member over his shoulders. His face was red with exertion, but he refused to leave the man behind. Under the cover of our two riflemen on high ground, we hightailed it into the night. Days 376 to 380. We moved fast as we could, putting distance between us and Slab City. But to our surprise, there was no pursuit. Maybe we'd killed the group's leader, or maybe the slabbers simply cut their losses. It didn't sit right with me, and one look at Watson's face told me it didn't sit right with him either. Something was going on. We made it to the north side of the Salton Sea, far enough away that we felt safe from any slaver patrols or scavenger teams. Then we finally had the chance to take a breather. One of the captives told us rather disturbing news. The slavers had started to organize themselves into a bigger entity. Some guy, whose name they hadn't caught, was apparently putting the law down, by force if necessary. Some slavers were resisting and ending up in shootouts that weren't in their favor. It made sense now. The slavers we rescued the captives from were probably more concerned with holding onto what property and power they had than chasing down some escaped slaves. But the slavers wouldn't be opposing each other forever, because this mystery man was winning the struggle to unite Slab City. Soon they'd be a unified force and a serious threat to Farmbridge. Perhaps most disturbing, though, was that the Slavers had already sent a team of representatives to meet with this growing horde out to the east. They were looking to join up. If we were going to survive what came next, we needed information. Now more than ever. Ruslana decided to use boats to cross the Salton Sea and get to Farmbridge faster, but Watson and I had a different plan. We were headed east. We'd pretend to be raiders or scavengers looking to join up for a bigger score and find out what we could. Ruslana tried to talk us out of it, but our minds were set. Then she hugged me goodbye once more, assuring she would do everything she could to prepare her people for the coming war. To Watson, she gave a kiss on the cheek as a thank you for saving her man. Watson turned a bright red for a moment, and the two lingered near each other. Watson was probably in his late fifties, and Ruslana was only fifteen or so years behind him. In the old world, maybe people would have batted an eye at the pairing, but in this new world, he took love where he could find it. The thought made my heart hurt again as I thought about Alexis. Once more, I buried the thought. There was work to do. Days 381 to 385. We only had a general location and rumors to go off of, but we knew one thing for sure. Wherever this horde was gathering, it was somewhere east. It would also have to be near highways in a former town or city to support that many people in one location. That narrowed things down considerably. Lake Havasu was the obvious choice in my opinion. Plenty of fresh water and a highway ran through it. Watson agreed and we went north from Salton up the 111 until we got to the 10 interstate. We'd follow that east until it intersected with the 95 and then take that north to Havasu. With just two of us on solid pavement, we could make good time. As we made camp, I did some rough calculations and was surprised to discover that it had been just over a year now since the world ended. It was hard to tell from the passing of the seasons because SoCal didn't really have them, and now with global cooling from all the dust in the atmosphere, it was generally cool and cloudy every day. 
couldn't believe how far and how fast humanity had fallen in just one year. Days 386 to 389. We spotted a checkpoint from a distance, reconned it out at night. Fifteen or so raiders manning a rough barricade at the junction of the 10 and the 95. They were very well armed, this wasn't desert trash, and had to be part of the main group we'd heard so much about. I wanted to go around them, but Watson disagreed. This was an outpost controlling traffic through the two highways. He thought we should present ourselves as hopeful recruits and told me to trust him. He knew a thing or two about dealing with people like this from his old life. We approached the outpost in broad daylight, rifles slung over our shoulders. Watson told me to let him do the talking as a few of them approached us, rifles leveled in our direction. We're looking for opportunity, tired of scabbing off the ruins or whoever happens to come along. Heard there was a boss out here, planning to make big moves, figured he could use two more good guns. The raiders laughed, but their leaders seemed to take in Watson's words. He nodded his approval. We'd heard right. But it wasn't up to him if we could join or not, that would be up to the bosses in Havasu. His job was to monitor traffic and collect taxes from anyone using the roads. I was surprised, turns out they were taxing people using the roads for trade. I guess it made sense, you couldn't enslave or kill everyone you came across if you were trying to build something. There was plenty of that, we were assured, but mostly from the communities that resisted. Plus, the boss granted each of the major groups the right to go on hunting trips outside of the territory once in a while. We asked for his name and were corrected. Not his name. Her name. General Latre, she called herself. Her followers called her the Iron Lady. Where she'd come from or who she'd been in the old world, nobody knew. Their gang was one of the many picked up and absorbed into the fold. We were given directions and told to behave ourselves in the Iron Lady's territory. There's no looting, stealing, or fighting without permission from the Iron Lady or her bosses. Then they gave us directions to Havasu, but not before we paid our toll. With money being worthless, we handed over some of our foodstuffs and ammo, the currency of the New World. Days 390 to 394. I was surprised to see some semi-regular foot traffic on the road up to Havasu. There were groups of raiders using the road on their way to God knows where, but also civilians, even some trade caravans. The civilians all had the same haunted look in their eyes from living under an oppressive dictatorship, and the trade caravans included many slaves. I couldn't help but wonder if this wasn't what one of the ancient empires of the world might have looked like. There was civilization here, if you could call it that. An oppressive regime of the Iron Lady's own making that endorsed slavery, sanctioned murder and violence to keep everyone in line. But it was undeniable that this was in fact a growing civilization. Havasu had attracted thousands of survivors it seems, and when the Iron Lady showed up she'd wrangled all the survivors under her iron thumb to build a world in her image. Watson had lived most of his life in the mountains with no boss in his life save himself. The steady streams of caravans and civilians being bullied by raiders bothered him to the point I caught his finger straying near the trigger of his rifle on more than one occasion. I had to remind him that we were here to gather information. We couldn't do anything to these people, not yet. With a weary sigh he agreed, and we continued on our journey to Havasu. Days 395 to 399. We'd been told to report to a specific building on the outskirts of Havasu Springs Resort. The former resort community served as a southern base of operations, with Havasu City north and on the other side of the lake being the Iron Lady's seat of power. I let Watson do the talking again following his lead. The raiders respected strength, so when our would-be recruiter tried to intimidate us we both responded with veiled threats. That seemed to please him and he welcomed us into his ranks. Unfortunately things were hectic at the moment so we'd have to cool our heels for a few days until we could get sorted out. The raiders clearly had some military veterans in their ranks because they were working to unify the various gangs and raider enclaves together into some semblance of an organization. No easy task given that all these people were naturally extremely selfish and prone to looking out for number one first. We'd be assigned to one of the gangs soon. Until then we were given directions to makeshift barracks where we could hole up. Until then we were in quarantine. We could leave the barracks and have a look around, but we were limited in where we could go for the time being. This made gathering intelligence difficult, and I was growing increasingly frustrated by the day. Day 400 I had questions I couldn't find answers to cooped up in the barracks waiting for our assignment. Who was the Iron Lady? What were her plans? How many people did she have under her command? Did she have enemies we could potentially contact for help? Each day that I went without finding answers was another day that my friends were in danger. I left the barracks and Watson reminded me not to test the boundaries of where we'd been allowed to wander. Clearly, he could also feel my growing frustration. There was a recreation area where the raiders were making full use of it, with a tennis and basketball court. 
Tourists once flocked to this beautiful resort, now it was home to a base of men and women who had chosen to survive the end of the world by killing, enslaving, and exploiting their fellow man. It was sickening, and I almost wished a nuke would fall here right now, if the war was even still going on. Maybe it had finally ended, with no more cities left to vaporize, and the survivors tearing each other apart for the scraps. I turned away from the courts in disgust and nearly ran straight into a young brunette carrying a load of laundry. It spilled everywhere, and I almost helped her pick it up until I saw the slave collar on her neck and remembered the role I was playing. Watch where you're going, you idiot, I grumbled out. I had to be committed to my role. The girl looked up as she scooped the laundry. I'm sorry, I didn't expect you to. But her voice trailed off as we locked eyes and I felt my face go white as a ghost as my knees turned to jello. Cri Christina? I barely managed to mumble it out, but there was no mistaking her. Same pretty, almost almond-shaped eyes, and a small scar on her left cheek from where she fell off a scooter as a kid. It was her, my ex fiance who had broken up with me just three months before the world ended. Day 401-403 to Are you with… with them? Christina's blue, almond-shaped eyes looked up at mine in surprise, and something else. A year and two months ago, the world had ended with nuclear war. Three months before that, though, the world had already ended for me when Christina, my fiancé at the time, had broken off our engagement. Now we were both face to face in the middle of a camp full of raiders and cannibals, her a slave and me on an undercover assignment. What? I… no, I… Uh, wait, how much do I trust her exactly? She wore the slave collar, but for how long? Maybe she'd gotten Stockholm Syndrome or I don't know. I couldn't endanger my mission. What are you doing here? You were supposed to be on the East Coast. Despite our ridiculous circumstance, I couldn't help but feel the same anger from our breakup surface again. My life was here in the West Coast and her job had demanded that she go to the East Coast. It was a career-making move, but I couldn't just up and leave my life. I told her we could do long distance for a bit while I sorted things out, but she had flat out refused. Instead, she broke it all off and then disappeared to the East Coast, I had assumed. I was burning with questions, a lot of them the same ones I had 15 months ago. No, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I needed some time before starting my new life. I thought it was best to have a buffer, you know, sort my feelings out before starting… She waved her hand dismissively. I got it. It hurt like hell, but I got it. What hurt most was the three months I believed I was out in Los Angeles all alone while she had been right there the entire time. I had a million questions, and I could tell so did she. But we were interrupted by a giant of a man growling in her direction. Hey, you eyeballing my property? The big man hustled over. He was easily twice my size, a significant amount of it fat. At his side was a rubber rod of some sort with wood stapled onto it. My eyes drifted from it to matching bruises visible peeking out from the back of Christina's shirt. Terrible, red hot fury filled me, pooling at my feet and slowly spreading upward, filling me with a sickening warmth, a prelude to ultra violence. Girl, Get those narrow hips to work. I didn't purchase you to make conversation. Christina shot her eyes downward, picking up the laundry basket and hurrying off. That's right, move fast, or I'll teach you again to move expediently. The man laughed a deep, gurgling giggle, enjoying his own joke. My hand reached instinctively for the knife I'd kept in a sheath on my back, clipped to my belt. But Watson's hand was there first, grabbing mine and stopping it before it got to the knife handle. I hadn't even heard him approach. Now, why don't you skedaddle on out of here and step away from my property? She ain't for sale, at least not yet. Maybe once I've worn her out, she's useless. He laughed again. My hand jerked toward the knife. Watson gave my wrist a powerful squeeze. Watson didn't let go of my hand until that man was out of sight. My entire body trembled with rage. Once he was confident we were out of earshot of anyone around, Watson finally spoke. It don't matter none who she was to you. You gotta ask yourself, that one girl worth the lives of everyone at Big Bear or Farmbridge? I didn't respond, merely stared in the direction Christina had disappeared to. We got a job to do out here. Our folks are counting on us to keep our cool. Finally, I nodded, slowly. Days 404 to 409. I learned Christina's schedule and routine well enough to be able to meet her for short, private moments. She told me she'd been in the valley when the bombs hit, then made her way out of the city with a group of survivors. They'd done alright for a few months, but then got caught by a group of raiders. That group had killed and butchered two of her group for meat, then dragged the survivors out here to Tahoe. The survivors were sold into slavery. She'd been first sent to one of the camp labor crews, but her new owner, Saul, had spotted her and bought her for a pretty penny, she'd been told. He wanted to make her his wife, but she'd put up too much of a fight. He threatened to kill her if it wouldn't be so unprofitable. 
Instead, she did all the manual work he needed done. The story was enough to make me want to murder Saul and everyone in this camp. I abhorred the idea of slavery, and this place was practically built on it. I told Christina I was going to get her out of there, but I couldn't, not yet. I didn't elaborate, I still didn't know if I could fully trust her. It hurt seeing her again, but I was glad to even if she was a slave. At least now I knew she'd survived. Our mentor from the Raiders was a middle-aged man named Robert. Like Watson, he looked like he had a rough life back before the war and seemed to fit right into our post-apocalyptic reality. He had a wife and a kid that lived in the compound with him. A tough but fair man, I couldn't help but like him, despite the fact that he was a raider, or at least he worked for them. I don't know what I expected from a society built by raiders, but I was learning more and more every day. They had laws, no stealing, no fighting in public, no killing. It was much the same as you'd expect from any society really. Difference was they enforced these rules using violence and allowed things like slavery, cannibalism of your own stock, and well, raiding. But the latter was only allowed outside of officially established territory. Communities inside that territory were off limits, as long as they paid their taxes, that is. They didn't join voluntarily most of the time, it was sort of extortion. But taxes guaranteed protection, and that was well worth the investment. It was law and order, but law and order reminiscent of a more savage time. Not the 21st century society we'd all share just a year and a half ago. But like any society, it had good people and it had its bad people. I was learning that Robert was one of the good people, which made his role in the whole thing even more confusing. Days 410 to 413. They called themselves the Army of the Sun, because in their twisted minds they were bringing the dawn of civilization back to the savage wastelands. To join them, Robert finally gave us one of several assignments we'd have to undertake to prove we were capable and trustworthy. We were going out tax collecting, or rather to find out why one of the farms not too far away had stopped sending shipments of food as agreed upon with the army. Robert came with us as we set off, and I got just enough of warning that I could find Christina and let her know. I told her I'd be back soon and for her to stay safe while I was gone. She grabbed my hand when no one was looking and gave it a quick squeeze. I ached inside with the desire to wrap her up in my arms and hug her. I made up my mind that one way or another when I got back, I'd deal with the Saul situation. Days 414 to 418. Being on the road gives you time to learn about your travel companions. Maybe grow close to them. Watson and I had bonded during our short travels together by our shared desire to keep our loved ones safe, at any cost. In the old world, we might have lived different lives and probably voted for different people, if Watson voted at all. I doubted the mountain man did, but we quickly bonded by the challenges we both faced in this new world. Still, I couldn't quite say Watson was a real friend. He was too aloof for that. A trusted companion or squad mate was more like it. Despite myself though, Robert quickly grew on me. He had a warm personality, and it seemed like once we were away from the pressures of the raider civilization he opened up more. I found myself wondering what in the world a man like that was doing here, and I asked him. He looked at me with genuine sadness in his eyes and told me it was a matter of practicality. He had a family. He'd seen what happened to the world after the bombs fell, how people had changed and turned to their animalistic desires. The army offered safety, protection, and it was even re-civilizing the wastes. Before the Iron Lady had showed up, this entire area was just a bunch of groups tearing each other apart. She'd united them hammered out any differences, and brought stability and order. He wasn't blind to the evils here, but what could one man do? I played it coy and told him I'd heard rumors of the settlements out west, in old California, that were growing and building. He shook his head. The lady had an army here, and her territory was growing. It was only a matter of time before they got swallowed up too. Here, Watson finally joined in the conversation, adding only that some values were worth standing up and dying for, otherwise what made a man a man? After that, he became a bit distant. I think Watson's words struck home. I had thought of the Raiders in black and white terms, but Robert was giving uncomfortable nuance to the situation. Days 419 to 422. Our travel took us east, past the tip of Lake Havasu and into the desert. Lake Havasu City was north of us, and a ghost town that the desert had reclaimed. Most of its inhabitants had been poisoned by the massive plumes of radiation billowing in from the big cities. The army had a portion of the northern city, putting slaves to work on restoring it. There was a small community of ranchers out here, and one family specifically had been short on their taxes, and it was our job to find out why. I raised the concern that the ranchers probably outnumbered us and might just kill us off, but Robert assured me that doing so would be suicide for the entire community, as the army would reap its revenge. It was late in the evening with us about a day from our destination, 
that we heard the gunshots in the distance. We immediately set off to investigate as the gunshots grew quicker, more desperate. Someone was in trouble and we broke out in a run. Being the younger, more fit member of our group, I quickly took a very wide lead. Cresting a hill, I spotted the scene of carnage below. Several men and women lay dead. Looks like one side had ambushed the other. From the looks of it, there were only two survivors, a man and an older woman. The man knocked her to her knees and brought the butt of a rifle down on her head, but she moved it to the side at the last second and avoided the blow. She wasn't so lucky the second time, catching a mighty blow to her right shoulder and yelling out in pain. I pumped my legs as hard as I could, yelling out at the man. He turned to look at me and gave her the opportunity to knock him off her. They both scrambled to stand up, but he beat her to her feet. A moment later, he had a pistol in his hand. I was still too far away. Instinct took over. In one smooth motion, I came to a full stop, brought my M4 carbine up to my eye and squeezed the trigger the moment I had a good sight picture. The man dropped to the ground, his pistol tumbling from his hand. The woman was looking over the man as I finally got to her, nearly out of breath. I could tell now that she was older, early 50s would be my guess, but fit, the type of woman who lived a life of tough physical labor. She clutched her left shoulder as she looked down at the young man by her feet, now dead. Before I could get my breath back to ask her anything, she spoke. That's some darn fine shooting. You just saved my life. She thrust out a hand, which I took. Her grip was strong as she pumped my arm vigorously despite her obviously injured shoulder. Name's Eben, but folks around here call me the Iron Lady. Days 423 to 426. Whatever you want, name it. I had saved the Iron Lady's life. The one person whom threatened the very life of the people I loved most, not to mention hundreds of other free people back in California and beyond. Of course, this means that I had also killed an innocent person. I felt sick to my stomach. We made camp early. Eben, or the Iron Lady as she was known to her troops and those she terrified, recognized Robert, who was as incredulous as I was. Two more of her men joined us, they'd gotten separated in the ambush, an ambush set by partisans fighting the rule of the tyrant whose life I had just saved. Despite nearly dying and her injury, she was cool, calm, and collected. I could see why people gravitated to her, she oozed strength and stability, exactly what people craved the most in this new world. But there was an uncommon intelligence in her eyes that scared me. This wasn't some common thug or the toughest of the toughest who had risen to the top. This was someone who had created an army from the remains of the old world through equal parts strength, cunning, and guile. She was a terrifying opponent. To my surprise, she was also very talkative. Not about her own past, but she questioned Watson and I extensively. The conversation came naturally, not forced as one would expect. Life before the war, how we managed to survive, where we came from. Yet I was sure she was taking very careful mental notes and filing them away somewhere. I wouldn't be surprised if she had internal notes on every last member of her army down to the last lowly foot soldier. She didn't disallow questions about herself, she just chose which to answer and how. All she said about her past was she used to be in the military, the rest was unimportant. What was important, she said, was that not long after the world ended, she had seen the chaos of the wastes and grew determined to civilize it once more. What about eating people, enslaving others? That civilization too? Watson's question shocked me. It was damn near insubordinate, yet the old mountain man continued to stoke the fire slowly, giving no sign of how close to a very dangerous line he must have tread. Doubling up to my surprise, Eben didn't hesitate to respond. Are you familiar with the Old Testament? God gives the Hebrew people rules to live by, and in our mind these rules are harsh, repressive, antiquated, or at least they used to be. But what most people miss is that these ancient laws were a significant leap ahead of the laws of neighboring kingdoms. For instance, women who were violated in adjacent kingdoms could expect nothing but shame and condemnation. Under Mosaic law, the attacker must pay a dowry to the woman, in addition to whatever other punishment local law calls for. The dowry was to ensure the woman's financial future now that she was unlikely to marry. She cleared her throat, letting her point sink in. Those laws weren't perfected by a long shot, but they were never meant to be. They were a stepping stone up out of the darkness of ignorance. God was meeting his people where they were, knowing they were incapable of accepting modern enlightened lifestyles like in the old world. In time, they'd continue their social evolution, discarding even those laws for new better laws, or at least that was the intent. Now she waved around at the desert outside of the light of our campfire. You've traveled the wastes. How long did it take for people to turn on each other after the fall of the world? A month? Two? I find these behaviors as disgusting as you. My world is a compromise between the old world and this new world. A stepping stone for a better future. I looked at the faces of her men and I had a horrifying realization. 
She didn't rule this army with fear or strength. They wanted her in charge. They idolized her. She had them heart, minds, and souls. Days 427 to 429, she decided to travel with us. It would be safer than her and her two surviving men traveling alone back to Havasu. Along the way, I managed to snag some time with her out of earshot of the rest of the group, and I told her what I wanted from her. And this is a slave for sale? I didn't think so, I told her. She shook her head. I'm sorry. I owe you my life, and I will honor that. But even I can't break the law. If I did, it'd only encourage anarchy. If she's not for sale, I can't force her owner to sell her. I sighed and nodded my understanding. But if something were to happen to her owner, well, that'd be unfortunate. And I'm sure everybody would be too busy to look carefully as long as he suffered a relatively inconspicuous accident. I took in the meaning of her words. What about law and order? If you think you can bring change and stability to this new world and keep your hands clean, you're a fool. And I traveled with you long enough to know you are no fool. And to suspect you're someone who's had to do what needed to be done, knowing if others found out they wouldn't, couldn't understand. I hated how right she was. Days 430 to 435. We arrived at the ranch, who was late on its taxes to be greeted by a family of six. Husband, wife, four children ranging from age 23 to 16. In the old world, the older children would have been off at college. Now they could expect little better than to work at this ranch until they or all their animals died. In a year and a half, we'd reverted straight back to the medieval ages. The family's eyes grew wide at the sight of the Iron Lady herself. She was obviously known even in these remote parts. She didn't yell, threaten, or scream as she inquired as to the missing taxes, and somehow that was more terrifying. Uh, we're, we're sorry, ma'am. We're short on food, and two of the cattle got sick. We think they got into tainted water. Not even the meat's good. Had to burn both bodies. And there just wasn't enough to give and feed ourselves. The Iron Lady nodded. Do you know what your taxes go towards? The rancher blinked in confusion. No, I, uh, to, to you, ma'am? She shook her head. Meat, crops, textiles, raw materials. Some of it goes to work crews, repairing the aqueducts, trying to get some of the infrastructure back online. The rest goes to the army, the troops that patrol these wastes, to keep out the other raiders and bandits. You remember a time before the Army of the Dawn, right? The farmer nodded vigorously. Bad times for everyone. But those days are in the past, and it's thanks to my boys and gals. Of course, they can't do their job if I can't feed or clothe them, trade for weapons and ammo. And if they're not doing their job, then other families like yours are put at risk from raiders. She spat on the ground, an edge of steel creeping into her voice. So, by selfishly putting food in your mouth, you're not just hurting my troops, but you're hurting every other family in this valley and beyond. You're costing lives because you don't want to go a bit hungry. I could see the fear creep into the man's eyes, and I nervously eyed the rest of the family especially the older boy, the 23-year-old. I checked his hands. Was he armed? Wait, what would I even do if he pulled out a gun? Whose side would I even be on? Sergeant, what's the penalty for theft from the government? One of her two surviving team members spoke up in a cold, emotionless voice. Decimation, ma'am. The farmer blanched. The Iron Lady nodded slowly, then turned to me, offering me her pistol. Carry out the sentence, recruit. Kill the eldest, and we'll be taking the youngest to be sold at the market to zero out your debt. Any profit will be sent to your family forthright. I was stunned, staring at the pistol. Recruit? I looked the Iron Lady in the eyes, seeing nothing but steely gray. I'd killed before, a lot. I'd even tortured to get information that ended up saving the lives of my family, but this? If I didn't do it, she might kill me. In fact, I knew she would. It was also part of her law that disobedience of a direct order was punishable by death. But if I didn't, Watson pushed me aside picked up the weapon and immediately shot the oldest boy in between the eyes. Silence. Then the wailing and sobbing of the mother and sisters. The Iron Lady's two men grabbed the youngest daughter, the 16-year-old, and began to bind her wrists with rope. Apologies, ma'am. He's still soft. Yet to adjust, but he'll learn. Watson handed her back the pistol. The Iron Lady slowly nodded, watching me the entire time. Days 436 to 440. Watson avoided me on our way back. There'd be a reckoning when we got back to the barracks at Havasu, but how that was going to go down exactly, I didn't know. Robert tried to pull me aside to talk to me, but I dismissed him entirely. I knew what he was going to say already, and frankly, I didn't want to hear it. To my surprise, he seemed genuinely hurt by my dismissal. I couldn't deal with this duality from the people around me, and yet deep down inside I felt like a hypocrite for my outrage, knowing damn well I'd done things that the people I loved most would be horrified to discover, but I did it to keep him safe. 
And yet, wasn't that what Robert was doing? Wasn't that what Watson did? I was preoccupied not watching my step when I took a significant tumble down a rocky hillside. A jagged desert rock sliced my arm as I landed on it, leaving a deep cut that bled profusely. I immediately bandaged it using my first aid kit, wincing against the significant pain. That night when we stopped for camp, Eben asked me to see my wound. She carefully removed the bandage, grimacing at the sight of it under the firelight. This is bad. Really bad. Hang on. Moments later, she returned with one of the first aid kits, removing a small bottle of alcohol and unsheathing a short knife at her hip. Inspecting my wound once more, she told me to grip my teeth, as she used the knife to slice open part of the wound and dumped the rubbing alcohol into it. You got decent first aid skills, that's good, but this cut's too deep to just bandage. When that rock pierced the skin, it shoved all the dirt and crap on your skin deep into the wound. You gotta cut into the flesh, flush it with alcohol, and get all the foreign debris out. You probably already got some germs in you. I got some antibiotics in my kit, take them twice a day. With practice skill, she then began to sew my wound shut once she was satisfied it had been flushed thoroughly. Wound this deep, you risk losing that arm if the infection starts, or worse, don't skip out on those antibiotics. I said little as she worked on my arm, wincing against the pain. I know you're upset with me, I get it. What we did back there was harsh, real harsh, but this is the same land where me and my squad got ambushed. You think they're fully innocent of that? And sick cows due to contamination? Whole herd would have died. She shook her head sadly, willing to bet they're feeding those rebels, probably giving them intelligence too. Finally, she was done with my arm and she leaned in to bite off the string she used to sew me close. I know you probably think I'm a monster right now. I don't blame you for it. But if one ranch starts to find the laws, others will get ideas. And then we're all back to square one, fighting and killing each other all over again. Was she right? I thought back to Farmbridge and Big Bear. They seemed to be doing okay without all this violence and fear. But compared to what Evan was building, they were backwater outposts. The Iron Lady was building a nation of thousands from radioactive waste. Was that even possible without some fear and violence? Days 441 to 445. Eben diverted us on the way back to Havasu so we could stop by one of the small encampments the army had established in the area. It served as a staging area for patrols who kept the peace, and a supply link with the other posts which enforced the borders of the territory belonging to the Army of the Dawn. In time, new roads would be built, and the perimeter posts would be upgraded to proper fortifications. I wondered what in the world the Army of the Dawn needed forts to protect them from, and I got my answer. There was nobody to greet us as we approached the encampment, which should have been impossible as men should have been keeping watch around the clock. From a distance, I could see that the place consisted of the same sand-filled Hesco barriers that we used in Iraq and Afghanistan. There were even two guard towers set up, and you could see where work had been done for more permanent fortifications. But there was not a soldier in sight. The smell was almost overwhelming as we finally entered the encampment, and the sight that greeted us inside was straight out of a nightmare. Bodies lay everywhere, all of them soldiers. There had been several families here as well, but there wasn't a civilian in sight. Most disturbing of all was the fact that the bodies had been stripped of their clothing, and all matter of symbols carved on their flesh. One of the corpses still had a rope tied around its wrists, indicating the carving had taken place while they were still alive. The Iron Lady leaned in close enough so only I could hear. You wonder why my methods can be so harsh? This is why. Take it all in. I took the entire nightmare in processing the almost supernatural carnage all around me. There wasn't a single body from whoever had done this. The only clue they left behind was the missing families and the carved up bodies. Who or what could have done this? What lurked in the waste that scared and even preyed on an army of cannibals and raiders? Days 446 to 451. There were plenty of tools left behind, but digging enough graves in the hard desert soil would have taken days. Eben refused to leave her soldiers behind to be eaten by scavengers, so she had us pile them together under one large bonfire. She didn't flinch from helping with the work herself either. In fact, she treated the bodies with a sense of reverence. The Iron Lady was clearly a sociopath, manipulative, evil to her core, and yet she seemed genuinely to care about the men under her command. This woman that commanded thousands was an enigma wrapped in a riddle. They called themselves Aztecos. They used powerful hallucinogenics and practiced what they called blood magic, something that they claimed was passed down to their priests from the ancient Aztecs themselves. Like the Aztecs, they lived in a state of perpetual warfare against anyone weaker than them, raiding and plundering any community they came across. Slaves had an even chance between being put to work or ritualistically sacrificed and then devoured. At first, they were small bands of survivors coming north from Mexico, former cartel members and their lackeys. Soon, more of the former cartel members made the trip north, 
bringing with them deep superstition and belief in black magic. Now they were an army big enough to challenge the army of the dawn, but the saving grace was that they were all complete psychopaths and difficult to organize. This was not the first raid in the Iron Lady's territory, but what concerned her was how deep they'd struck this time. They typically attack one of the border posts, but now a group had managed to sneak past them and take out an entire fortified camp. They were growing bolder. They were trying to send a message. We made haste back to Havistu. The Iron Lady wrapped up in her own thoughts the entire trip back. Days 452 to 457. For saving her life, Evan granted me and Watson our own accommodations and fast-tracked our recruitment process. We were officially part of the Army of the Dawn. She then requested that I come to see her at her headquarters in about a week after I handled my personal business. What she was referring to, of course, was Christina and the blank check she'd given me to handle the situation as I saw fit as long as it was done quietly. I hurried to find her as soon as we got back. Easier now that I had a free pass to come and go largely whenever I want. Rumors had already begun to spread about how I saved the Iron Lady's life, so some people already recognized me and gave me a degree of respect. Nobody wanted to cross someone in the Iron Lady's good graces. On the face of others, though, I saw naked jealousy. Eben was like a religious figure to many of these people. She had manipulated the masses cleverly, worming her way into the hearts and souls. The Iron Lady was more than a leader, she was a messiah. Christina was in one of the workshops, apparently picking up goods for her owner. The word disgusted me. But my heart skipped a beat when I found her. I was worried something may have happened in my long absence. She turned and noticed me, did the best she could to hide her smile, but it was unmistakably there. And so were several large bruises across her face. I had been mulling over the Iron Lady's carte blanche to handle the situation as I saw fit. After the incident with the rancher's son, I'd lost my appetite for violence. Her reasoning and justification only made me more angry at her and at myself for the times I'd used that same reasoning to do horrible things to others. Yet, here was Christina, with my arms wrapped tightly around her and doing her best not to cry into my shoulder, face full of bruises from a savage beating. The Iron Lady was right. The law was the law. But some evil could only be eliminated by operating outside of it. I didn't tell her anything. I just held her for a while in a secret corner of the workshop. Then, kissing her on the forehead, I promised that she'd be free soon. I'd struck a deal with the Iron Lady. She looked concerned, but hopeful. Days 458 to 462. Finding the right time to strike was crucial, and this required intelligence. I shadowed Saul to learn his routines, even bought off a few street urchins to keep tabs on him when I couldn't. Bullets, food, and materials were currency, and with my extra rations, courtesy of the Iron Lady, I could afford to keep my young spies watching 24-7. Finally, I understood his movements well enough to start making a plan. I didn't tell Christina. If all went well, she'd never even find out. Days 463 to 466. Saul's home was a two-story townhouse he'd taken over. He kept his three slaves in a room next to his, which they all shared. Though he didn't lock the girls in, there was no point. The slave callers were padlocked, and anyone would immediately spot them and drag them back for severe punishment if they escaped. And if they did make it out into the desert, there was no fresh water or food for days aside from the heavily patrolled lake. Escape was a death sentence. I waited until late, when I'd be sure he was asleep. Dressed in all black, I scaled the garage and got on its roof. This gave me access to his bedroom window. There weren't many patrols in this residential area, and neighbors were few and far between. Looking at the window, I was relieved to find it open. I figured it would be, since there was no air conditioning anymore, and the desert nights could still get warm, even with nuclear winter cooling going on. I slipped inside his room, silent as a shadow, putting to use every bit of my old military training. He was on the bed, rolled on his side, facing away from me. I didn't carry my pistol with me, just a knife. I didn't want to make a noise that would alert someone, and Eben had said to leave as little a mess as possible. One quick thrust from behind straight into the base of his spine would sever his spinal column and paralyze him from the neck down. It was a tricky execution, and you wouldn't want to risk it if, for example, you were taking out an enemy patrol. But when your target is asleep, and with his back to you, I unsheathed my knife, but hesitated. I was going to take the life of a monster in order to save the life of a woman I loved, but was it still murder? Was there another way? Despite myself, Alexis's face flashed into my memory. And that's when Saul rolled over with a grunt, one eye half open. Both eyes flew open when they spotted me just a few feet away, frozen in my hesitation. He rose with a roar, and I immediately sprung forward, driving my blade toward his exposed throat. With a meaty fist, though, he swatted the knife away, earning himself a cut that went to the bone across his knuckles. His other fist smashed into my chest, knocking me away and driving the breath out of me. 
Saul was a mountain of a man, lots of body fat and yet surprisingly strong and agile. He leapt out of bed and rushed toward me as I struggled to stand. I delivered a snap kick to his knee and heard a satisfying crunch as I drove the kneecap backwards, causing it to fracture. He let out another roar and crashed down to the ground, but not before grabbing me and dragging me under him. I was now under nearly 300 pounds of his body weight. Saul's fetid breath on my face as he grunted in pain and rage, trying to wrap his hands around my throat. I was pinned, could hardly move. He put his good knee on my left arm, pinning it, and my knife hand to the ground. I smashed my head into his face in a brutal headbutt once, twice, three times, feeling the cartilage and bone in his face break from the assault. But he didn't relent. His hands found my throat and began to squeeze. I started to see stars. Then, there was a sickening wet thump as something hit him in the back of his head, followed by another smash to the side of his face. Saul groaned and his eyes rolled up to the back of his head. He relinquished his grip on my throat enough for me to pry myself loose and drag my left arm out from under his massive leg. In an instant, I'd driven the knife deep into Saul's throat. Pulling myself free from under the giant man, I gasped for breath. Christina was there, holding a fire poker. There were tears streaming down her eyes. Days 467 to 470. I moved Christina and her two liberated friends to me and Watson's place. One message to the Iron Lady was all it took to tidy up any loose ends. Saul's body disappeared, and nobody said a word about the reacquisition of his slaves. I slept next to Christina at night, an arm around her, but she remained distant and quiet. The trauma of Saul's death was still fresh. Finally, on the second night, she opened up. I went in to kiss her, and she backed up abruptly. I'm sorry, I just… I, I can't stop seeing Saul's body. I know he did terrible things to me and to others, but I killed him. Now every time I look at you, I just think about what I did. I didn't press the issue. I understood. Even after all the violence she'd seen and endured in the past year and three months, she'd never killed anyone. And I had forced her to, by breaking into Saul's house. I couldn't help but feel that after freeing Christina, she was further from me than she was when she was Saul's property. Days 471 to 474. The Iron Lady had made her headquarters at the former government building for Lake Havasu City. All but one of the entrances had been fortified, though, so that any would-be assassins could only enter through the main front entrance, which was heavily guarded. Anyone entering was heavily vetted. Apparently, the Iron Lady had quite a few enemies out there, and I was willing to guess they weren't all amongst the Aztecos. Watson and I were expected and quickly shuffled inside. We had yet to speak about the incident at the ranch, and we'd both been distant from each other. His actions had definitely caused a rift between us, but we were here on a job, and this place was a treasure trove of intelligence we could definitely use. Our eyes and ears were on high alert, picking up on every scrap of information we came across and filing it away mentally so we could write it down later. The Iron Lady was in a conference room that had been turned into her war room, complete with a large map encompassing California, Arizona, and Nevada to the north. In a wide radius around Lake Havasu City was a perimeter made up of red pushpins that seemed to be the extent of the Iron Lady's territory. I was grateful to see that it went east far further than west. It seems her forces had done very little to move toward California. Along the perimeter and inside of it were larger green pushpins. I recognized the location of the outpost that the Aztecos had hit and figured these must be the location of forts or other outposts. There was only one toward California. Apparently, the army didn't expect much trouble from that direction, and to be honest, they were right. But there were multiple along the eastern and southern border of the territory. Past the eastern and southern borders were large black pins, driven into the map in several places. I guess that these were known locations of Azteco strongholds. There was a disturbing concentration of them around Phoenix, the capital of Arizona. One single, smaller black pen was right across the old US-Mexico border and Mexicali. This one disturbed me deeply, as it was only a hundred miles or so south of Farmbridge. Speaking of which, a single blue pen was driven right on the southern tip of the Salton Sea, right on top of what was now called Farmbridge. Looking north, I spotted Big Bear. Seems a smaller pen had once been driven near it, but had been removed. I could still see the hole on the map. The Iron Lady finished speaking with several of her men, one of which rushed out in a hurry and turned her attention to us. I've seen you out in the field. You know what you're doing, and you're both experienced from the old world. I had a special assignment for you two, but it seems it's largely unnecessary now. Watson and I looked at each other warily. I'd meant to dispatch you out to enemy territory to scout the enemy, but it seems as if the enemy has decided to come to us instead. Pack your gear, and make sure you're well stocked from the armory. Requisition body armor if you don't have any. We're going to war. Days 478 to 480. I hadn't heard the sounds of engines in so long that the sound was almost abrasive to my ears. 
Four striker-armed vehicles rumbled in the parking lot that was the staging area for the Iron Lady's forces. Men and women milled about, loading up supplies into the trailers that would be pulled by the strikers. They would lead the way, carrying a company's worth of equipment. The rest of us would go on foot, giving the forces already out at Greenwood by the Big Sandy River time to unpack the equipment and shore up their defenses. If we weren't delayed, we'd be there a few days before the expected arrival of an entire army of Aztecos. Looking up at the armored vehicles, I now know why Robert had said it was pointless to resist the Iron Lady and her forces. She had a small fleet of armored vehicles and the fuel to keep them operational. Some of the men in the army had been engineers and chemists. Stabilizing large stockpiles of fuel had been relatively simple. While most of the world had to deal with fuel that had already gone bad in their gas tanks, the Army of the Dawn had enough for a small fleet of combat vehicles. Without anti-tank weapons, artillery, or air power, no force could resist her if she dispatched a large group of them to overrun a rebellious settlement. Christina was there to see me off. Her big, almond-shaped eyes were moist with tears that she hadn't cried yet, and she hugged me tight as I reassured her that everything would be alright. I'd soon return. I felt a lot of the old love flooding back in the last month, but I couldn't deny that something had changed between us. She'd abandoned me back in the old world, calling off our engagement, and had yet to give me a clear reason why. Meanwhile, I had put her in a position where she had to murder, and I knew deep down inside she hadn't forgiven me for it. This was exactly what I had feared happening with Alexis. Maybe it was a good thing I'd left then. Maybe I really did belong with this army of raiders. I felt like I was growing more confused by the day. As I bid Christina goodbye, I realized one thing. It didn't hurt leaving her behind the way it had hurt leaving Alexis. I shoved that thought away and buried it, setting my mind to the fight to come. Days 481 to 486. Watson and I weren't assigned to any particular unit. Instead, Evan said that she just wanted us to go along and help as needed. This put us in a position of some respect, and we got envious glances from soldiers we marched with. As far as I knew, she was planning on using our skills of moving behind enemy lines for reconnaissance. She had no idea that moving behind enemy lines was exactly what we were doing right now. And yet, despite the Army of the Dawn being a threat to everyone I loved back home, I was now marching to battle with them. I'd honestly grown to like Robert. Deep down inside, he was a kind man caught up in a world gone bad, forced to make some tough decisions. And I suppose there were more like them amongst the rest of the Iron Lady's soldiers. But the rest? How many of my comrades in arms were murderers, raiders, or cannibals? Watson reminded me that it didn't matter right now. All our lives were on the line. We had a company's worth of soldiers moving east toward Greenwood, so approximately 120 or so. There were an additional 40 permanently stationed there on the border of the Iron Lady's territory alongside their families. From what I heard, a small community had sprung up in the relative safety of the fort, but they had already fled west. Scout reports said a force of Aztecos was moving northwest out of Congress on Highway 93. I remembered Congress. I'd driven through it on my way to Phoenix a lifetime ago. Now it was on the edge of disputed territory between the Army of the Dawn and the Aztecos. The scouts could only estimate numbers. They didn't stick around long enough for a good count, knowing they'd need to get word to Havasu as soon as possible. Estimates, however, put the Aztecos at about 200. I'd fought in war back in the old world, but I'd always been on the side with superior technology and air support. Sure, I'd be more than a few scraps deep in hostile territory where none of that mattered, but our training, equipment, and doctrine had always been superior. Even amongst the best Taliban or insurgent fighters, there were no peers to US Army Cav Scouts. But war had changed. We had four strikers, and they would put a hurting on an enemy without combat vehicles. But most of the soldiers of the Iron Lady's army had only the training provided to them by some veterans in her ranks. The playing field felt uncomfortably level, and they had the numbers advantage. Days 487 to 490. When we arrived at Greenwood, the news went from bad to worse. The incoming group of Aztecos had been reinforced by two more bands, and now scouts estimated their numbers at around 300. We were outnumbered almost 3 to 1, but we still had the strikers and an assortment of heavy weapons. As the rest of the troops began to build the fence works, the Iron Lady called me into her war council. Given my background, she wanted to know what could be done to harass and delay the incoming enemy. This was classic US Army doctrine, using light infantry to harass an incoming force, but we didn't have enough trained men and women or the right tools for the job. If we had more warning, I would have recommended we set up scouts along Highway 93. They would have to take the highway north out of Congress before hooking into the desert to push west toward our position at Greenwood. However, to get here, they'd have to go through several narrow desert valleys, perfect spots for ambushes, and terrain well suited for ambushers to slip away to safety. But we had no time, and we couldn't even begin to guess which desert passes they had used to advance. I shrugged my shoulders, apologizing. There's nothing we could do, just dig in and wait. 
She was unhappy with my response, but seemed to understand. As the meeting continued though, I felt completely useless. At night, I eventually had time to talk to Watson, and I finally felt mentally prepared for it. You hesitated, yet you knew the price for disobedience. You jeopardized our mission here. I shook my head sadly. I knew he was right. But shooting that kid in the face. Watson, there has to be a line somewhere. There has to be a point where wrong is just plain wrong. And uh, how's Christina, by the way? Or Alana? Ruslana? How about the folks you left behind in Big Bear? Watson went silent for a moment, then pulled his cowboy hat down over his face as he prepared to go to sleep. You tell me when you find that line. Half of me knew he was right, the other half was disgusted. As I lay down to go to sleep, I wasn't sure which half was winning, but both halves knew that Alexis would be disappointed in me for everything I'd done in the last year. Days 491 to 497 There's an unsettling anticipation in the days before an operation. I always found it worse than the actual combat itself. At least in combat, you were in combat, not sitting and waiting for it to come, wondering who would live and who would die and on which side of that divide you'd end up. War was easy, waiting was tough. The Big Sandy River was more sand than river, or precisely all sand and zero river. That was a shame, as a water feature would have given us considerable advantage. Instead, we were forced to set up defensive positions on the other side of the dried up riverbed, along the perimeter of the concrete cinder block outpost. We were on a slight rise, which was good for lines of sight, but gave very little tactical advantage. The terrain was simply indefensible. Whoever had chosen this spot for an outpost had been a fool and might have gotten us all killed. We filled sandbags and built trenches along the perimeter of the outpost, putting heavy machine guns, including one 50 cal and four M240 Bravos on the perimeter wall atop sandbag platforms. The strikers were put two apiece on each end of our defensive line, three of them were armed with 50 caliber machine guns, and one had a Mark 19 automatic grenade launcher. I was very glad for the Mark 19. The indiscriminate volley of explosive grenades it fired at long ranges had saved my bacon more than once. We built supplemental trenches along our flanks, but there was little fear of being flanked. The terrain was simply too flat, and there was no cover. If an assault was going to be successful, it would have to rely on overwhelming numbers from the front, as heavy fire support was apparently not an option. As we finished our defensive works, I had to admit, even though the Aztecos had superior numbers, we had a significant advantage over them. There was a little to no cover for them to use in a frontal assault, and our scouts reported they had spotted no heavy vehicles. Unless they miraculously had air power of some sort for this battle, it was shaping up to be an absolute bloodbath. I should have never underestimated our enemy. Days 498 to 500. They were near. We could hear the drums in the distance along with the sound of hundreds of voices chanting, groaning and screaming. It sounded like the mouth of hell itself had opened up somewhere out in the dark desert night. This was part of their rituals, one of the platoon sergeants told me. The Aztecos practiced ancient blood magic, which they combined with powerful drugs to whip up their soldiers into a murderous frenzy. In previous encounters, some of their men had taken multiple high-caliber rounds to the chest and kept advancing. I didn't believe in magic, but I did believe in the power of drugs to turn men into mindless killing machines, and I firmly believed the power of psychological warfare to demoralize an opponent before fighting even started. I went to see Evan in her command tent to raise my concerns. We need to do something about the men, ma'am. They've been sitting in their positions listening to that screaming, drumming, and chanting for two days and nights now. It's not good for the morale. They're terrified. The Iron Lady was looking over some letters delivered by Messenger, news from back home. Even on the front line, she was still lord over a sizable chunk of the American Southwest and, like any ruler, had domestic business that needed attending to. Finally, she paused and looked up at me. You're right. What do you recommend? Well, ma'am, to put it bluntly, the men worship you. They idolize you. They see you as a savior. They need to hear from you. A rousing speech could do much to shore up morale. She took my words with careful deliberation. I agree. That's a very good idea. Standing, she reached for her combat gear and buckled it on. Even in the dim light of the tent, she looked very much like an ancient warrior queen, only decked out in modern combat gear. Approaching me, she stopped just a few feet short. I'm a savior in my army, but I wonder, what do you think I am? I froze. My mind raced. Part of me deeply admired her, part of me was revolted by her. I opened my mouth to speak, say anything, and break the awkward silence, but then I spotted movement in the darkness behind her. Instinct took over. I grabbed Evan and pulled her behind me, shielding her with my body. Two darts thudded into my body armor. I glanced down at them in surprise for a moment before combat instincts continued their work. I snapped up my pistol as the figure leapt out of the darkness. Beside it, a second figure was crawling through a small rip in the tent it had quietly cut with a large knife. I fired before the figure could reach me, two in the chest. When it hit the floor, I put another one in the head and turned my attention to the figure slithering into the tent. 
To the left of us, two more figures leapt out of the darkness, but Eben was on them. The thunder of her revolver would be heard throughout the entire camp as it rang out twice and two more bodies hit the floor. My attacker was the only one left, but he was surprisingly fast, ducking under my fire and closing the distance terrifyingly quickly. He had a knife in hand and slashing out of my belly, but I squatted down so the blade bit into my combat armor instead. Lashing out with his other hand, he tried to knock my weapon away, and for a moment we were both locked into close quarters. I grabbed him by the arm and tossed him to the ground with a judo hip toss, then finished him off with my firearm. Guards rushed in, but it was all over. The four would-be assassins lay dead at our feet. Now that they were out of the shadows of the corner of the tent where they had silently cut their way in, I could see them properly, and what lay before me was terrifying to behold. I now understood why the soldiers feared the Aztecos, and why superstition ran rampant throughout the troops. The dead men were naked, except for a sandy brown loincloth around their hips. They didn't even wear shoes. Their teeth were blackened, I was guessing with charcoal or something similar, and sharpened to points. I had heard of an African tribe that worshipped crocodiles, and to honor them, the men would have square patterns cut into their flesh of their arms, legs, and back. The resulting scars would be raised off the flesh and resemble the plated scales of a crocodile. These men had undergone a similar mutation, but all over their bodies, even their faces and shaved heads, and in completely random patterns. As I turned over one of the corpses to get a better look, Eben joined me. These are their scouts and assassins. Matadores, they call them. Killers. They cut their flesh like this so it blends in with the desert ground. It was a horrifying sight, but I had to agree their tanned skin and scarred bodies would make it difficult to spot one lurking in the desert. Explained how they'd gotten so close. I was starting to understand why the Aztecos were so feared. This wasn't an army of men at our doorstep, it was an army of monsters. The sound of one of the strikers' 50 caliber machine guns going off brought me back to the real world. Moments later, the other two gun strikers joined in. The sound of men shouting out orders filled the air, and from somewhere out in the nighttime desert came a horrible wailing sound building up to a screaming crescendo that made my blood run cold. Day 501. The camp was in disarray as soldiers rushed to defensive positions. A bell had been set up, with a young recruit sounding it as loudly as he could, but it was completely unnecessary. The sound of the three 50 caliber mounted striker vehicles firing their machine guns completely drowned out the sound of the bell. Just minutes ago, I'd saved the Iron Lady from an attack by three Azteco assassins. Now we were under full-scale attack. The screams of the advancing horde was nearly as loud as the 50 caliber machine guns. I was about to rush to the nearest defensive fighting position when the Iron Lady grabbed me by the shirt. No, you stick with me from now on. I nodded my assent as Evan, the Iron Lady and commander of the Army of the Dawn, threw on body armor and grabbed a rifle from one of her men. The assassination attempt had lit a fire inside her, and she barked out orders in rapid succession to her subordinates. She was terrifyingly efficient. Not even a brush with death via poison needles and surprise attack in the middle of the night could rock her. She was an impressive woman. I could now see how she gathered such a large following of slavers, raiders, and cannibals, all living under her banners and her laws. We settled into a fighting position along the very center of the outer perimeter. The Iron Lady led from the front. Ahead of us was a screaming horde of Aztecos, rushing across the desert in a huge human tidal wave. Our intelligence had been wrong, dead wrong. We weren't facing a couple hundred warriors here, we were up against what looked like at least a thousand. Save your rifles until they're within 200 meters. Let the machine guns do their work until then. The Jaguar warriors are bullet sponges. The real attack is behind them. The Iron Lady's orders were quickly obeyed. Out ahead and approaching rapidly were what I now knew the Aztecos called Jaguars. This was their frontline infantry that attacked with everything from clubs to spears or makeshift axes and swords. It was horribly archaic and no match against a force armed with modern weapons, but they were also fueled by a volatile cocktail of drugs that numbed the pain and threw them into a state of psychosis for the battle. They were meant to soak up bullets and get up close and personal, throwing the enemy into disarray. Behind them, the Aztecos would advance their aqueros, or archers. They were well-trained infantry with modern weapons. It made a certain sense. Modern weapons and ammo was growing rarer every day. It wasn't good for war if you used up thousands of rounds of ammunition that was getting harder to replace, and when you control as much territory as the Aztecos, there's no shortage of maniacs to round up, fuel with drugs, and throw into the teeth of enemy defenses. The horde moved shockingly fast, at a full sprint for the entire 400 meters between us and the banks of the dried up Big Sandy River. They showed no sign of exhaustion or fear as they filled the air with their blood-curdling battle cries. The strikers chewed into the Jaguar lines, big, heavy, 50 caliber rounds snapping limbs clean off and putting fist-sized holes into targets. To my amazement, 
Some jaguars kept on coming for at least 20 paces before falling over stone cold dead. Somewhere behind their lines though, I saw two streaks of light fly up into the sky and then level out, approaching us. I was puzzled for a moment, and then it hit me like it was about to hit two of our strikers. Javelins! It was a pointless warning. The striker crews couldn't have saved themselves even if they tried. The Javelin anti-tank missile had devastated Russian forces in Ukraine, and the 19-pound warhead obliterated the thinly armored strikers. The crew never even knew what happened. Just under 10 seconds after launch, two of the strikers went up in flames, the shrapnel from the explosion maiming multiple soldiers taking cover nearby. We were down to two strikers on our right flank. Make that one striker. A third Javelin hit home seconds after the first two. However, by now, the Jaguars were close enough that the surviving striker could finally open up. Armed with a Mark 19 automatic grenade launcher, this striker did even more devastating work than the 50 caliber strikers had been doing. Each 40 mm grenade had a kill radius of 5 meters, and the enemy was very tightly packed in. To my shock and horror though, they just kept charging, oblivious to the way their ranks were being decimated by the rapid fire explosives. I brought my rifle to bear now. The enemy was within the Iron Lady's engagement distance. She wanted the riflemen to conserve ammo, take more accurate shots at shorter ranges. It made sense, but it put the Jaguars terrifyingly close to our lines. Jaguar after Jaguar fell to the terrifying power of modern rifles and machine guns, and yet they kept coming. In what only seemed like seconds, the human wave broke into our lines. Three Jaguars jumped into our DFP, and I immediately whirled around to engage them. The one in front of me was a horrifying sight. He was missing half his teeth, and those that remained he had sharpened into sharp fangs. He also attached blades with wires to his arms, and he slashed out at me with one arm. I couldn't use my rifle in such close quarters, so I used it as a club and blocked the attack, striking back with the butt of my rifle. The Jaguar was knocked backwards and briefly stunned from my attack. I reached for my knife at my boot and put it into his chest. The man continued to struggle and fight, completely oblivious to the mortal injury, until he finally went limp. Something smashed into my back and knocked me forward. The Iron Lady immediately stepped over me, her handgun firing twice. A Jaguar armed with a spear fell over dead, almost on top of me. I was lucky he stabbed right into my armor plate. I scrambled up to my feet just as our M240 gunner took a hatchet to the face. I jumped behind the machine gun and started firing as a vehicle sped through the desert behind us and came to a stop with the roar of tires through dirt. Ma'am, it's hopeless. There's too many. We gotta get you out of here. The driver was yelling through the open passenger window of an old army Humvee. The Iron Lady looked around defiantly. I could tell she was on the verge of saying no, but she was a practical woman more than anything. The driver was right. This was a lost battle. Their numbers were overwhelming. Everyone, out of the hole! Into the vehicle now! The surviving members of the Iron Lady's inner circle scrambled out of the hole, running toward the vehicle. I didn't budge. Soldier! I said fall back! No, if I get off this machine gun, we're all dead before we get to the Humvee. Go! The Iron Lady's face was set in stone. Finally, she grunted an acknowledgement and ran back to the Humvee. I heard its tires begin to chew the dirt even before she closed the door. I thought I could see a break in the Jaguar waves. Finally, their main assault was being expended, but that still left their arqueros. The barrel of the M249 began to glow in the dark from the heat, but there was no time for a barrel change. Then, I felt something hit the side of my head, and the world went dark. Days 541 to 544, I woke up in a hospital, a real hospital, complete with electricity. For a few moments, I thought I was dreaming, but the hum of the electric lights over my bed was more than real, as was the heart monitor beeping steadily along next to me. I tried to get out of bed and almost fell over from the effort, which prompted an unseen nurse to run over. My vision became cloudy and I passed out again. Several hours passed before I woke up again, and Christina was on a chair next to my bed. She immediately hugged me when she saw me come too, and held my hand as a doctor explained everything. I'd taken a bullet to the head, but luckily the bullet had been from a bad cartridge and didn't have enough energy to penetrate my skull. It had more than enough energy to knock me out though, and cause significant bruising to my brain. After getting me back to Havasu, doctors put me in a medically induced coma to allow my brain to heal without me distressing it. It'd been Watson who dragged me to safety. The army had been overrun, but the Iron Lady had sent a few more vehicles to get as many survivors out of there as possible. Not many had made it, only two dozen or so out of just over a hundred. The rest had been killed, or worse, taken as slaves, or for the arcane blood rituals that fired up the Aztecos for battle. 
I was in the hospital for a few days, but got word that the Iron Lady had requested to see me just as soon as I was strong enough to stand on my own two feet. It was nice to have electricity again. The hospital ran on solar power and was the only building in town that had access to electricity. There just wasn't enough sunlight pouring through the perpetually clouded sky to generate enough juice for more buildings. Millions of tons of material was still in the upper layers of the atmosphere from the two-year ongoing nuclear war that the rest of the world was waging. Days 545 to 549. Watson finally came by the hospital to visit after returning from a patrol. He told me that the Aztecos seemed to have retreated after destroying our forces at Greenwood and the Army of the Dawn had been sending out patrols to monitor for any push into its territory. So far, nothing, but Watson felt uneasy. It was like the quiet after that first bolt of lightning before the whole sky comes crashing down on you, he said. The conviction with which he said it made a shiver run down my spine. Doctors kept me under observation for a few days before they finally let me go. I had a tremendous headache that came from time to time, but other than that, I seemed to be in good shape after my recovery. After two days at home with Christina, the Iron Lady summoned me. I didn't know what I was walking into, but I was escorted into her headquarters immediately upon arrival. Eben, the Iron Lady, and the ruler of the Army of the Dawn was hunched over a large map of her territory, surrounded by multiple advisors, her generals. As I entered the room, her gaze flickered over to me for a moment before returning to her briefing. A few minutes later, the small huddle finally broke up, and Eben nodded for me to join her by the map table. I could see the familiar map of her territory lying before me. The blue pin at Greenwood, however, was gone. I noticed fresh pinholes from other fortifications along that border, all with missing pins. They've hit us across a wide front in the last month, but never actually followed up with the attacks to try to hold the territory. Eben gestured at the maps before her, pointing out to the empty pinholes. Could be they're probing our defenses, learning how we fight and what we got to fight with. Yeah, or, or it's a diversionary attack, trying to fix our forces in the east while they come from somewhere else, south would be my guess. The Iron Lady nodded, agreeing with my assessment. I've got scouts out north and south looking for a main force. They haven't seen anything so far, but we're not reinforcing the lost outpost yet. Not until we know where the main attack is coming from. Her assessment was sharp. She had territory to trade for time until the main attack force could be found. Even if that meant the loss of several communities, I'd seen what the Aztecos did to their own bodies. I shuddered to think what they did to their prisoners. Clearing her throat, the Iron Lady motioned for me to follow. There's another matter to discuss. Follow me. She took me outside to a small courtyard, probably once a place for city workers to relax and eat, but the Iron Lady had turned it into a ceremonial gathering place of sorts. There was a small crowd gathered. To my surprise, they looked at me with some measure of respect. What in the world was going on? The Iron Lady gestured for me to wait, then took a place upon a small raised platform so she could address the crowd. She spoke of the battle, of our losses, and promised revenge. Then she turned to me. For heroism covering the retreat of myself and my command staff, under threat of certain death, I award you the first son, one of our highest honors. I was flabbergasted, staring dumbly at the Iron Lady even as she gestured I approach. I willed my legs to move, but my mind was racing. I'd come out here how long ago? Half a year at least, and my goal had been to find out how to destroy the threat that loomed over the free settlements of the people I loved back home in California. Now, the leader of an army of cannibals, raiders, slavers, and other desperados was awarding me their highest honor after saving her life twice. The Iron Lady pinned a medal on me that looked like a fist raised defiantly into the sky. It looked original. Somebody had manufactured this. The Iron Lady shook my hand firmly, then narrowed her gaze. However, you still defied a direct order to retreat. In light of your heroism and self-sacrifice, I am commuting your sentence from death to twenty lashes. If my mind was spinning before, it was spinning even harder now. Yet despite everything, I suddenly felt myself center. I fixed my eyes on the Iron Lady's own and nodded. She was right. I had disobeyed a direct order from a superior officer in a battle. Control meant everything when your army was made up of bands of raiders. I was led to a clearing in the small plaza where a large wooden pole had been erected. It had restraints at the top. The contraption had clearly seen much use. Robert was there to greet me. He held my gaze, and once I was close enough, he held out his cupped hand. From the Iron Lady. Bite down on it hard. It'll help. There was a crude mouthguard of some sort in his hand. I took it and popped it into my mouth. Then a soldier stepped up to secure my hands and the restraints, but I shoved him away and took my shirt off, pressing my hands up above my head onto the pole. I caught Robert's nod of respect as he stepped away, but not before reminding me to bite hard. I did, and immediately I felt something crack inside the mouth guard, and a warm liquid poured out. I swallowed it by instinct. The Iron Lady allowed the silence to linger for a moment, then declared my charges and punishment once more to the crowd. The gathered raiders, cannibals, and slavers of the Army of the Dawn looked solemn, 
I expected excitement, howls for blood, anything but this. The first flash sent waves of fire across my back, and despite myself, I let out a short, muffled scream. However, I didn't move my hands from the top of the post. The second hurt worse than anything I'd ever felt before. By the time the third lash hit, though, the Iron Lady's gift was doing its thing. It hurt, but far less. I never became numb, but the agony was greatly reduced. Even this the Iron Lady had planned. She showed me great favor, but wished me to hurt just enough to learn my lesson. Days 550 to 554. She had you whipped! Christina was on the verge of angry tears again. It had been a few days since the incident, and I had been home recuperating. She was halfway through the job of replacing the bandages on my back, probably the only thing keeping her from storming off upstairs to the bedroom. Watson had been staying with us since his return from patrol, and puffed up on his pipe on an opposite couch. Yes, and she could have done worse. Despite everything, I could tell I meant it, and that worried all three of us. When I first saw you again after the end of the world, I asked you if you were with them. You promised me you weren't. Since running into her just over five months ago, I'd finally filled her in on my real mission here. I remembered the day well, the shock of finding her again, the horror that she thought I might have been one of the raiders all along, and the betrayal. We'd broken up three months before the end of the world. She was supposed to have been at her brand new job on the East Coast. The entire reason we'd separated was because, according to her, our lives were headed in opposite directions. Yet, she stuck around for three whole months after breaking up. I was glad, in a way, but I felt betrayed nonetheless. My friend, don't forget why it is that we're here. Watson spoke softly, ever cautious and wary of being overheard. I pondered my response when I was interrupted by a series of firm knocks at the door. Watson stood up to answer it, one hand slightly behind his right hip, staying near his knife. Looking through the peephole, he shot us a warning look. As she opened the door, Eben stepped into my apartment. Christina immediately stood and nodded politely, rage barely constrained as she excused herself upstairs. Watson returned to his spot on the couch, puffing on his pipe. Evan walked over with a gentle hand on my shoulder and prompted me to turn around. Mind if I take a look? I turned so she could see the whip's handiwork. She nodded knowingly, then produced a jar of strange ointment and slathered some on her hands. This will sting a bit, but it'll help with the healing. Reduce scarring by a great deal, too. I winced as she began to gently apply the salve to my back. After the sting, though, came relief. Whatever it was was strongly medicated. You understand why I had to make the display I did. It was Watson who answered, though, not me because your throne sits at the apex of an organization built by maniacs, criminals, and psychopaths of the old world. If she was offended or angry, she didn't show it. Merely nodded as she continued her work on my back. I want you to consider what we've built here, the stability and progress we've made since the end of the world. Before you judge me, I want you to consider what you saw out of Greenwood. Now you know what we're up against. She was right, as usual. The Army of the Dawn wasn't a pretty organization, but what lay at its borders was far worse. Thinking what might happen to my friends back in the West if the Army overran them worried me. Thinking what might happen if the Aztecos found them horrified me. As if reading my mind, the Iron Lady spoke again. I want you to go back home. Once you're better, of course. Let the folks know what's really out there. I looked at Watson for just a moment, betraying my surprise. Oh, come on. You don't think I run an organization as large as this without my fair share of spies, do you? I know where you came from, Farmbridge, and Big Bear before that. And I know despite all my organization's shortcomings, you still saved my life twice. The first time, I honestly didn't know it was her I was saving. In fact, I thought I was saving a victim from a raider attack. Turns out it had been the other way around. I'd killed an innocent person trying to chop the head off this oversized monster. But the second time, that one had been by choice. I put my body between her and poison darts on purpose. Once you're strong enough for travel, I want you to go back home. Let folks know what's lurking out in the wasteland. You know what we're up against, and you know we can use all the resources we can get to counter this threat. I'd rather not have to waste the manpower on both sides to take them by force. She finished reapplying the salve, then screwed the top pack on it and set it on the coffee table. Reapply every night until your back is fully healed. And once it does, requisition whatever supplies you need from the armory. The Aztecos are coming, gentlemen. Greenswood was just a taste. Nobody can survive alone in the wastes anymore. Without waiting for a response, the Iron Lady left, leaving a massive silence between Watson and I. Days 555 to 560. Despite not being well enough to travel yet, we still made preparations to leave. Christina was being distant. She didn't know about Alexis, of course. Not that it mattered. Alexis was a different life ago. Or so I told myself. Days 561 to 564. Christina begged me to stay so I could fully recover, but I was too eager to get back on the road. I wouldn't be able to carry my own supplies for a while yet, but Watson was eager to leave just as I was and agreed to carry my load. Reluctantly, Christina finally agreed. 
She didn't have much to pack other than travel supplies. Being a slave for most of the end of the world left her with little to call her own. My heart hurt a bit for her as we hit the road and my mind started to wander. She'd changed so much since the world went upside down. She'd been so alive once and now she was cautious all the time, her eyes constantly scanning for danger. She reminded me of Lilith and my heart ached a bit thinking about her and the rest. Soon I found myself thinking about Alexis, but I shoved the thoughts away. Days 565 to 570. I felt like I'd been on the road ever since the world ended. The joke got a little bit of a laugh from both Watson and Christina as we sat around the campfire. It was nice to see them laugh for a change. The last few months spent with the Iron Lady's army had been difficult. We'd all done things we never thought we'd do. The weight of our respective sins seemed to weigh heavily on us all. I hated to admit it, but maybe the three of us belonged with the Army of the Dawn more than we did back west. Well, maybe except for Christina. She'd only killed to protect me. It hurt to think about that night, how her mood had changed toward me ever since. There was a definite rift between us, but we clung to each other desperately regardless. As I lay down next to her to go to sleep, I couldn't help but wonder what we'd do if we ever found peace. Per usual, I guiltily found my thoughts drifting from Christina to Alexis as sleep overtook me. Days 571 to 574. Harsh weather forced us to shelter in place for a few days. Freak torrential downpours of dirty brown rain. Extreme weather events were becoming more common as the earth dealt with multiple environmental crises at the same time, and the unexpected torrent of rain created a serious danger of flash flooding. We moved to high ground and set up our tents, spending a miserable three days waiting for the rain to end. I didn't want to admit it, but I was glad for the break. My back was still healing and the stress of travel was taking a real toll. Christina tended to it every day at sunrise and sunset, and I was grateful for her attention. As we lay together one night though, I realized we hadn't said I love you to each other since before the end of our old world, long before the fight that led to our breakup. Days 575 to 579. We ran into the army's border guards after a few more days of travel. This wasn't unexpected, we knew that the Iron Lady had strengthened her border outposts ever since the attack on Greenwood. What was unexpected though was what we found, a caravan of people being turned around by the guards. This was a caravan of refugees from the western part of the Iron Lady's kingdom, and the border guards posted along the highway were preventing them from leaving her territory altogether. It was a bunch of scared families, no doubt terrified of an Azteco invasion and seeking safety in the far west. But the guards wouldn't let them through, angrily berating them and threatening to use their clubs on them if they didn't hurry up and turn around. Seems like the Iron Lady didn't want anyone leaving her little kingdom and thus weakening it right before a potential war. It was a stark reminder of her iron-fisted rule, but without her these people would have probably been dead to begin with. I'd crossed that border once a long time ago, fully convinced that this army of raiders had to be taken down somehow. Now that I'd seen what was truly out here in the wastes, I wasn't so sure anymore. Days 580 to 585. We were allowed passage thanks to the orders I had from the Iron Lady herself. The guard captain looked skeptical at first, but thought better of it. He had enough to deal with without crossing the Iron Lady herself. As we left the Lady's territory, we passed another caravan, this time on the way in. It had several wagons full of supplies, apparently a scavenging mission. But bringing up the rear was a line of survivors, all connected to each other by a rope tied around their neck. If they were lucky, they'd become slaves. If not, Christina averted her gaze. I caught Watson holding mine, his face searching mine for something. I hated what I saw, and I caught myself torn between the stability the Iron Lady provided and the cruelty of her rule. I believed that she wanted to build a better world. This was a temporary price, she'd once told me. Without giving the raiders and cannibals some leeway, it was impossible to bring order to the wastes. They were free to raid outside the territory but not within it. And slowly over time, when civilization returned, the old ways would die out with it. Was this really the only way to build a new world from the ashes of the old? Days 586 to 590. We were moving faster now. I felt better, and I was able to carry my own backpack for a few hours at a time without being in agony. Seeing the familiar landmarks definitely helped our morale. I was excited to get back to Farmbridge and see Ruslana again. But what would I tell her when I finally saw her? The Iron Lady had asked me to be honest about my report on her and her little kingdom, along with the threat of the Aztecos to everyone in the wastes. I believed in the threat the Aztecos presented, and I knew that Farmbridge or Big Bear couldn't survive alone. Once they rolled through the Iron Lady's territory, they'd come for them next. It made sense to join forces with the Iron Lady, but that meant putting the people I loved in her grasp. I found myself more and more conflicted, survival versus ideals. The wrong decision could get everyone I cared about dead. 
days 591 to 595. The sound of a jet engine put a halt to a lively conversation between the three of us, and we all simultaneously craned our heads up to the sky. The thick cloud cover made it difficult to see much. Thick debris still clogged the Earth's atmosphere, but somewhere above those clouds was a jet. Had to be military one if it was braving the debris in the upper atmosphere. We never spotted it, but could track its movement west over our heads by the sound. At some point, it seemed to turn north, and then a few minutes later, the sky went silent again. The jet ended all conversation for the rest of our traveling day, all of us quietly contemplating that somewhere out there, the United States of America still existed. The thought was a sobering one, and it made the Iron Lady and the Aztecos seem small by comparison. But the truth was, we were out here on our own. And as far as we know it, America was now only existing across a handful of military bases somewhere deep in the heartland. There was just no way of telling how the nuclear war was going, or if it was even over yet. Days 596 to 600 Ruslana's people found us about a day and a half out of Farmbridge. She'd set out scouts exactly as I predicted. But the people that met us on horseback were strangers to me. That made things a bit tense. But it seems Ruslana had put out word that we should be expected someday. The scouts led us to Farmbridge, skirting around Slab City to the north of us. It was good that I didn't recognize these scouts. I told Watson when we made camp one night it meant Farmbridge was growing. He grunted his agreement, not bothering to voice the question we were both thinking, but was it enough? Was it enough to resist the Iron Lady and the Aztecos to the east? My mind was still racing even as we approached the gates of Farmbridge, trying to find a way forward for all of us. Suddenly, a familiar yell brought me back to reality and staring in shock I watched Alexis running forward, practically hurtling herself into my arms. Somewhere in the distance I heard the happy barking sounds of Lucky rapidly approaching. Days 600 to 602, Alexis threw herself at me at a full run. Behind her, Lucky was happily barking and snaking his way past people to get to me. I immediately threw my arms around her but then gently pushed her off me. She looked confused, her eyes wet with happy tears and searching mine. Alexis, this is, uh, this is Christina, my ex-fiancé from, from before everything. Awkwardly, Christina stepped forward, introducing herself. I saw recognition dawn on Alexis's face, and it felt like being stabbed in the heart by an Azteco's blade. Oh, I see. She nodded solemnly, drying her eyes. Just then, Lucky crashed into me. There would be no deterring his affections. Lilith and Annie were next. The same dawning realization eventually hitting each one of them as well as I introduced Christina. I felt like a traitor, but, well, it'd been nearly a year. I pushed the guilt away. I never expected to see them all again, especially not Alexis. We were tired from so much time on the road, my knees practically buckling every time one of the girls threw herself into my arms. I was happy to see them all again, but I was exhausted from the road. Sensing this, they led us past Farmbridge's gates. Days 603 to 605. You're kind of an a-hole. Lilith wasn't mincing words. We both sat on top of one of the concrete barriers that made up the perimeter of Farmbridge. The work they'd started a year ago had finally been completed, and the place was a literal fortress. Even with heavy vehicles, any attacker would have a hard time penetrating its defenses. I could tell by her tone that she was only half-joking. Surprisingly, she'd taken it harder than the rest that I'd left Big Bear without telling them. Other than, well, Alexis, of course. I know, I'm sorry, but if I told you guys, I had to leave, then you would do something stupid like try to come with me. Lilith bristled at this. Is having us around that bad? I shook my head. No, you know that's not at all why I didn't say anything. Finally, she sighed, her shoulders slumping. Yeah, I know. Your heart's always in the right place, but sometimes the things you do, you've got to stop this greater good nonsense. We could have come with you. We could have found somewhere else to stay, like here. I slowly nodded. She was right on more points than either her or I realized at the moment. I thought it would have been better to leave the girls behind at Big Bear when I got banished for lying about who I was. Maybe Lilith was right. Ruslana had always told us we had a place here at Farmbridge, and it was shaping up to be a hell of a place. Do you forgive me? Lilith thought about it for a moment. For leaving? Yeah. For Alexis? No. Day 606 to 610. I had briefed Ruslana on the Iron Lady's proposal and the Azteco threat. I could tell from the way she looked at me that she was having a hard time believing me when I told her about those drug-fueled maniacs. I didn't blame her. It sounded like something out of a horror story. She wanted to address the community, but first she wanted me to brief the heads of the local settlements. Things have changed since you were here last. We've grown, made partnerships and alliances. She grinned, clearly proud of her work. She should be. A year and a half ago, this place was nothing more than a series of farms run by a thug that was currently still rotting in its prison. Now it was a lively trade hub for the Southern California area, with caravans coming through regularly. It sat on the crossroads of trade between survivor settlements in the ruins of San Diego and the Los Angeles outskirts and beyond, like an ancient trade city. This was making Farmbridge very wealthy. 
The currency of the day was goods, services, and even more importantly, skills and expertise. Rusulana had bargained and bartered for or simply attracted a host of old world professionals, technicians, and craftsmen. Workshops safely inside the settlement's concrete walls worked to adapt old technology into the needs of the new world. It was an impressive place. Ruslana had indeed done a good job. The meeting with the other settlement leaders would take place in a week. Until then, I occupied my time with teaching Ruslana's military commanders about the Azteco threat. It was a horde, plain and simple, with human wave attacks meant to soak up enemy resources before the real infantry attacked. There really wasn't much to teach, so I spent most of my time offering a hand here or there and avoiding Alexis. Day 611 to 613. Watson had spent much of his time with Alana and Clara. The two had settled here in Farmbridge and were overjoyed to see Watson again. I saw him smile again for the first time since we left to head east. It was nice, but I couldn't get out the image in my mind of him executing that farmer's son. I know our own lives and the lives of everyone we loved back here had been on the line. He'd only done what needed to be done, but the memory haunted me. I'd done what needed to be done plenty of times myself. I think the gulf that had grown between Watson and I wasn't so much because of me blaming him for what he did to that boy, but because it reminded me of everything I'd done in the name of survival or keeping my family safe. It was nice seeing him smile again though. His usual soft spot for Alana had returned. I never asked him about his old life. There was an unspoken agreement between us not to pry into the painful part of each other's lives, but seeing him with Alana again convinced me that he'd been a father once. Was his daughter still out there somewhere? Or had she been lost long before the world ended? Day 614 to 617. A large map lay spread out in what had become Ruslana's operation center. The whole scene eerily reminded me of the Iron Lady's own compound. Only Ruslana didn't tolerate slaving, cannibalism, or any of the violence the Iron Lady's realm had been built on. This was a place of hope for a better future from the ashes of the old world. But I couldn't help but think that the Iron Lady was far better prepared for the Azteco threat than Ruslana's people were. That was the perk of being a tyrant. Watson, Alexis, Annie, and I all ringed the table along with Ruslana and her senior most people. The map had locations marked in green to the south and north of Farmbridge with a green dot where Big Bear was located. Slab City on the east bank of the Salton Sea was marked bright red, along with a few smaller and larger dots on the map of the American Southwest. I recognized a few of the large red dots as the Iron Lady's westernmost outposts. They were only a few days march from here, less if she dedicated vehicles to the fight. There were several blue dots on the map as well. These symbolized important places for resources that were waiting to be explored or exploited. Ruslana stabbed her finger at one such dot located in the northern suburbs of Los Angeles. It was the location of a National Guard armory full of badly needed equipment. A small community has sprung up around the old armory, a bunch of veterans and their families, as well as some of the others they've taken in. We've reached out to them in the past, but they've always rebuffed our invitation to work together. We need the equipment that's in there, one way or the other, especially if all the intel you've given us on the Iron Lady is true. It is, and don't forget about the Aztecos. Ruslana nodded silently. I could see that she still didn't know what to make of my warnings. I almost felt like she was feeling me out, investigating where my loyalties actually lie. Or maybe I was just feeling guilty because in my quiet moments alone it had become harder and harder to deny there was a lot of truth to the Iron Lady's ways. The Aztecos were a critical threat that vastly outnumbered us or the Iron Lady's forces. They would break over us like a tsunami and sweep both forces aside. She sent me back here to talk to Ruslana and the other leaders and convince them that joining her was the only way to survive. Well, technically, she left the choice up to me. We had four strikers at the Battle of the Big Sandy River. It wasn't enough. I'd already given the details of the battle to Ruslana and the other settlement leaders. They all said they needed time to mull things over. Then it only makes it even more imperative we get to these weapons. There was a grim look on Ruslana's face that I didn't like. It reminded me too much of the Iron Lady. Are you suggesting we take them by force? Alexis looked horrified at the proposition. Ruslana said nothing, but the look on her face said it all. I tried to calm the situation. Wait, let me go and talk to them. I can tell them about the threat. What's at stake? Ruslana sighed. I'm sending a detachment over tomorrow. You're welcome to join them, but so far they think they're better off working by themselves. I'm going too. Alexis surprised everyone. Yep, me too. Annie nodded, turning to me. We go together, all of us. No more splitting up. Watson nodded his agreement. Days 618 to 623. We traveled north out of Farmbridge, two squads of fully equipped soldiers with us. A day later, we met up with another detachment from a settlement down in San Diego, bringing our total manpower up to 24, including our little group. The local leaders had taken my warning very seriously. A third squad of volunteers would be joining us once we hit LA. They were intent on getting their hands on the equipment in that armory one way or another. I had a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach the entire time. Was this really the only way? 
Alexis tried her best to avoid me, which put the rest of the group in a weird spot where they felt like they had to choose between her or I. Christina had come along, I don't think she really wanted to, but I'd confessed about my relationship with Alexis and now, well, I guess she felt like she had to come. Days 624 to 626. Annie and I stood watch in the south end of our camp. The clouds overhead had slowly started to clear up in the last few weeks, the debris from dozens, maybe hundreds of vaporized cities finally settling out of the atmosphere. You could finally see the stars again, and the sight was mesmerizing. I'd forgotten how much I missed seeing stars. Remember that night we went looking for the raiders and you interrogated that prisoner? Annie didn't have to remind me. I remembered perfectly well what it had taken to extract information out of him. I was glad Annie hadn't been around to see it. I nodded. Remember the promise you made me? I nodded again. Did you keep it? I sighed. I think so. I tried. I really did. I hadn't told her much details about my time with the Iron Lady. I didn't tell her how I'd earned Christina's freedom or how I'd inadvertently forced her to kill her own owner in order to save my life. I thought about Alexis. The pain was clear in her eyes. Yet she still came along to be close to me, even if we weren't really speaking. I thought about Lilith and how she'd darkened after I let her be captured by cannibals. I thought about Christina and how I'd made her a murderer. Maybe I should have stayed away. Maybe I belong over there, in the east. Annie looked at me for a long time before speaking. You kept the people you love safe, but that's cost them. And you, you need to be aware of that. I sighed. She was right, as usual. Days 627 to 631. The roads were surprisingly safe since the settlements had started banding together. We even came across a patrol securing this stretch of the 5 freeway. Each settlement had agreed to provide a number of men and women a month responsible for security over a stretch of roads in the area. The real clever bit, though, was that Ruslana had negotiated it so that each settlement sent patrols to roads near the other settlements, thus forcing the settlements to start trusting each other, making cooperation easier. We made camp outside of the ruins of LA to wait for the final team joining us. We'd soon be a small army or at least an entire reinforced platoon with almost the firepower to match. The break let us talk plans for what came next. Ruslana and the representatives from the other settlements made it clear being denied access to the depot was a non-starter. If it came down to it, they were willing to shoot their way in. Part of me was as appalled as Alexis was over the idea, but the other part of me, the part Annie had just warned me to watch out for, knew that Ruslana and the others were right. This was about more than just the survival of one small group of survivors. Farbridge was building a network of communities, maybe even the start of a real nation, and one ruled by reason, justice, and humanity not fear and tyranny like the Iron Lady's territory. But how could we live up to those values if we murdered everyone in our way to get there? Practicality versus idealism. There had to be another way. Days 632 to 636. The squad linking up with us was a day late. Apparently they'd run into trouble with some raiders. It was a reminder that these lands weren't yet civilized, and there were threats out there other than the Iron Lady and the Aztecos that only made our mission even more urgent. Christina could tell I was agitated as we lay next to each other in our tent at night. You've been distant since, well, since we got to Farmbridge. I was glad she couldn't see my face in the dark. I don't know what I'm doing back here. What do you mean? I turned on my back to stare up at the dark ceiling of the tent above me. Somewhere outside, I could hear the guys on watch having a conversation and laughing occasionally. The Iron Lady's a monster, but she's brought peace and stability to the east. Farmbridge, well, it has a shot, but it's also chaotic. The settlements arguing with each other, disagreeing on this and that. They couldn't stand up to the Iron Lady's forces on their own, and I've got no clue if they'd be willing to try to work together. But it doesn't matter, because neither side could stop the Aztecos alone. I turned over to face her, though it was difficult to see much in the dark. So, what do I do? Who's right here? Christina was silent for a bit before speaking. You've never lived as a slave. It's an awful thing. Having no control over your own life, being property, no system like that deserves to survive. But you're right, neither side can stand on its own. Maybe there's a way to make sure one falls and the other survives. I was surprised. I guess Christina and I never really talked much about her time with the Army of the Dawn. I knew her experiences had been troubling, but she'd never spoken about how she felt. There was a real venom in her words when she spoke about one system falling and the other surviving. She was telling me to set up the Iron Lady, betray her at her most vulnerable. It was a terrifyingly elegant solution. Days 637 to 640. The situation was tense as we approached the National Guard encampment. I could tell immediately these guys knew what they were doing. They'd set up their settlement inside the perimeter of a small National Guard base, itself at the end of a suburban neighborhood. They'd torched the homes within 100 meters of the perimeter fence, giving themselves clear lines of fire at anyone straying too close. The main gate had been reinforced with the same sand and dirt-filled containers we used in Afghanistan to create the walls for our FOBs, and watchtowers ringed the entire perimeter. 
We'd sent a messenger in advance, so the settlement's leadership came out to greet us with a small security detachment. The guys were fully kitted up. Their M4s looked well maintained with older ACOG sights. Over their uniforms, they wore body armor complete with plate inserts. If we'd had to take this place by force, it was going to be a hell of a painful fight. Ruslana decided to invite the leadership to our camp. I could tell this was a power play. She was letting them see how many men we'd brought with us and the state of our equipment. It wasn't nearly as good as theirs, but we were well equipped ourselves, enough to show that we were a credible threat. She made a simple point. Didn't waste time with pleasantries or negotiation. If the SoCal settlements were going to survive what was coming, we needed to work together, and that meant sharing the contents of the National Guard Armory. The senior representative from the Armory shook his head wordlessly. He was a tall man, around 50, who looked like he could do a PT with guys half his age no problem. I suspected he'd been Special Forces at some point, and his name tape read Johnson. You're out of your mind if you think we're just going to hand over heavy equipment to people who may turn around and use it on us. Rusalana huffed aggressively. Clearly, diplomacy was not her thing. Why would we attack you with your own guns? If that's what we were like, we would have done it already. Johnson looked over the camp. Looks like you're ready to do just that. Things were going south quick. And then, to my surprise, Alexis stepped in. Yes, there are some of us who think the situation is dire enough that if it comes to it, we should just take what you have by force. But that's not who we really are. We're, well, scared. The camp seemed to fall silent. Ruslana shot an eyebrow up in surprise. We're scared of being betrayed by people we try to trust. We're scared of what's out there in the East. We're scared because what we lost in the old world and what it's going to take to get some of it back. But we can't keep being scared for letting fear drive our decisions. Yes, we want your weapons, but only because of what's out there, threatening to destroy the little we've built up. But the truth is, even with your weapons, we probably still couldn't defend ourselves. Because what we really need is you. We need a community. You could practically hear a pin drop, and Johnson's stone-cold mask seemed to slip for a moment. I know you're just trying to protect your families. We are too. But what's out there and coming this way doesn't care about any of that. It'll come for us first, and then it'll come for you. Johnson finally spoke. I've heard your people talk about this threat out there in the desert. But the only threat I've seen is you and your people. Right here, right now, threatening to kill my people and steal their stuff. If there really is something out there in the desert, we'll tell them the same thing I tell you. Try and breach that perimeter, and it's the last thing you and your people will ever do. Alexis looked at me, her eyes beckoning me to speak up. I took her cue. That's not how it's going to happen. We've got what, a platoon's worth of men? Surely, we can muster up more from amongst the various settlements, maybe put together a company. But I was in the east, though. What's waiting out there is an army, fully equipped with combat vehicles, too. And past that army, something far worse. A horde of drugged-up, black magic-practicing psychotics that call themselves the Aztecos. I had his attention. Two of us did recon out there, and I joined with the Army of the Dawn. You've got, what, a platoon's worth of men in there? We had a reinforced company with us when the Aztecos came, and we lost. Truth is, yeah, we need your weapons and equipment, but so does the Iron Lady, badly. And she's coming for it one way or another, and after her, something worse. Johnson seemed to relent. It was all the opportunity we needed. Days 641 to 644. We were allowed to stay at the armory, well, in a specific area for visitors, as we met with the rest of the settlement's leaders. The group was also very interested in what I had to say about the Iron Lady, the Army of the Dawn, and the Aztecos. The fact that I was a former service member myself and had been to battle against the Aztecos lent me a great deal of credibility in their eyes. Yet both sides had failed to come to an agreement. Once inside the compound, I'd gotten a glimpse at the veritable treasure trove of equipment being stored here. We needed that equipment badly, but Alexis was right. We needed them even more. Listen, the only thing that's going to convince you is seeing it for yourself. We've been at this for two days now. Neither side really wants to fight the other. So I'll tell you what, give me one of your people. Let me show them the truth. I kind of took myself by surprise. I'd spoken well out of turn as Johnson and Ruslana had launched into a fresh argument, but I was sick and tired of the loggerheads both sides found themselves at. Johnson turned to look at me. What are you proposing? I had access to some of the Iron Lady's intelligence reports during my time with her. They've got a presence south, a few days over the border. It's small, but big enough camp that I can take you and show you what's waiting for all of us. Just need one of your guys, someone you trust. How do I know you won't just use him as a hostage? I'll stay. Now it was Alexis's turn to speak out of order, and I found myself immediately protesting. What? No, Ruslana can get someone else. Deal. Johnson agreed immediately. Could see that one means something to you. Fair enough. I'll give you family for family. You take care of my guy and bring him back safe, and you get your own back. And we'll see what he has to say. It was a win, but my guts were roiling inside. 
How could she go and do something so reckless after everything I'd done to keep her safe? Days 645 to 650. It took time to coordinate the trip I had proposed. Watson immediately invited himself along, but I refused. Alana would be heartbroken to see him take on a dangerous mission again, and when I pointed that out, he blushed for a moment. A rare display of emotion from the usually stoic man. I couldn't take that joy from her. Not yet. Annie flat out told me that I had no choice in the matter, she was coming as well. Lilith tried to force her way in, only to be met with a resounding no from both Annie and I simultaneously. She sheepishly backed off and reluctantly agreed to stay with Alexis instead. Ruslana offered to send one of her best people with us, but the fewer of us there, the better. That left Claiborne, the representative from the Armory Settlement. He was about my age and could immediately tell he too was a military veteran back in the old world. Seemed like a nice enough guy, given the circumstances, and surprisingly easygoing. I was worried they'd ship us off with someone who'd proved to be difficult. But I immediately had a good feeling about Claiborne. Ruslana needed to coordinate our passage south. We had to stay out of sight of all settlement patrols so nobody could leak word of our mission. This required changing some patrol routes in a way that didn't tip off our plan. When we were ready though, we grabbed our gear and got ready to set off. Christina would be going back to Farmbridge with Ruslana's people, so that left Lucky, Alexis, and Lilith who'd stay with the Armory people. Said my goodbyes to Christina and headed for the gate. I was surprised to find Alexis waiting for me there. Picking up on Alexis's unspoken cues, Annie hurried Claiborne along and out of earshot, leaving Alexis and I alone for the first time since I'd returned to Farmbridge. Hey, I stupidly couldn't think of what else to say, or rather could think of a million things I wanted to say but none that I could, leaving me us behind. I know why you think that was the right thing to do, but it really was really shitty of you. I know, I'm so… you know the worst part? The part that really hurts? This time I didn't even try to answer. I don't even hate you for it. Her eyes had welled up with tears. I could feel mine threatening to do the same. Suddenly, she threw her arms around me in a big hug. Please, come back. Days 651 to 661. We had to stay off the main roads to sneak our way south. We couldn't risk a single traitor or patrol running across us and potentially tipping the Aztecos off. Our paranoia was well-founded. The Iron Lady had stressed on me that the Aztecos were more than a psychopathic, drug-addicted horde. They were experts at espionage and sabotage, having infiltrated the Army of the Dawn with operatives who willingly allowed themselves to be enslaved. The assassins I'd saved the Iron Lady from in her tent had been led there by slaves the Army had brought along. Our caution slowed us down considerably. The cities were not just a mess of rubble and ruins, but more dangerous to travel there than through the open desert roads. Raiders and bandits hid in the ruins, having been pushed into the dead cities by Ruslana's alliance of settlements. But the bigger threat was fallout. The city ruins were still full of radioactive dust. The radioactivity would come in very, very low doses, but just walking through the ruins kicked up incredible amounts of dust. Get enough of it in your lungs, and even low amounts of radioactivity would kill you. We covered our mouths and noses and pushed on, traveling during the night and resting during the day. It took us 10 days to get to the San Diego outskirts. Days 662 to 666. We gotten to know Claiborne as we traveled. He preferred to be called Clay and said that before the end of the world, he and his girlfriend had a nice apartment near the ocean. After getting out of the military, he'd worked on some online show. I forgot what he called it. I asked about the girlfriend, dreading the worst, but apparently they both survived together before linking up with the veterans taking shelter at the armory. He was a likable guy. I was glad things back there hadn't come to bloodshed. Alexis was right. We needed to trust each other and cooperate. But I couldn't help but think about the Iron Lady because she had a point as well. We needed those weapons and supplies, so what if, even after our trip, they refused to cooperate? Well, I know what she'd do. Take what she needed and kill anyone in her way. All for the greater good, of course. I couldn't help but remember an argument Alexis had with Ruslana before we got to the armory. Ruslana had pointed out the need to secure these supplies by any means necessary, reminding me a lot of the Iron Lady herself. Alexis's response had been simple. How long do you expect to hold on to that which you take by force? Days 667 through 670. We were finally approaching the Mexican border. Ruslana's last allied settlement was a day behind us. This was the Wild West. Nobody had managed to establish relations with any group of survivors in Mexico yet. What refugees had survived the massive windstorms driving radioactive debris down into the country, or the mass starvation that followed, had spoken of absolute chaos. The government had collapsed nearly overnight and the cartels ruled in its stead. The massive arsenals they'd amassed during the drug trade had come into great use and they were actually probably the best prepared for the end of the world out of any group. But they had turned on each other in a bitter struggle for resources and non-irradiated living space. The resulting war had been brutal on a truly epic level, and what I knew from the Iron Lady's recon people was that the Aztecos had come out on top. We were headed south toward the coast on the Gulf of California side. From there, we'd cross the Gulfland into Sonora, 
as Teco country. There was supposed to be a settlement somewhere near Caborca, which marked the westernmost border of the territory, and it was there that I hoped to show Clay the real horror of what we were all facing. Days 671 to 674. We had little info on this part of Mexico, so we thought it best to travel off the main roads again. We'd plotted a route that should let us avoid most of the old major cities and anybody who might have set up in the ruins. With luck, we'd remain completely undetected. That luck would run out pretty soon. Days 675 to 677. We heard their horses before we saw them. Despite all our precautions, someone somewhere had spotted us, and by the sound of the rapidly approaching hooves, we were sure their intent wasn't friendly. But the raiders didn't know how well armed we were. Before leaving the armory, Johnson had given us all night vision sights for our rifles. Dropping prone on the desert floor, we started picking off riders while they were still 200 meters away from us. Four of the riders went down before it appeared as if the group had lost their nerve. Half of the remaining riders broke off. It wasn't obvious we weren't ordinary survivors ripe for plundering. The other half ignored their comrades and continued their charge, now returning wild and very inaccurate fire. Our return fire, though, was deadly accurate thanks to the night vision, and more riders dropped. With just a hundred meters between us, the surviving riders broke off as well and fled. We ignored the cries of the wounded. This could be a small part of a larger group. It could be back with reinforcements. Instead, we dashed off on a fast trot, leaving the carnage we'd wrought behind us. Days 678 to 682. The territory was unfamiliar, not just geographically but politically. We had no idea who had survived here south of the border and what their allegiances were, so we had to travel with caution. This slowed us down considerably. But it was better to be safe than sorry. Our plan was to infiltrate the Azteco settlement and get up close enough to convince Clay that the threat was very real. To do this, we'd pose as slavers, with Annie as our catch. She took offense at this plan initially until I pointed out that a pretty girl was probably a more convincing slave than either of us would be. To look like we belonged amongst the psychopaths, I brought Halloween makeup supplies with us. It seemed silly, but the Aztecos loved to paint their faces and bodies in a grotesque pseudo-reflection of what they imagined the real Aztecs would have looked like. It was all nonsense, of course, but the psychological effect of the paint and body modifications was irrefutable. I'd seen few things more terrifying than the hundreds of rushing Azteca warriors with mutilated and painted bodies, rushing headlong into certain deaths and not caring at all for it thanks to the powerful cocktail of drugs and stimulants they took beforehand. Days 683 to 687. We finally made it to a small village on the coast of the Gulf of California. We'd spent a day doing recon from a distance, gauging who, if anyone, lived there and what their affiliation may be. There seemed to be just a few families who set their boats out every day to fish and grow some crops on the side. Their life had probably changed very little since the end of the world, though there was no telling how good their catch was since the oceans had undergone extreme acidification from all the pollution and debris global nuclear war had caused. They were friendly enough, though, when we finally made contact and we bartered with them for a place to stay, some food, and a boat we could use to cross the gulf. They happily accepted two of our first aid kits and a stash of other medical supplies we'd brought specifically to barter with. This was the currency of the new world, and life-saving supplies were worth their weight in gold. Nobody would be making antibiotics again for decades at this rate. On our final day with them, we prepared to set out when suddenly the villagers called out an alarm. We could see the telltale dust trails from horses rapidly approaching in the distance. One of the older women rushed us into a house and told us to stay inside and be quiet. We did as we were told but we had our rifles at the ready regardless. Four men rode up and two of them immediately dismounted. They laughed brashly and pushed the villagers around at will. It was clear this village was under the thumb of these thugs, and they were here to collect taxes. The villagers put together what meager fish and crops they'd managed to scrape together and presented them, but the leader of these men immediately grew angry. Apparently, it wasn't enough. I spoke enough Spanish to navigate my way through a conversation, but I didn't need to be fluent to understand what that man was saying when he suddenly grabbed one of the young women and started dragging her toward the horses. His other dismounted companion grabbed another young girl and dragged her as well. It was clear that if the village couldn't pay its taxes and food supplies, they were willing to take substitutions. I thought about Christina and slavery. Then I thought about Alexis and chains. It was enough to spur me to action. I didn't give warning. Annie and Clay would have to catch up. I stepped out of the home and shouted at the men getting their attention. As the leader turned to face me, I brought my rifle up and put two directly in his chest. His stunned compatriot was quick to follow. The men on horseback cussed and reached for their weapons, but Annie and Clay were on the ball and dropped them too. Their horses ran off in fear, dragging their slain riders behind them. Immediately, the villagers started shouting and screaming. This was not what I've expected. The old woman who had hit us ran straight over, wailing and moaning. What have you done? You've killed us all! I was confused. We just saved two of their women from a horrible fate. Now, when they don't return to their boss, the boss is going to come here and kill us all! A sinking feeling filled my stomach and I felt the world had dropped out from under me. 
You go, go now. We tell them something, a story, but you go. Please, just go now. I felt numb all over as we made our way to the boat. We tried to help them. We thought we were doing the right thing. I searched Danny and Clay's faces, but the look they wore said it all. We had to leave. We couldn't stay to protect these people. Too many other lives were depending on us. As we pushed our boat past the breaking waves, I fevertly hoped the villagers would come up with a convincing story. Days 688 to 692. We landed the boat on the other side of the gulf after spending most of the day crossing it. The small boat had an engine with just a few horsepower and more than once I feared we'd end up sunk or stranded, but by some miracle we made the crossing. We found a small cove that would perfectly hide our boat and dragged it up the beach, tying it to the biggest boulder we could find. Now it was time for our disguises. We had to look the part. We took Annie's rifle but let her keep a small sidearm, then tied a rope to her neck. Using Halloween makeup, Clay and I painted our faces in a facsimile of what we'd seen Azteca warriors do. Their body paint seemed pretty random, so as long as we got the colors right I didn't think we'd draw much attention. Clay was concerned about the fact that we were obviously Americans, but I told him that I'd seen many white Aztecos in that human wave attack against the Army of the Dawn. They were equal opportunity psychopaths. Finished with our preparations, we set off. It would only be a few days before we reached Caborca. Days 693 to 696. It didn't take long to see signs of the Azteco presence. There were a few traders on the road. Men and women who kept their heads down and avoided making eye contact or conversation with us. That was good, I suppose, meant we looked the part. But I couldn't shake the haunted look in their eyes. I'd seen people living under the Iron Lady's oppression, but this was completely different. We knew we were near, however, when we started to come across bodies. Men and women who had been strung up on trees or the sides of buildings with obvious signs of torture on their bodies. Some had writing in what I hoped was red paint, but it was probably not, spelling out a list of crimes the person had committed. The brutality on display paled in comparison to anything I'd seen with the Army of the Dawn. Clay was starting to believe the wild stories I'd spun about the Aztecos. Days 697 to 699. A large settlement had sprung up in Caborca, though entering it felt like we were traveling back in time a thousand years. The Aztecos had taken their whole Aztec theme to heart and leveled large parts of the old town only to rebuild it with slave labor in the style of the ancient Aztecs. There were even numerous stepped pyramids with more under construction and a particularly large one on the far end of town. It was impressive, in all the wrong ways. The town was surprisingly crowded though, which was good as it allowed us to blend in better. A year ago, the Iron Lady's spies had said this was a mere border outpost for the Aztecos. Clearly, things had dramatically changed. It didn't bode well for Farmbridge or even Arizona. If they were expanding this far west, it would be maybe a year before they reached the border and beyond. We bartered for lodging, handing over bullets and a few grenades we'd brought. Nobody was much interested in medical supplies, which somehow didn't surprise me. We kept Annie on a tight leash, literally for her own protection and to sell the illusion that she was our personal slave. It bought us just enough credibility that nobody seemed to bat much of an eye at our presence. Just two more wastelanders in the crowded, dirty, violent city. Seems that the Aztecos had adopted many of the old religious customs of the ancient Aztecs and human sacrifice was, by no surprise, a major theme. A bustling slave market had sprung up here and it turned my stomach to see men, women, and even children being bought and sold. Some would end up on the sacrificial altar at the large pyramid on the other end of town. Clay had seen about enough. He was convinced. The Aztecos were a clear and present danger to all of us, and none of us could overcome it alone. Day 700. We'd made plans across the gulf with to get out of Azteco territory into the other side. Against Annie's wishes though, I took the opportunity to scout the town on my own. This was a golden opportunity to try to get better intelligence on what we were dealing with. Few of the locals spoke up in exchange for some ammo and homemade liquor I'd traded for earlier. The Aztecos were indeed expanding, and a small contingent of their warriors were gathering to bring the territory north and west of the town under their control. A few of the old drug cartels were holding out, but were vastly outnumbered and would soon be extinct. Just more victims to be sacrificed to the Azteco gods. I should have been more alert. I didn't notice the figure sliding up behind me until it was too late, and the strong arm wrapped around my neck, dragging me into a darkened alley. I instinctively bit down on the arm and the man holding me let out a short yell, which I cut off by delivering an elbow straight to his gut. But before I could do anything else, a second man smashed me in the head with a wooden club, making me fall to the ground and see stars. He bent down and picked my head up, rubbing the paint off my face. Good, gringo. You have a lot of fight. You'll do well for me in the arena. Days 701 to 704. Night melted into day and then night again. Food was thrown at me in my cell, a rough stone and wood construction barely big enough to let me stand upright. Spent most of my time slumped on the ground, head in a daze. Along with the food came fistfuls of some sort of powder, clearly a powerful mind-affecting agent hurled at me in my cage. Despite my best efforts, I had no choice but to breathe it deep. 
After the second dose, I didn't even resist anymore. I ate, I waited, I breathed it in deep, mind spinning and reeling, vision distorted, turning the gawking faces outside my cage into horrible caricatures of humans. Then darkness came. A splash of ice cold water woke me. My mind was still reeling, but a little bit clearer now. Rough hands dragged me out of my cage and threw me onto a hard dirt floor. The sun was blinding, but soon numerous faces loomed over me, blocking out its light. Well, El Gringo didn't die. This one's tough, maybe he can fight. Look at those scars. This Gringo fights all right. Then there was a different voice, one with authority. My eyes searched for the source, but I still couldn't move my head or crane my neck to change my point of view. Let the Gringo sober up, then give him El Fuego. Tomorrow he fights. There was a crass indifference in the voice, and suddenly a new figure loomed over me. This one was tall, and unlike the faces around me which seemed adorned with various Aztec or tribal tattoos, face paint, and piercings, he looked relatively modern in a white suit and fedora. He leaned heavily on a cane as he looked down at me. If he can't fight, he dies. With a nod from him, hands grasped me, hauled me upright, and soon I was back in my cage. Day 705 to 708. I woke to cold water again. This time, my mind was clearer, but I could still feel a fog lurking somewhere deep inside. Once more, my cage was opened and I was dragged out into the morning sun. This time, my eyes adjusted rapidly. I was in a small holding area of some kind, surrounded by other cells like mine. Some were empty, others not. Some, I suspected, were just corpses now waiting to be removed. Strong hands gripped my arms and kept them pinned behind my back as I struggled to break free. Then an old man, looking like something straight out of an Aztec wall mural, started poking and prodding me. His old gnarled fingers pinched my muscles, opened my eyes, and craned my head down so he could look at him. Gringo is good, healthy, ready for fuego. I felt ropes being tied around my arms, trapping them behind my back, and then I was forced into a metal collar connected to a long pole, like something a dog catcher might use to move a dangerous canine. I grunted and fought, my strength returning to me, but no avail. Then suddenly the old man was before me again, his hand flinging a red powder directly at my face. Despite my best efforts, I breathed it in. Fire exploded in my throat and lungs, like eating a bunch of raw chilies and swallowing them down quickly. Then, a different fire lit up, this time in my brain. My vision went slightly cloudy and red tinged at the edges. I roared and flexed my arms, the ropes creaking a bit under the strain. The large Azteco holding my restraining device looked concerned for a second. I was push-dragged forward by the neck and into a small stone room. Then, pressing a button on the restraining device, my neck collar opened and the Azteco hurried out while a door was hastily shut behind him. I panted in pure rage, my body breaking out in a furious sweat. On the opposite side of the small stone room was a gate of some kind, built out of heavy wood. I could hear a rhythmic pounding on the other side, and I threw myself at the gate in anger. I could see in between kinks in the wood daylight on the other side. Then suddenly the gate was pulled upward, and I tumbled out into the bright daylight outside. Immediately the roar of a crowd greeted me, and I roared back like a feral creature. The noise of it all blended together, my mind reduced to a primal state and making no sense of the words they said or chanted. On the opposite side of a small sandy area, a larger, fancier gate made of iron was pulled up by a system of pulleys. Calmly strolling out of it was a tall, well-muscled Azteco man. He wore a traditional head garb and his face was painted in color to look like a jaguar. He wielded a large, flat obsidian blade in one hand and an animal hide shield in the other. He strolled out to greet the crowd, which exploded in renewed cheers as he bowed and put on a short display. I was completely unarmed, but that didn't matter. My drug-fueled brain was fueled by pure rage and adrenaline, and my body acted without thinking as I threw myself into a sprint straight at my opponent. To his credit, he quickly recovered from the shock of my sudden charge, then grinning settled into an easy fighting stance, blade held behind him and ready for either a thrust or a swing. My body was moving on its own, but my brain was still working, more efficiently than it had ever before. Cutting through the rage was strategy and plan. I'd seen this fighting style before from the Aztecos who attacked the Army of the Dawn. My brain told my body what was coming next, and my body responded in a combination of plan and instinct, combining my new knowledge with years of physical training and US Army hand-to-hand -hand combat. He swung his shield in front of him and thrust straight forward with the obsidian blade. With my right arm, I deflected the thrust upward causing the blade to slice my cheek open as the momentum carried me forward. Then, with my left arm, I delivered a bone-crunching punch straight into his exposed flank. From his short scream and the way his body contorted, I knew he'd either ruptured or bruised a kidney. With my momentum still carrying me past him, I was now behind him and I quickly wrapped my arms around his neck from behind, putting him into a chokehold. 
but my rage-powered mind forced my body to jerk upward and back rapidly, howling in fury as I lifted him off his feet. With a sudden twist accompanied by the pop of several vertebrae being pulled out of position, his neck ragdolled forward as I dropped his body. The crowd was silent for a moment, then burst out in screams and howls. Half were cheering for me, the other half screaming for my blood. I soaked it all in, the chaos and noise feeding the rage. The fuego made me strong, stronger and faster than I would normally be, and it made the killing easy. Days 709 to 711. The effect of the fuego lasted all day. I got moved to a different cage, this one larger and more comfortable with straw bedding. The man with the authoritative voice came to see me at some point. Time was still difficult to track with my drug-addled mind. See, you fight for me, you do good, you live good, keep fighting, keep doing good, you live better. He was dressed in his same spotless white suit and fedora, leaning on a walking stick with a large, clear crystal set at the pommel. You fight good, you make money. I make money, I reward you. Good food, women, men, whatever you like. I couldn't focus on his words, instead my hands ached to wrap themselves around his throat. He seemed to notice and took a half step back away from the bars of the cage. You make a lot of people angry killing the jaguar, but angry people means bigger crowd, more money from me. Here, token of my appreciation. He nodded to one of his men who tossed me a large piece of unidentified meat. The primeval brain pounced on it. It was well roasted and delicious. Days 712 to 716. I fought again. I must have won because I fought again two days later. I don't remember much, the drugs made my memory hazy. The first drug, the white powder, I got less and less often now. The red one, I'd get the day of the fight. They called it fuego, and with good reason, it was like having hot coal shoved into your belly and brain, turning you into a beast. I understood now how hordes of screaming Aztecos armed with axes and clubs could face an entire company of riflemen with little regard for their lives. I must have been doing a good job in the arena, because I was still alive. When I'd come down off the fuego, I'd find new wounds on my body, which were expertly stitched up. Say what you will about being a Thunderdome slave, at least the healthcare was free and top-notch. Days 717 to 720. I got moved to an even larger cage, one with separate cubbies, the equivalent of having your own private space. It wasn't much, but afforded a tiny bit of privacy, another reward. There were three other fighters in there, one that looked like he'd been through a shredder, his body was covered in scars and he had fresh cuts from a recent fight. He was also missing one of his eyes. The other was short, head wrapped with a large bloody bandage. He didn't last long. Hours after my arrival, he was dragged away. Sold for meat, said my third cellmate. That's what they do when you can't fight anymore. Take too bad a wound and not even good enough for entertaining slaughter fodder. You go off to the meat market, like El Ganado. He was a mountain of a man, dark skinned with thick Vato accent. He'd grown up north of the border, that was immediately obvious, but his tattoos made it clear he was or had been a cartel member, one of the cartels that got swallowed up by the bigger cartels after the world ended. POWs killed, enslaved, or in his case, sold, to fight or be meat. You can call me Vaccaro. I've seen you fight. You fight like a madman. That's why I speak to you. If you couldn't fight, I wouldn't care. Only the strong matter here, comprendes? I nodded my head, still thick with fog from the drugs. Drugs still got you all messed up in the head, eh, say? Don't worry, you get less of it now. White stuff is to make you ready for the fuego. Not everyone survives it, but you did. And you're here, so you're strong. That's good. If you're not strong, you die. El fuego? What is it? I could barely croak out the words. I felt like my tongue was swollen in my mouth after nearly a three-week bender. Who knows, S.A.? Make you fight good, though. Aztecos take it, they fight good. Some tribal crap from the deep jungles. You're not Azteco? Hell nah, homie, they jumped me and my crew. We were running around after it all went down, you know, just grabbing what we could, selling idiotas to the markets, wandering around with no protection. We were surviving, then a group of them found us. The rest didn't make it. Here I am, though. Vaccaro didn't die easy, Holmes. Not in the old world. Not in this crazy, messed up, upside down one. I could see the bullet wound scars on his chest from his old life, alongside new scars obviously gotten in this new one. Seems one life naturally evolved into the next, until the Aztecos found him. I was stuck a gladiator slave, and my new best friend was a raider. Days 721 to 725. Vaccaro ducked under the massive piece of chain threatening to take his head clean off. For such a big man, he was surprisingly fast. He got inside the other gladiator's swing and grabbed him by the shirt before delivering a bone-crunching headbutt to his nose. The heavy chain dropped from his limp hand as the gladiator briefly blacked out from the impact. I took the opportunity to rush up and snatch it, entangling the man's legs with it. Vaccaro and the gladiator were about evenly matched physically and I felt the impact of both of them hitting the ground. Then Vaccaro sort of stood up looking a bit confused. The gladiator had fallen straight onto a rock, hitting his head on it. 
He was dead before he even realized it. The crowd couldn't see that though, all they saw was victory and they erupted in cheers. The fuego was still coursing through my veins, but I'd started to learn to control it a little bit. I had just a bit more clarity than normal. That's how I spotted Clay and Annie in the stands, both looking down at me horrified. Days 726 to 734. We fought until it was only Vaquero and I left in the main cage. The fuego turned us into animals, but it took a day or two to recover. Then we were thrown back into the arena, our veins pulsing with liquid fire and our teeth gnashing for the taste of the ultraviolence and the blood. Days 735 to 739. You been quiet, Vato. Que pasa? I'd hardly touched my food, and without asking, Vaquero helped himself to it. We were getting prime cuts of meat now, even fresh fruit. Our rewards for our many victories, all making our owner, the man we called El Señor, richer. He'd even offered us women or men whatever we preferred. Vaquero had taken both. I declined. Seeing Annie's face had pushed aside some of the drug's effects and brought reality back to the forefront. What are we going to do, Vak? Fight here till we die? I got people out there that need me. The drugs, they made me forget. Vaquero signed as he played with half an orange that I'd left untouched. Claro que no. Listen, I've been waiting this whole time for a partner like you. We can escape, but it's not a one-man job. You mean you like me because I can fight? Vaquero laughed. Yeah, sure, Vato, but no, I mean smaller than me. Like you, you can fit. I cocked my eyebrow. Fit where? He had my attention. Looking past the gates of our holding pen to make sure the coast was clear, he motioned for me to follow him to his small cubicle-like private area. After one last check over his shoulder, he moved his blanket and bedding aside to show me a section of the iron bars he'd worked loose. See, I'm too big to squeeze through, and if I work on more of these, it's going to give me away, but if I move one more bar out of the way, you can go through. I was impressed. I'd seen Vaquero deliver some annihilating blows in the arena, but the strength it must have taken to bend these bars loose was immense. Eyeballing the opening he had created, I nodded my head in agreement. I have friends on the outside looking for me. If I can contact them, they can help. Good. Listen, next match we win, you say you want a girl. Then, when others leave, I know a guard. You give him the girl, and he'll bring your friends for a visit. Just don't say nothing stupid about escape in front of him. I nodded again. All we had to do was win one more time. I was pretty sure Annie would be at the next match again. Days 740 to 745. In Roman times, gladiator deaths were extremely uncommon. There was no profit in having slaves trained and fed for months or even years for them to just simply die. But in the Azteco lands, gladiators were expected to die. There was no mercy given, not even to the wounded. If you couldn't fight and survive the match, you went to the meat market. The fuego hit me like it always did, but I'd held my breath this time, only ingesting part of the drug. I needed some clarity if our plan was going to be a success. He did the same. The drug gave you a hell of a hangover, which explained why gladiators were so fearsome in the arena, but compliant in their pens. The drug made you photosensitive, which explains why the Aztecos preferred to fight at night. My eyes struggled to adjust as the gate opened and we stepped out onto the sandy floor. Vaquero and I fought as a duo now, and we made a lot of teams upset by killing their best gladiators. The crowd loved their heroes, but the thrill of seeing a hero fall in a shower of their own blood was even better. They were getting bored of us. They wanted to see us die. The opposing gate opened and out walked four men. As my eyes slowly adjusted to the light, a stunning realization hit me, even through the rage-inducing haze of the fuego in my veins. Twenty-five yards across from me, holding a makeshift spear and looking as if he'd been surviving in the arena for a few weeks himself, was Robert, my mentor from my time with the Army of the Dawn. If I had received a full dose, I doubted I would have recognized him. An announcer signaled the customary start to the battle and the crowd immediately roared with anticipation and excitement. The four men charged at a fast trot. I recognized the drug-induced stupor they were in, and I knew that calling out to Robert would be pointless. Even if he heard me over the thundering crowd, he'd never recognize me with the fuego burning in his brain. Vaquero and I fought back to back, the same style we'd used many matches before, but this was the first time we were trying to fend off twice our number. Another fighter thrusted with his spear, and I deflected it with a small buckler I wore on my left arm, making sure to knock the spear point high so it wouldn't stab Vaquero behind me. Then I immediately spun and stepped into the attacker to finish him off with a large knife. Behind me, Vaquero was wielding a large sledgehammer that had become his signature weapon. It required a lot of room to swing, which meant I had to be careful and not stand too close behind him. But any attempt to block a blow from that hammer would mean a crushed shield and a shattered arm. He wielded the heavy weapon with surprising deftness, swinging over the head of one attacker and burying it in the chest of the man next to him. Bones splintered and crunched, and the man coughed up blood. It was a death blow, and Vaquero ignored him as the man dropped to his knees, focusing on the first attacker. Fire exploded across my back and ribs as I barely managed to shimmy away from my own second gladiator's attack. 
My brain had responded in instinct to the incoming blow, and only now I realized it was Robert. He was wielding a two-handed cesty with jagged wooden spikes coming out of the knuckles. One was covered in my blood. Robert, I called out to him, hoping he'd hear me at close range. If he did, he didn't acknowledge. His eyes showed no recognition. Robert, it's me! I tried again, but I knew it was pointless. The fuego had him. His mind, body, and soul craved, no, needed violence. He roared and threw himself at me as I barely managed to jump out of the way in time. I could feel the rage inside me growing. The fuego I did consume was making rationality difficult. Damn this fool, why was he here? How did he get caught? Why wasn't he listening? I wanted to tear off his head for being so stupid, for making me fight him. I roared my own challenge and lashed out at him with my knife. He blocked it with a cestus and managed to get my blade entangled in his wooden claws, twisting sharply and making me drop the blade. I didn't hesitate though and lashed out with my metal buckler, catching him on the side of the head. At the same time though, he thrust out with his other cestus and raked my ribs, narrowly avoiding impaling several of the wooden claws deep in my chest cavity. The blow to the head dazed him though and he stumbled backwards. I growled like a leopard and threw myself at him, tackling him to the ground. My hands wrapped around his throat as he tried to bite at me, his teeth snapping like some feral animal. Then the fog faded slightly, the weakened effect of the fuego not powerful enough to fully turn me into a murderous madman. Robert had not just shown me how to survive in the army of the dawn, he'd become something close to a friend. He was a genuinely good man caught up in a bad world forced to fight for a dictator in order to keep his family safe. I'd thought him a coward at first, but the more he told me about them, the more I saw the love in his eyes, the more I understood. Understood because I too had done terrible things to keep my family safe. Cutting through the fuego like a searing blade came their faces, Annie, Lily, Robbie, Meg, Lucky, and Alexis. Robert roared with a mighty throw and pushed me off him, sending me tumbling. He sprang to his feet and recovered one of his cestuses crouched like a jungle cat before leaping forward, sharp wooden claws aimed straight at my heart. Then came a dull, sickening crunch as Vaquero's sledgehammer buried itself on top of his skull, ending his leap through the air prematurely as he ragdolled to the floor. I was panting, nearly out of breath, a terrible feeling welling up in the deepest part of my stomach. The fuego was nearly out of my system. I'd been sobered up in seconds. The crowd exploded into roars of approval or outrage. Vaquero laughed and hoisted me up, pumping his fist in the air as he returned the crowd's shouts and screams. There in the faces of the crowd, I saw Annie and Clay next to her again. We locked eyes for a moment, long enough for me to mouth the word, wait. Days 746 to 749. The guard we bribed with my reward was true to his word, and the next night he brought Annie and Clay over. Annie's face was normally set in stone, but her mask slipped for just a moment as she locked eyes with me for a second in my cage. Pity, compassion, anger, but also revulsion? She had watched me in several fights now. She held my hand as we talked in hushed whispers through the bars, though I couldn't help but notice her hesitation. You look… are you okay? Yeah, they give us this drug. Makes us… never mind. No time to explain. I told Annie about the loose bars. Her and Clay nodded solemnly as I explained our plan and the part they'd have to play. I didn't know if I could really count on Clay, but I guess the fact that he had stuck around this long counted for something. Then again, I doubt Annie would have let him leave me behind. Hey man, as soon as we realized you were alive, there was no way I was leaving with you in that arena. It was as if he'd read my mind. I looked at Clay's face, searching it. I found honesty there. I'd only recently got to know him. He was a representative from the group of veterans whose weapons and supplies Farmbridge and the allied communities desperately needed to remain independent from the Iron Lady or fight off the Aztecos. You should have left me, both of you. Getting word back to your people was more important than me. Annie shook her head. Just shut up, okay? We sent a messenger. Even here, people can be reliable for the right price. I noticed then that Annie was missing her favorite rifle. I don't think I'd ever seen her sleep without it at her side. The guard was coming back, telling us in a loud whisper that we had to wrap it up. Annie squeezed my hand tightly. There was just a series of looks again. Pity, compassion, anger, and revulsion. Stay alive, okay? Just a few more days. We'll be waiting. Days 750 to 754. We were waiting for the new moon, when the night would be darkest. Until then, Vaquero and I had to fight one more time. I fully inhaled the fuego. Truth was, it made it easier to do what we had to do in the arena, and I was terrified of finding another familiar face. Maybe this time it would be Clay's or Annie's, or I held onto Alexis's face in my mind as long as I could, until the fuego hit my veins and ripped it away from me, replacing it all with a red-hot fury. Days 755 to 758. 
Fights were temporarily suspended when the weather got bad enough that nobody would come out to watch them. The rain that fell was ice cold and irradiated. Nobody wanted to expose themselves more than they had to. Vicaro and I sheltered in the driest corner of our cell, staying away from the poison rainfall. It was lucky rain though, the arena was more determined than ever to kill us too. We'd overstayed our welcome as arena champions, the crowd was getting bored, another fight or two and the odds would finally be too great for us. We both bore the scars of our battles, despite getting surprisingly good medical treatment. As long as we were profitable, we were worth the investment. Days 759 to 763. The Aztecos celebrated the various phases of the moon, but they were superstitious about the new moon. They tended to stay shut up indoors during the new moon, not staying out late if they could help it. This made it the perfect night for our escape. I shimmied through the bars Vaquero had loosened. There were two guards in the small hut where the keys to the cells were kept, but after doing their nightly check of all the cages and cells, they typically would either doze off or play cards to kill time. It was harder work not being detected by the other slaves and gladiators than it was to sneak up on those two. I could have probably reached in through the small window and grabbed the keys without them realizing it, but that wasn't the plan. They had to die so the rest of the plan would work. Once I had the keys, I rushed back to our cage and unlocked it, letting Vaquero out. Now the time for being quiet was over, I moved to the cage next to ours and undid their lock, waking the gladiators up from their sleep and telling them they were free. I did the same for the rest of the cells and cages, letting loose a few dozen former slaves. Most of them wanted revenge and they armed themselves with whatever they could grab, making their way to El Senor's home. I could already hear the shout of the guards and the screaming by the time Vaquero and I left the compound to meet up with Annie and Clay. They had clothes waiting for us, and Clay had a pair of pliers that he could use to work the metal-studded collars marking us as slaves loose. The town was slowly coming to life as people rushed out to see what the commotion was all about, then called for the guards. There'd be a slaughter, with a small army of over three dozen former gladiators let loose, both sides killing each other. Our small group stuck to the shadows and back alleys acting like fleeing civilians. But before we made it across to the safety of the wilderness on the other side of town, I stopped. I hated this place, I hated the Aztecos and everything they stood for. The Iron Lady was brutal, but she brought order out of the chaos. The Aztecos were the chaos. I grabbed a large iron brazier and dragged it over next to a house. Vato, what you doing? Let's go! I ignored the group and kept dragging the huge brazier, finally knocking it over and spilling red-hot coals onto the side of one of the wood and plaster homes. The home went up in a flash. Within a minute, the fire was already spreading to the next home. This entire town would burn. I watched the blaze for a few more moments before letting Vaquero drag me away. Days 764 to 769. If anyone was pursuing us, we didn't notice, but we still moved cautiously trying to travel mostly at night. More inclement weather rolled in and we were forced to take shelter from a rainstorm for a few days. With luck though, we'd soon be on the other side of the Gulf of California. I'd only hoped the boat we hidden over two months ago was still there and in good condition. Days 770 to 774. Some of the gladiators we liberated must have been captured, and they must have said who set them free. No doubt after thorough torture or at least the threat of it. Small groups of Aztecos were prowling the roads. On our way we'd spotted one or two at most. Vaquero and I had made a name for ourselves in the local region though, and there were probably few locals who hadn't shown up to see us fight. We had to evade as best we could. We only had one rifle and two handguns between the four of us. I ached to grab an Azteco by the throat with my bare hands though, a surprising if brief lust for violence erupting whenever we spotted one of their warbands. I chalked it up to the after effects of months of being forced to ingest the Fuego drug. We finally made it to the boat, and were surprised to find it in good shape, still tied up to the small cove we hidden it in. With Vaquero's huge mass though, I felt certain the tiny boat would flip. But with some careful navigation we managed to cross the Gulf of California, landing not too far from the small village that had hosted us before we crossed our way into the Azteco Hell. Days 775 to 779. The village had been razed to the ground. There were still bones and unidentified remains with bits of cloth the scavengers hadn't yet eaten. Annie, Clay and I stared in horror. Vicaro seemed unfazed. Of course, he hadn't known these people, experienced their kindness, and then sentenced them to death thinking we were doing the right thing by protecting them from bandits. This was outside of any organized territory, and a local gang had put this village under their thumb. When they couldn't pay what the bandits wanted in taxes, they'd taken two of the young girls for themselves. That's when I stepped out of my hiding place, shooting the men dead. I could still hear the old woman's mournful warning in my ears. The rest of the gang would be back. We'd sentence them to death. I guess they thought they'd run away or… I don't know. We made camp inside one of the mostly intact abodes. Annie and I sat outside watching the stars. I'm tired, Annie. She was silent a few moments before speaking. I know. Remember Mr. Vasquez? She seemed surprised for a moment. I didn't blame her. That was an entire lifetime ago. 
I promised him we'd go back and properly bury his wife. Annie was silent. Instead of words, she reached out and grabbed my hand, giving it a firm squeeze. I'm glad neither of them lived to see all this. Somewhere far to the east, where we'd just come from, there was lightning flashing. I held my gaze on it, and Annie kept her silence. Days 780 to 785. Maybe now that we were out of Azteco territory, none of us feared running into whoever was roaming the northwest Mexican wastes. Maybe we were all eager to finally get back to friendly faces. Whatever the reason, we made record time, pushing ourselves as hard as we could. The old US-Mexico border was only a few miles away now. We made camp again before crossing. Annie and Clay dozed while Vaquero and I stood watch. A strange bond had developed between us. I wouldn't say friendship, but a kinship of sorts. But would that last outside the life and death threat of the arena? What are you going to do when we get north? Vaquero seemed to think for a moment, gazing out at the nighttime desert. Do what I can with the time I got, I guess. Rob, raid, steal, whatever I gotta do to live best until I bite it. Farmbridge and other communities, they're not really like that. They have order and… Yeah, yeah, order and rules and laws, I know, Vato. Like the old world, right? That ain't no place for me. What am I gonna do, start farming? There's a place for you. You're good in a fight. We need people like that. You know what's out there better than most. Yeah, I do, Vato. That's why I'm getting the hell away from it. I'll go north, find somewhere outside your farm place or whatever. Do my thing. I didn't doubt he would and I didn't doubt he'd be good at it either. That's what worried me. And you, I say, what you gonna do with your little time you got left? He must have seen the surprise on my face. Why, don't tell me you don't know. Know what? The fuego, Vato. You use it enough, it gets in you, in your brain. Rots it up from the inside. You know how you turn into a monster when you get high? I nodded. It's like that, but all the time. They call them zombies, you know, like in the movie. I didn't answer. I couldn't answer. I'd felt the lingering effects of the fuego, wishing I could just wrap my hands around every Azteco patrol we'd seen while hiding, but I thought it was just aftershocks, my body detoxing from the drug. Months, years, who knows? But everybody that gets dosed like we got dosed turns zombie, they say. Everybody. Why do you think Azteco's so fucking crazy at war? Vaquero laughed and tapped the side of his head. You're ticking time bomb now, Vato. I nodded slowly. My thoughts turned to Farmbridge, then Christina. No, past her to Alexis, Annie, Lily, Robbie, Meg, Lucky, my family. Then I thought about Vaquero. He'd go north, he said, do what he did best, and I knew he'd be good at it. And when he fell to the fuego, who knows what horrors he'd unleash. He never even heard the gunshot that sent a 45 caliber slug through the back of his brainstem and out the front of his throat. He never felt a moment of pain. He just fell over on his side, instantly dead, the same knowing smile still frozen on his lips. Annie and Clay rushed out of their sleeping bags, both reaching for their weapons. I knew him in the arena. He had no place amongst us. He was a monster. Through and through. Nothing could ever change that. Clay slowly nodded. Annie's eyes never left mine. Day 786 to 792. It took us nearly a week to cross the border and make it to the outskirts of the fertile fields that surrounded Farmbridge. It seemed like they'd expanded, and we were surprised to be greeted by a patrol in a desert paint Humvee. A big upgrade from horses. The patrol knew who we were instantly, and it was a relief to dump our travel gear in the back of the Humvee and enjoy a cramped but quick ride to Farmbridge. I'd forgotten what a luxury motorized travel was. The patrol had a radio, and by the time we pulled up to the main gates, there was a small crowd waiting to greet us. There were some of Clay's people mixed in with them, but my eyes were on the five figures rushing out toward us. Lily practically threw herself into my arms at the same time as Lucky reached me, practically knocking me over. Then she took a step back and in her own awkward way giggled as she traced the pattern of the new scar on my cheek over her own. Cool scar. Lily then turned her attention to Annie, just as Robbie and Meg both reached me. The brother and sister duo hugged me simultaneously and also threatened to knock me over. Lucky happily jumped and ran laps around us, barking the entire time. Finally, Christina approached. She didn't throw herself into a hug the way others had. I could see it in her eyes. I'd turned her into a killer. That had worn on her. Plus, she left me once before the end of the world. Those issues must have still been unresolved. It was okay, though. We gave each other a quick hug and I moved past her. Alexis was there at the edge of the milling crowd. There were tears pooling in her eyes and I could see the strain on her face from trying to hold them in. I pushed my way to her and hesitated for just a moment before throwing my arms around her. Days 793 to 795. Lucky hadn't left my side since I'd been back. Every time I stood up, he got up too, almost like he was afraid if he didn't stick right by me, I'd leave again. Ruslana was away on a diplomatic mission, but would be back soon. Until then, it was nice to just have the family together again. We laughed and joked together, and for two precious days, I completely forgot about the world. I was only reminded when I took my shirt off. Alexis gasped each time, looking at my bevy of fresh scars from my months in the arena. I didn't tell her details, and I didn't tell her about the fuego. But it was there. 
deep in my brain just like Vaccaro had said. I could feel the burn of it in the quietest parts of the night as I struggled to fall back asleep. Alexis with one arm over my chest and Lucky curled up on the other side. It was like both were trying to hem me in, keep me from disappearing again. Days 796 to 799. Annie's messenger had gotten word to Farmbridge about our predicament, and his testimony had convinced some of Clay's people that the Azteco threat was real. A group of them had come to Farmbridge to wait for his return, and were only days away from going south themselves in a rescue attempt if we hadn't shown up when we did. The community had grown considerably, and Farmbridge along with half a dozen other smaller settlements including Big Bear had formed a coalition. They were calling it the California Republic, and news had spread north. Representatives from other communities were expected to arrive soon. The shattered remains of Southern California blasted by nuclear war, and apparently forgotten by the US government if it even existed anymore, were pulling themselves together to fight both the Azteco and Army of Dawn threat. But it was more than that, it was a set of shared values, a desire for re-civilization of humanity under the same liberal democratic values of the old world, a rejection of both Azteco anarchy and the Iron Lady's tyranny. It gave me hope, I guess. Farmbridge had power thanks to a rough power station they'd built, fueled by real gasoline. California still held a significant reserve of the stuff, and the Republic's engineers had pooled their talents and resources to resuscitate the petroleum industry. It was a small start. Gas was highly rationed, but it meant the Republic could generate electricity and fuel combat vehicles again. Lily showed me photos of Big Bear she'd taken on a battery-powered digital camera they found up there. It was of a small group of homes in a cul-de-sac. It was our place, she said, where we could all live together as neighbors. She pointed out her and Annie's home, Robbie and Meg's, and of course Alexis and I. It made me smile. It was a really nice fantasy. Day 800 You could see the dust from the large motorcade long before you heard it. A long line of vehicles, some I recognized as belonging to Clay's people, our people now I guess. They'd sent a large detachment after Clay had contacted them over the radio. Another perk of civilization's slow return to the wastes. At the rear of the formation was a US Army striker, and as it came into view my blood ran cold. It bore the emblem of the Army of Dawn, in what seemed like pretty fresh paint. As the convoy rolled inside the gates, Ruslana stepped out of the lead vehicle and Clay hurried to greet his people. But my eyes were locked on that striker, and the familiar figure that ducked out of the rear ramp and carefully, slowly took in Farmbridge in its entirety. Then the Iron Lady's eyes locked on me. The heads of every major settlement in the burgeoning California Republic were assembled in Farmbridge, along with the Iron Lady herself. The wolf was inside the chicken coop, only these chickens had become incredibly well-armed over the last few months. I watched her closely as the most important congress of this new young government was called the session. In turn, she eyeballed each representative just as closely, scrutinizing every detail about them and the people they represented. She was taking stock, making mental calculations about each representative and plotting, always plotting. The old military intelligence veteran's mind was always at work, and I had a good idea of the conclusion she was coming up with. Yes, she could take this small republic with her forces, but the cost would be dear. Not to mention she currently had bigger problems to worry about, or she wouldn't be here with nothing but a small security escort. She'd be here with an army. Ruslana had become the de facto leader of this small government, though only symbolically. Technically, there was no leader. Everything was put to a vote, but many of the representatives looked to her for guidance. I wonder if during her time on the battlefields of Ukraine, she'd ever imagined she'd end up leading a group of American nuclear survivors in sunny SoCal, of all people, of all places. Well, SoCal wasn't quite as sunny after global nuclear war, but we fared much better than most places from what rumors reached us. Turning to the Iron Lady, she nodded grimly, inviting her to rise and speak. I felt Alexis tighten her grip on my hand as we sat watching the assemblage, her feelings toward the Iron Lady clearly written on her face and mirrored by Ruslana. As the Iron Lady approached, there was the briefest of pauses as both took the other in, predators sizing each other up. These two hardened war veterans were the most powerful figures for thousands of miles, maybe the most powerful left in the United States, and neither would give the other so much as an inch if they could help it. But desperate times make for strange bedfellows. Eben the Iron Lady addressed the not-too-friendly crowd. I won't waste time on pleasantries that all of us know won't be well received. So let me get straight to the point. A great enemy gathers to the east. We've been fighting them for many months now and we're losing. We need your help. And if you don't help us, then they'll come for you once we're gone." There was an immediate explosion of reactions. Somebody shouted, "'Let them break themselves on you, and we'll mop up the rest when they come for us!' The outburst got a bit of an applause and a lot of murmurs of agreement. 
The Iron Lady didn't flinch, instead immediately took several steps toward the speaker, unnerving him and causing him to stumble backwards. Yes, they'll wipe us out, break themselves like you said, but they'll simply call for reinforcements and while they wait they'll rebuild off our survivors, the men, women and children they enslave, turn them into mindless fighting abominations. But you don't have to take it from me. Eben spun on her heel to stare directly at me. Tell them. I was stunned. Did she know? Impossible. The only person who knew about my exposure to the fuego and the inevitable effects were Vaquero, and he was dead. Tell them what you saw south of the border. I was relieved. She didn't know. I cleared my throat and stood. She's right. There's thousands of them. Just a hundred miles south of here. More past that. They expand like locusts, tearing settlements apart and indoctrinating anyone they don't kill, eat, or worse. There was an explosion of conversations once again. I caught sight of Clay. He was seated with his people. You could tell them apart by the crisp military fatigues they wore everywhere and the sidearms that never left their side. He returned my look, a somber look on his face. If any of us are going to survive, we need to work together, period. The Iron Lady didn't bother with an epilogue. She simply spun on her heel and walked out of the meeting hall, leaving a frenzy of conversation behind. Days 804 to 807. I testified my experiences south of the border at least a dozen times. It sounded outlandish, but if it wasn't for Clay and Annie's corroboration, I doubt anyone would have believed our story. But I was getting frustrated. While they debated what to do about the Azteco threat, the enemy only grew stronger. Evan was right, we needed to join forces. The question was, what happened after that? I wasn't foolish enough to believe the Iron Lady's ambitions to take SoCal for herself had disappeared. As the representatives debated and argued amongst themselves, I got to spend time with the family. Robbie and his sister had helped build a makeshift soccer field, and one of the workshops even fashioned regulation-sized goals out of scrap metal. It was the apocalypse, every major city on Earth burnt to ash, but under the perpetual gray clouds of nuclear winter and surrounded by Alexis, Lucky, Annie, Lilith, Robbie, and Meg, things felt… okay. I thought back to that little cul-de-sac Lilith had shown me from the photograph in Big Bear. One house for each of us, so we could each live near each other like that strange little family we'd become since the world ended. We could go there. Once the Azteco threat was eliminated and the Iron Lady was sorted out, it was a nice thought. But then I remembered the fuego burning in my brain. It eventually consumed me. Vaquero had warned me. Just a matter of time. Days 808 to 812. Ruslana held a private meeting with the representatives from the most powerful settlements. Each settlement got to vote, but the number of votes they could cast was dependent on their population size. I foresaw problems with this system in the future, but for now it worked. I'd spent months with the Iron Lady, months south of the border with the Aztecos. They asked me just one question. Could the Republic stand alone against this threat? No, I told them. The Iron Lady was right. We needed each other. Each member nodded in solemn agreement. That night the votes were cast. The California Republic would go to war alongside the forces of the Army of the Dawn. Days 813 to 816. Messengers were dispatched. Preparations had to be made. The Republic's first call to war would take time to organize. Logistics had to be organized. But the firepower it would bring to bear was considerable given our size. Over a thousand fighting men and women. Many were already trained. All would undergo a four-month training program before marching east. The Iron Lady was unhappy about this. But Ruslana refused to budge. She wouldn't send her people to pointless slaughter. The Army of the Dawn would just have to buy time with blood. I suspected this wasn't just about preparing our forces though. I think Ruslana was literally bleeding the army so as to weaken them. I'm confident that the Iron Lady suspected the same. Reluctantly, she agreed. But there was one problem. We're running dangerously low on ammunition for the Strikers and Bradleys we've managed to recover. They're absolutely the only thing holding the line for now. We won't have enough for four months of fighting. We need resupply, now. All eyes turned to Clay and Johnson, the senior commander of his encampment. The old Special Forces vet shook his head immediately. We got nothing to spare. US Army rounded up most of the hardware before the bombs fell. God knows where it's all at now. We got a few strikers ourselves, some up-armored Humvees with 50 cals and Mark 19s, but not nearly enough ammo to spare. We barely have enough for one large engagement ourselves, less if the enemy also has vehicles. Then you'd better give us what you got if you expect us to hold for four months. And leave ourselves defenseless? That's an absolute negative, ma'am. The two were probably close in age. I wonder if they might have worked together in the past without knowing it. The special forces and intelligence community overlapped frequently. I still had no idea what exactly the Iron Lady did back in the old world military, but from what I'd seen of her, it was definitely something that would have involved black operations. There's an alternative. Ruslana broke the impasse, physically stepping between the two old soldiers. A settlement north of Vegas. 
They set up shop at Indian Springs after the military abandoned it. Traders tell us they're well stocked. Army and Air Force both left this significant stockpile behind. Problem is, they're hostile to everyone but their own people. Then we'll have to impress upon them the threat we all face, and that it's in their best interest to cooperate. It worked once. Eben looked directly at Johnson. How in the hell did she know about that? As always, the Iron Lady was well informed. Her eyes and ears everywhere. When I say they're hostile to everyone but their own, I mean they shoot anyone who gets too close. We sent envoys. Only one made it back alive. She spat out the latter with fierce anger. Then we take what they have by force. A joint operation, something to cement our newfound alliance, and give us a chance to gain experience operating together. I expected Ruslana to immediately reject the idea. She didn't. Next to me, Alexis immediately stood, her balled up fists shaking in indignation. Absolutely not! That's not who we are! The Iron Lady let a small smile break her typically inscrutable mask. So idealistic. If only the world was powered by rainbows and puppy dogs. She looked down at Lucky seated on my other side. Lucky's ears flattened and he bared his teeth. Ruslana sighed, a deep, soul-weary sigh. The type of sigh provoked by having the weight of a thousand souls upon your shoulders. Alexis, I… you were right about Johnson and his people. I never told you that and I should have listened to you. But this is different. These people won't negotiate. They're not interested in it. Then we should leave them alone, like, like they want. Find another way. The Iron Lady took a step toward Alexis. Unlike the loudmouth representative earlier, she didn't flinch. There's no other way. You've heard the stories firsthand. The man you love lived with them personally. It's time to ask yourself, what would you do to keep those same horrors from visiting everyone else you love? She shook her head. Not murder and plunder for what we want, what we think we need. Alexis turned to Ruslana. Then we're no better than them, or her. The last thing she said, nodding dismissively at the Iron Lady. Ruslana looked away. It was clear her mind was already made up. Alexis looked at me in desperation, her eyes begging me to speak up. The Iron Lady was right. Her stone-cold calculations were always right. But so was Alexis. We couldn't build a new society on the bones of everyone who stood in our way. Not if we expected it to last. We couldn't keep compromising, pretending it was all for the greater good. But the Iron Lady's forces wouldn't last without resupply. And if they broke before we were prepared, we wouldn't last either. I was tired, exhausted. And somewhere deep inside my brain, I could feel the familiar, angry burn of the fuego. I… she's right. Alexis is right. We can't keep pretending it's always about the greater good. We've trampled plenty of lesser goods into the mud already. We have to find another way. Ruslana shook her head. I'm sorry, there is no other way. Not this time. Time is too short. Alexis's face hardened. I could tell she wanted to cry, not in pain or weakness, but sheer frustration. She didn't let a single tear betray her, though. The Iron Lady seemed pleased. You aren't concerned with political pushback on this one? Ruslana shook her head again. No, this is far outside the borders of the Republic. And besides, Republic forces aren't taking it. You are. With all our intelligence, ammunition, and whatever other supplies you need. For the first time since I'd known her, Evan looked stunned. She quickly recomposed herself, though. Both leaders eyed each other closely. Both knew there was no give in either. The Iron Lady didn't even bother trying to budge her. Fine, you get to keep your hands clean in front of your little Republic. We'll do the heavy lifting. But you give us every scrap of intelligence you have and every bullet we need. Food and water, too. Ruslana nodded in agreement. And one more thing. I want him for this campaign. The Iron Lady's finger pointed squarely at my chest. I was incredulous. Wait, what? You come with me or no deal? I consolidate my forces around Havasu. Good, defensible ground there. Leave a wide open corridor straight into California. As usual, the Iron Lady had me by the balls. Days 817 to 820. Why the hell are you dragging me into this? I was furious. It had taken a day to get a chance to talk to Eben alone. How about you unball your fists so we can talk like adults? I hadn't even noticed my balled up fists. I was furious. The fuego screamed for violence in my brain. What do you want from me? The Iron Lady took her time answering. She had guest quarters near the main gates to Farmbridge, the most well-protected part of the town. That wasn't an accident. There's going to be some very difficult times ahead for all of us. I need someone from the Republic. Her disdain was clear as she spat out the name. With a level head, I need someone reliable to see the price being paid in blood. Someone to remind everyone back here the real cost of their tiny little lives. I'm doing this for the people I care about. I don't want this anymore, any of it. So said every brave soul forced to do hard things in tough times. Eben patted my shoulder matronly before sitting back down at her desk to go over the missives. Messengers from her territory arrived daily bringing news on domestic issues and more importantly, the war. I ran into Robert down there. I, there was nothing I could do for him. The Iron Lady stopped her reading and nodded grimly. How bad is it? She was quiet again for a moment before responding. Bad. If we don't get resupply for our heavy vehicles, it's over. 
for all of us. Days 821 to 823, we had a bit of time before I'd had to leave, or rather before we left. Alexis had told the group Lilith, Annie, and Wilson had refused to stay behind. I fought back, but they'd all dug in their heels. They were done splitting up, they said. I was secretly relieved. Days 824 to 827. Watson had been unusually quiet lately. Unusual even for a man of such legendarily few words. Then, one evening he simply approached our group as we sat lazily by the fire, enjoying a rare break in the clouds to see the stars above. Claire and I are getting married. You should all come. For a moment, no one spoke. Then suddenly Lilith jumped up shouting for joy, grabbing Watson's hands and jumping up and down next to him. Watson looked like he wouldn't mind a raider bullet in his skull right about then as Lilith threw her arms around him in a fierce hug, never once stopping her excited jumping. Lucky picked up on the infectious and spontaneous joy and began to bark, jumping circles around both. Finally, Watson broke free, only to be greeted by a much more reserved hug from Alexis along with a kiss on the cheek. Congratulations, Watson. I'm really happy for you two. Watson blushed and blustered as Lilith practically dragged him down to take a seat around the fire, excitedly going over every detail of the ceremony to come. I felt sorry for the poor mountain man. He wanted nothing more than a small, quiet affair with Lilith and was having absolutely none of that. His eyes pleaded for rescue, but this time, he was on his own. Days 828 to 834. Marriage. I think we all forgot that there was more to life than fighting and scratching to survive for one more day. There was romance, love, and wedding ceremonies. None of us had the first clue about properly marrying people. There were some priests amongst the survivors, but none had ever actually done the ceremony. That didn't stop Lilith, who excitedly took it upon herself to be the wedding planner, coordinator, and officiant all at once. Her excited ambitions were only halted by Annie popping her own question, and then suddenly there were two weddings to plan for, and as a bride, Lilith would be officiating for neither. The whole community came together for the double wedding event. One half of the center of attention, Watson once more looked like he was about ready for a raider bullet, but he couldn't hide the joy it brought him to see Clara thoroughly enjoying the entire affair. The other couple, Lilith and Annie, were almost a perfect mirror. Nothing terrified Annie more than being the center of attention of the entire settlement, while Lilith positively drunk in enough attention for both wedding parties. There were no rings, nobody had bothered to scavenge jewelry, which was now worthless. There was also no bridal dresses, much for the same reason and no doubt much to great relief of Annie. But there was music and dancing, albeit reluctantly from both Annie and Watson, and a great feast. This was more, far more than just a wedding celebration. It was a celebration of life, a reclaiming of what we'd lost. Alana was now technically Watson's stepdaughter, and I could see genuine love and care in Watson's eyes every time he looked at her. Once more, I thought about the daughter he must have had at some point in time, and lost, either before or after the bombs. It was clear from the way he treated Alana that he'd been a father, but I never pried. Neither did anyone else. I shook those sad thoughts away, though, and enjoyed myself. Alexis by my side and Lucky happily zipping through the crowd, collecting treats and pets from everyone attending until by the end of the night, he was so fat he could barely waddle. It was a good time, a genuinely happy time, but as I caught sight of the Iron Lady watching us from the shadows, I couldn't help but think that this was the calm before a terrible, terrible storm. Days 835 to 840. It was time to move out. A detachment of the Iron Lady's forces would meet us north of Vegas. The city had been absolutely glassed. U.S. nuclear defenses had focused on the west and the east coasts and Las Vegas took multiple direct hits. The fact that it was home to Nellis Air Force Base had ensured its total annihilation. Some Republic soldiers would escort us in trucks all the way to the edge of our territory. Then we were on our own. The Iron Lady strikers would provide security for the supply trucks from Farmbridge destined for her assault forces in Havasu. So we'd be on foot once we reached the edge of the Republic. Once supplied, her forces would march off north where we'd link up with them just past Vegas. I watched Watson, Lilith, Annie, and Alexis load up into a truck. Lucky was at my feet, looking pleadingly up at me. Sorry, buddy. Not this time. I'll be back, I pro. I hesitated. I'll be back. I turned to Robbie and Meg, giving them both a final farewell hug. If we don't come back, you both take Lucky and go north, understand? Robbie nodded grimly. I turned toward the waiting trucks, rifle on my shoulder and backpack full of supplies. Hey, wait! Robbie came running up. I wanted to thank you for trusting me. After, you know, you gave me a chance. You didn't have to. You basically saved me and Meg's lives. I nodded and clasped him on the shoulder. The trucks roared to life. I didn't want to go. I especially didn't want everyone coming with me. Days 841 to 845. 
The going was slow, even with the trucks. The highways were still largely littered with broken, burned-out husks of vehicles. SoCal was notorious for fires, and with no one to put them out, they'd rage through the freeways and surrounding countryside. Only the desert was spared. The settlements had managed to carve out some clear lanes to make trade easier, but there was no settlement in the direction we were traveling in. Once we entered the Iron Lady's territory, we were on foot. At least we didn't have to worry about raiders. Nobody was stupid enough to defy the Iron Lady's strict laws, and her authority hadn't waned an inch in her absence. The entire thing still left a bad taste in my mouth. We were going to war with a people we had no conflict with other than they happened to have something we desperately needed and they didn't want to give up. Days 846 to 850. Highway 15 led straight to Vegas, and we decided to follow it so as to not get lost in the desert. This stretch of highway was technically outside of the Iron Lady's borders, but her patrols routinely swept the area, looking for rivals to put down and travelers to capture. After the first year, nobody came this way anymore. No point. Vegas was glassed. The Hoover Dam partially collapsed, and plumes of fallout had killed everyone in the small communities between Los Angeles and Vegas. Every dozen miles or so, we'd pass another small town full of corpses, their bones picked clean by scavengers and any useful belongings long ago stripped away by survivors. Days 851 to 856. We'd just climbed the San Bernardino Mountains and I was glad to put them behind us. Even on the highway, the going was tough, and the weather dropped to freezing near the top. I remember making the drive from LA to Vegas many times, and it never took more than three and a half, maybe four hours. It'd taken us a day and a half to get over the mountains. I was stoking a small fire when I noticed the Iron Lady approaching. She nodded over at his stump next to me. Mind if I join you? We hadn't had any time alone since we left. I didn't really want any either, but I shrugged my shoulders. Alexis, Annie, and Lilith were cleaning off best they could in the small spring nearby. A Geiger counter let them know the water was acceptably safe. Nobody went anywhere without a counter anymore. We were silent for a long while. Eben helped feed the flames to grow the fire. How's your back? I actually hadn't noticed it until she reminded me of the lashing she'd ordered as punishment for my disobeying her direct order in the midst of combat. I'd saved her and a lot of other people's lives, but I disobeyed nonetheless. When you're holding onto the leash of an empire built on the backs of slavers, cannibals, and raiders, you can't blink for even a second, and you can't have your authority questioned. It's fine, I guess. Doesn't bother me anymore. Silence again. Finally, she spoke. I hope in our time together you've come to at least appreciate what I've created. I nodded. I can't imagine what it must take to stay on top of everything you built. And that's the point I'd like to stress to you. Before I came along, there was mass lawlessness. A hundred different gangs, groups, survivalists all scratching and clawing at each other, feeding off each other's carcasses. For what? One more day of miserable existence. Eben removed the cap she usually wore. Suddenly, in the firelight, she looked tired for the first time since I'd known her. I gave them a purpose. It wasn't easy, and it sure as hell wasn't pretty. A lot of people died, but a lot of people would have died anyways without order. The difference? I built a civilization from the pools of blood I spilled. No more just surviving, building, advancing, growing. She paused, looking into the flames. I wonder, sometimes, you know, did I save more than I killed? You said it yourself, Evan. People would have died either way. She nodded thoughtfully. I knew you'd see it my way. Remember that. Remember what it took to get on top of all these different groups. And remember what will happen if there's no one to hold on to those reins. I cocked my head in surprise. Is something… No. But what's coming? Nobody's going to be the same after it. And some of us might not make it. In the distance, Lilith and Alexis's voice sounded their imminent arrival. Eben stood up, putting the cap back on her head and the stoic mask back on her face. She was no longer tired, sitting by a fire and seeking… what? Comfort? Validation? She was the Iron Lady once more. You're smart enough to know why I asked you to come along. And with that, she left. Wait, what did she… Was she seriously insinuating that she wanted me to take over if something happened to her? And what if I didn't? What if there was no one left to hold onto the reins of a hundred different gangs of raiders, cannibals, and psychopaths? Days 857 to 862. The weather improved as we made our way down the mountain. It was almost a shame to leave them. We'd occasionally gotten breaks in the clouds to see the stars again after years of dust and smog, but up in the mountains the breaks were more frequent. I'd nearly forgotten what a starry sky looked like. I imagine that we could have a lot of nights like that in our little cul-de-sac in Big Bear. And then, as always, I remembered the ticking time bomb in my brain. Days 863 to 868. I'd been keeping a tight leash on that smoldering fire deep in my subconscious for two months now, allowing myself to snap and lose all control in small, discreet bursts far from praying eyes. 
But the truth was, I was looking forward to what was coming, even as I feared what might happen to the people I loved traveling with me. I was looking forward to the violence I did not want to commit. Days 869 to 872. The attack came at night. One of our sentries took an arrow to the throat, but the shot wasn't completely accurate. He managed to let off a low, gurgling yell before going down, enough to alert the rest of us. The Fuego was in control once more, responding to violence by instinct. I was both unrestrained rage and cold, calculating death. I slipped out of Alexis's and I shared tent with ease, plunging into the darkened woods and far from the firelight. I found them there, at least half a dozen raiders on my side of the camp. They weren't looking into the shadows around them. They were too busy, firing at figures backlit by three campfires. I didn't use my rifle. It would have been too loud. Besides, I wanted something more satisfying. I needed to do this close and very personal. The first died from a stab to the base of the neck, instantly severing the nerves connecting the brain to the spinal column and the rest of the body. The only thing living about him was his brain as his dead body hit the floor. With the lungs no longer breathing, the brain would black out in 7 or 8 seconds from lack of oxygen. Until then, all he could do was stare with unblinking eyes as I moved to his friend. My knife found two more throats. Other times it slid between ribs, piercing through the side to stab across the lungs and into the heart itself. The fuego was raging, but I wasn't a mindless animal like I'd been after a full dose in the arena. I was methodical, my brain switching off everything that didn't matter and only bothering with what did. Anatomy lessons, silent takedown techniques. It was only a few minutes after the firing had stopped that I'd snapped out of my trance-like state, stalking the shadows for attackers that were no longer there. I hadn't even noticed the bloody slash across my side raking my ribs. Even now the pain didn't come, just an awareness that my body was damaged and that it needed to be repaired. The Aztecos had crafted the perfect combat supplement, even if it inevitably burned your brain up from within. Days 873 to 875. We moved well off the highway to take stock and recoup after a nighttime attack. A search of the bodies revealed no obvious sign of affiliation with any group. Random raiders, obviously taking advantage of the relaxed patrols, since the Iron Lady had gone to full-scale war against the Aztecos. Alexis tended to my wound. Now that the Fuego was asleep in my brain again, it hurt like hell. I must not have been quick or quiet enough. Someone had a chance to lash out with their own blade, raking it across my ribs in a downward stroke. But my ribs weren't broken and they had done their job, deflecting the blade from cutting deeper into my torso. Something's different. Annie told me about the arena. Alexis was changing my bandage, making me wince a bit as it pulled from my bruised and lacerated flesh. I merely grunted in response. I hadn't told her any details, especially not about the Fuego or Vaquero, but it would have been impossible to hide what I'd been through. New scars crisscrossed my body from dozens of fights. I can't tell you how grateful I am to have you back to have you by my side again, but sometimes I feel like you're still back there." I grunted in agreement. She didn't know the half of it, but I didn't know what to say. She finished bandaging me up, then grabbing my face in her hand, she smiled and gave me a long kiss. It's okay. I love you and I'm here. Always. Days 875 to 879. We were off the highway, now that it was obvious it wasn't as safe as we'd believed. Rather than going through the heart of Barstow, we went around it, moving along the outskirts. There was probably some good salvage left in a town this size, and any original inhabitants had been killed by the massive fallout plumes coming from Vegas. There was no telling if anyone knew had taken up residence, since the Iron Lady's patrols had waned in the area. It was better not to risk it, but I was becoming increasingly nervous about how long our trip was taking and what the troops would do if we were significantly late. Eben merely shrugged off my concerns, promising that everything had been accounted for already. I didn't doubt that the Iron Lady had planned for any contingency, and that's what scared me. Days 880 to 885. We headed north to Pahrump. We'd have to go around Mount Charleston, but this was as close as you could get to Vegas and remain safe. Even two and a half years after being obliterated, Las Vegas was still too radioactive to approach. Whoever hit it, the Chinese, the Russians, had wanted it dead, really badly. When we got to Pahrump itself, several riders on horseback made their way toward us. I could feel the violence rising inside of me, but the Iron Lady merely held up a hand as people reached for their rifles. A few minutes later, I saw why. They wore the emblem of the Army of the Dawn on their lapels. These were her people, scouts who would take us around Mount Charleston via a secret route, cutting our travel time in half and putting us right outside Indian Springs. Days 886 to 889. A mountain is still a mountain. 
and even more treacherous to cross when you have to take shelter regularly from freak rainstorms. This close to Vegas, the rain was highly radioactive, and we were forced to shelter in our tents for hours at a time until the freak downpours passed by us. The mountain was causing low clouds to accumulate, resulting in the routine downpours. I couldn't help but wonder just how many years we were shaving off our lives via exposure, and if we wouldn't have been better off going around the damn mountain in the first place. But Evan had her reasons as usual. Bandit and raider activity north of Pahrump was on the rise. Nobody controlled the wastes of northern Nevada, but there was a rumor that something or someone was controlling all these raider groups down south, putting enough pressure on them to force them to dislocate and seek victims elsewhere. Days 890 to 891. Something was wrong. Something was terribly wrong. We finally made our way out of the mountain and once more to the flat desert. Indian Springs lay just before us, just a few miles in the distance. But there was no army waiting for us, just plumes of smoke in the direction of our travel. Eben seemed unfazed, deflecting my questions and merely telling me to hurry up and keep moving. Everything's under control, she said. Alexis could barely conceal her hatred of her. Annie remained impassive as usual, but I noticed that her hands were never far from either her rifle or her pistol. Lilith made no attempt to hide her disgust of the Iron Lady and everything she stood for, but traveling in a group of her closest confidants and guards, she was wise enough not to voice it too often. Now though, all four of us couldn't shake the growing pit in our stomachs. Something was definitely wrong. Days 892 to 895. Bodies had been gathered, stripped of useful equipment, and either thrown into a mass grave or prepared for funeral pyres. The Iron Lady's warriors got the honorary pyres. The settlers who had once called Indian Springs home were all thrown into one large pit. Nobody had bothered to try to cover it up. They merely wanted the dead out of the way. The fighting had been brutal, that was immediately obvious, but the Iron Lady's forces had made good use of our intelligence. They managed to kill most of the settlers' leadership by sending a group pretending to seek terms, only to have each member pull the pin on homemade explosive vests. I was shocked to hear this, but a growing fanatical movement had taken root within the ranks of the Army of the Dawn in response to the desperate fighting against the Aztecos, a cult dedicated to the worship of the Iron Lady herself. For her part, she merely shrugged her shoulders and mentioned that every tool in a toolbox was useful. Part of me abhorred her casual disregard for these poor fanatics. Another part, a much darker part, admired her willingness to use their suicidal fanaticism in such a brilliant, cold-blooded way. Thrown into disarray by the death of most of their leadership, the army attacked, but the settlers were well armed, using mortars and heavy machine guns to repel the attack. The fighting had been brutal and costly, but the Army of the Dawn had secured an absolute bonanza in military equipment. Enough to make their loss in manpower worth it, commented the Iron Lady. Her generals agreed with her, and that's the way she saw the world, even her own people, a loss-gain calculation that must remain in the net positive, or at the very least in equilibrium. What I didn't understand is why the hell she'd brought me here if she had already commanded her forces to attack without us. Days 896 to 897. I wanted you to see the cost of victory. I wanted you to get a tangible feel for what it takes to win wars and save the people you love. We were in one of the large hangars that had once housed US Air Force drones and planes. Now it was the central collection point for the booty the Army of the Dawn had accumulated from their victory, both material and human. The settlers here had fought like fanatics themselves. Most had died with a gun in their hands, but some were too old or sick to fight. A few men, women, and children hadn't fought at all. The healthy ones who'd make good slaves had been gathered here. The rest, the Iron Lady had given permission to be used for food or entertainment. Alexis and Lilith had left, moving away from the carnage of the battle and the aftermath. Despite everything we'd been through, I'd never once seen hatred in Alexis's eyes until now. She couldn't be around this, not without putting a bullet in the Iron Lady's head. Annie shook her head, stoic as usual, but allowing herself a brief moment of emotion. This wasn't right. This isn't how we do things. Oh, it isn't, is it? The Iron Lady fired back. My soldiers pulled the trigger, but it was your bullets and their guns. Don't you forget that. I'll never forgive Ruslana for this, for any of this. Annie spat on the ground, taking in all the loot and the captives roped together along the hangar's walls. They sat on the ground, looking dirty and neglected. Most of them would be sold as slaves. Some eaten. Others worse. Annie spun on her heel, storming out of the hangar. Your people all suffer from the delusion that you can rebuild civilization with wishful thinking and good intentions. I'm glad you're not so naive. I mulled over my response. You're not wrong, but you're not always right. All this, what you did here, someone somewhere is going to hear about it. Maybe someone got away. Maybe a traitor tells the story selling off some of your slaves. However it happens, people will hear about it. 
about what you did here, and they'll hate you for it, just like they hate you for everything else you've done. And they'll teach others to hate you for it. Somewhere, sometime, that'll come back to you, to everything you've built. That's why it's important to be strong. You don't think I want a better world than this? Come on, you're not that stupid. You and I both know, both understand, that if you want to build a better world, the first thing you have to do is bring it to heal. She wasn't right, but she wasn't wrong either. Days 898 to 899. Alexis cried in my arms, all the grief, pain, frustration, outrage from the last two and a half years coming out at one single moment of weakness. I held her as she sobbed through all of it. Through the end of the world, the people we lost, the things we or the people we loved had done trying to build something better from the ashes, our compromises in the attempt at a compromise. Alexis cried and I held her close, my face buried in her hair, so no one could see that I was crying too. Day 900. The Army of the Dawn had brought a convoy of vehicles with them and commandeered more from their spoils. Now, a caravan loaded with enough firepower to outfit a small army made it ready to head south back toward the Iron Lady's territory. The four of us were headed southwest back toward Farmbridge in a truck the Iron Lady had given to us. Once our expeditionary force was ready, we would head east toward Havasu to reinforce the Army of the Dawn. Victory would mean more than playing defense, though. We'd likely have to push southeast into Phoenix, the seat of power for the Aztecos north of the border. War was coming to the former southwestern United States. The sound of two dozen engines rumbling to life made it difficult to hear the approaching aircraft until they were nearly on top of us. Suddenly, though, everyone seemed to hear it at once, and we all craned our heads up toward the sky, searching through the clouds. A moment later, there it was. A gray-blue shape breached through the bottom of the clouds, revealing the broad wings of a C-27 with the logo of the United States Air Force on both sides of the fuselage. It rumbled directly over us, dispersing small canisters which floated down on parachutes and burst open in mid-air. For a moment, I thought about diving for cover, but then I realized the canisters weren't bombs. They were dropping leaflets, hundreds of them. I snatched one as it fell, staring at it incredulously. I turned it over in my hand, but both sides said the same thing in big, bold letters. You are not forgotten. You were not abandoned. America remains. Radio address from the President of the United States of America in two days. Tune in to the AM frequencies listed below. It was strange to be riding in a vehicle again after so long. What was it now? Three years since the end of the world? I could have never imagined I'd miss the feeling of tires on asphalt. I turned the flyer delivered by the US Air Force plane a day ago over and over in my hand. There was so much happening all at once. The Iron Lady, war with the Aztecos, the genocide at Indian Springs, and now the US government making its presence known for the first time since nuclear war began. The Flyers promised a speech from the President himself in one more day, broadcast across a multitude of AM frequencies. None of us spoke much on the drive back to Farmbridge. Alexis was still processing the shock of the genocide at Indian Springs, a genocide made possible by Ruslana sharing supplies and intelligence on the settlement with the Iron Lady. Yet another deal struck with the devil, in the name of the greater good. I wondered just how much good was left of any of us after three years of this hell. Well, any of us except Alexis. She was the only one of us that hadn't betrayed her conscience in any way. Annie had killed with me and lied to the others about some of the things I did to the raiders up in Big Bear to get intelligence. Lilith had never been quite the same after she was taken by the same cannibals who killed Annie's brother. In another life, she probably would have been a streamer or something silly like that. And with her bubbly personality, she would have been a hit too. But in this world, she taught herself how to kill, determined to never become a victim again. Despite that, it was hard to suppress that happy personality. Since Indian Springs, she hadn't said a word though. Watson rode in the bed of the truck, so he could keep an eye out on anyone approaching, he said. Truthfully, I think he was having a hard time processing Indian Springs. In typical Watson fashion, he retreated back into his inner fortress of solitude to process his own emotions. If he wanted to share, he'd share. Otherwise, you weren't getting a word out of that man. There wasn't much to say when we arrived home. We gave a report on the assault on Indian Springs, which Rusalana listened to with pursed lips. If she felt remorse, guilt, anything at all, she didn't let on. Her command mask was in place. It unnerved me how much it reminded me of the Iron Lady. The Flyers had landed in Farmbridge, too, and in the late afternoon, most of the settlement gathered to hear the President of the United States speak for the first time in nearly three years. My fellow Americans. The President's voice sounded strange to me after all this time. It sounded strained at first, but quickly grew resolute. My fellow survivors, you've not been forgotten. The terrible war that has consumed much of our beloved nation, of our world, is finally at an end. 
Via one of the few surviving links to the Russian and Chinese leadership, an unconditional peace has been reached. This war has no victors, only losers. Despite this, we must rebuild. We will rebuild. You who survive, from the ruins of Washington to the wastes of California, you are not forgotten. I speak to you now from a secure location where your government has endured. Our armed forces which survived conflict in the Asian and European theaters and other flashpoints abroad have been recalled home. The United States Navy retains the capability to transport many of our survivors home. Others will have to wait and have been instructed to fortify against the chaos of this new world and wait for rescue. For you who survive in the homeland, your government has not abandoned you. From our strong positions in the East, we will once more re-establish civilization. America will rise from the ashes of this catastrophe as it arose from the ashes of our revolutionary conflict which birthed this great nation, from the Civil War that nearly tore it apart, and from two world wars that threatened to swallow it up. Soon, recovery assistance as well as reconnaissance and damage assessment teams will begin to reach out to the largest of survivor settlements. I ask that you welcome them and assist them in the task of rebuilding this great nation. The days ahead will be tough, the nights long, but there will be a new dawn, and together we will make America whole and strong once more. God bless you wherever you are, and God bless our great nation." Static hissed for a long time before anyone said anything. Wow, Robbie was the first to break the silence. He didn't even say who started the war. Russia, no doubt. Ruslana was unusually animated, spitting on the ground twice. Losing in Ukraine, back against the wall, what did anyone expect from them? I shook my head. No way they'd be that suicidal. That pilot we rescued up in Big Bear, the one from the crashed military plane, he said the coasts got hit first. Alexis was talking about Tomlin, the guy I rescued from a crashed Osprey, who'd been in a coma up until he wasn't and inadvertently outed me as a liar to all of Big Bear, leading to my exile. But he wasn't really sure who hit first. It just went on like that, tit for tat, one city for another. Lilith stamped her foot down. It doesn't matter. The president's all the way in the east somewhere in some fancy bunker, and he thinks, what? We're just gonna all pitch in and rebuild the good old US of A? Ha! Huh, tell that to the iron bitch. Ask her to lay her weapons down, see how that goes. Lilith had a point. The conversation went on all night, the people seeming to settle into two different camps. One was optimistic about the idea of reforming our nation. The other didn't see the point. We were on our own. And even if this great rebuilding took place, it would take years for US forces to get all the way out here and make everything secure. I slowly backed out of the conversation and snuck away while everyone was engaged in debate. It didn't matter much to me either way. The Fuego would take me long before there was any kind of order being re-established again. My only concern was doing the best I could for the people I loved as long as I could, and I wasn't going to let anyone, Iron Lady or the United States of America get in the way. The next few days, Farmbridge was livelier than usual. It was preparing for war, but the president's message had also sparked an ongoing debate and seemed to be all everyone was talking about. Caravans came in daily bringing soldiers and supplies as the new republic's army prepared for its first deployment. Something uncomfortable gnawed at me though, thoughts I didn't quite want to put into words out of fear of making them true. I sought out the only other person I knew would be having the same gnawing worry I was. Watson had taken upon himself to teach everyone survival skills. Given his years in the mountains, he was a pro at it. He worked with small groups of our senior most soldiers, honing their skills so they could teach others. Others might not have seen it, but I did. We were at the earliest stages of creating a professional army, and professional armies trumped thugs and raiders any day of the week. I found him taking a break inside a small woodworking workshop the community had built. He was fond of the place, and though logs were pretty rare out in the desert, there was all matter of salvaged wood from the ruins around us that could be reworked into something useful. You feel it too, don't you? Something's not right with this, all of this. Watson grunted as he sanded a rough wooden horse. You like it? It's for Alana. Thought she might like it. Alana was in her late 20s, not a child anymore. You know what? I bet she will like it. I took a seat opposite Watson and let him work in silence for a few moments longer. I always suspected Watson had lost a daughter back in the old world. Though the gruff mountain man had never mentioned it, and I knew better to ask. The small toy he was making confirmed my suspicions. Whoever he lost, she'd been young when it happened. Watson cleared his throat before speaking. <clears throat> you and I both spent months with the Iron Lady, in her territory, with her people. Seems awful strange she's losing ground so rapidly, don't it? Aztecos are pretty fearsome. We've both seen them in battle, and there's a whole horde of them attacking out of Arizona. And yet, the Iron Lady's got vehicles, heavy weapons, old military hardware. Not the best stuff, but enough, and she's losing this much territory this quickly? I knew what he was getting at because it'd been eating inside of me too, a small gnawing doubt growing into a black hole in the pit of my stomach. 
We can't just tell Ruslana to not send troops, she'll collapse, for sure, and feed the beast. By this time next year, we'll be facing an Azteco horde twice as big and by ourselves. Watson nodded in agreement. No, we can't. But we can keep our eyes and ears open while we march east. If our shared suspicion is true, we'll need a plan. From what I've seen, the Army of the Dawn's like a rabid raccoon. Its sick, infected brain tells the body where to go, what to lash out at. Put a bullet in its head, though, and it'll drop right dead. Now it was my turn to nod in agreement. It won't just be her. There's a few others she trusts, but only a few that are truly close to her. They'll need to go, too. Then we'd better strike fast and accurately. You've been saying we a lot, old man. Does mean you're going east, too? Watson stopped, turning the wooden toy over and over in his hands. It's the best way to keep Claire and Alana safe, even if it gets ugly. Watson went back to his standing. After a minute, I stood up and left. Outside, I heard Robbie calling out to me. He came rushing up, a bit out of breath. There you are. Ruslana's looking for you. She wants to talk to you about something. All right, take me to her. She's over at the firing range. Hey, there's some of the Iron Lady's people here. Liaisons or whatever, you know, for the March East. Ruslana doesn't trust them, so she's got me and a few others watching them 24-7. Sounds smart. And it did, too. Ruslana was no fool. These liaisons were just as likely soaking up as much intelligence on farm bridge as possible during their stay. Yeah, she's smart, always looking for spies. Anyway, they were talking about you a lot. You know what they call you? I shook my head. I wasn't surprised they'd be talking about me given how much time I'd spent alongside the Iron Lady over the last year and a half. The Scout. You know, because I guess you were a scout in the army or something. Anyway, that's a pretty cool nickname. I mean, you could do better for post-apocalypse nightmare, but still cool. I laughed with Robbie as he led me to Ruslana. He was right, I really could do better. Ruslana was overseeing a new class at the firing range. These weren't our soldiers, these were normal people staying behind. The Marines had a saying, every Marine a rifleman. Ruslana had her own saying, today, everyone's a rifleman. I waited until the class ended and the deafening roar of rifles ceased before joining Ruslana. Hey, thank you for coming. Sorry I made you wait. You have time to talk? I nodded. Good, come with me. We walked to one of the cleaning benches where Ruslana began disassembling her rifle to clean it. The rest of the class was on their own benches cleaning their own rifles as well. Ruslana ran a tight ship. We need to talk to you about Alexis. My ears immediately pricked up. She's talking, telling people about Indian Springs, about what I, what we did. The cooperation with the Iron Lady, the slaughter. I knew Alexis was upset about giving the Army of the Dawn critical intelligence and all the weapons and ammo they needed to take Indian Springs, resulting in the genocide or enslavement of the entire settlement. She's saying it was wrong what we did. Others are agreeing. We, well, we're not a democracy, not yet. One day I hope, but not yet. Still, I do not want to tell her to shut up. Freedom of speech and all that. But she's making things difficult, and things are about to be difficult enough, yes? I didn't say anything. One day, talk, debate, sure, these things are good, but maybe not today, not yet. I nodded. I promised I'd speak with Alexis. What I'd say, though, I had no clue. Ruslana was right to be worried. Alexis had been talking a lot, and a lot of people were agreeing with her, even people from other settlements. A wave of discontent was spreading across the brand new republic. People did not like the Faustian bargain we apparently struck with the Iron Lady. I have to admit, I was surprised. Maybe not all Wasteland survivors were diehard pragmatists. Maybe there really was hope for Alexis's dream of what the Republic could be. But this discontent could also spell disaster right when the newly born Republic was facing its first real test. It had taken a lot of hard work, a lot of sacrifices to get here. Alexis and I lay in bed together, she the little spoon to my big spoon. Ruslana wanted me to talk to you. I immediately felt her body stiffen, then slowly relax again, very slowly. Oh, and what'd you have to say to me? I stayed quiet for a minute. I've been thinking about this all day, but I hadn't really decided what I was going to say. I know you're unhappy about what happened. I don't blame you. Ruslana wants to pretend her, our hands are clean, just because we didn't pull the trigger ourselves, but we facilitated it. We made it possible. You got to see it from her point of view. She's got a whole settlement, hell, an entire nation now to worry about. And those people weren't going to trade or share what they had. And without it, so we just kill whoever's in our way? Sorry, no, we let other people do the killing so we can say our hands are clean. All for the greater good, right? I was silent again. Longer than a minute this time. No, you're right. You should keep talking to people. Tell them the truth. Just, I don't know. This is a difficult time. Things just might get even more difficult. The Republic needs to be united. Alexis sighed. One of her deep, soul-weary sighs that made me hurt inside because I never wanted her to sigh like that again. But she did. They just kept coming. Okay, I'll tone down the rhetoric. She backed up an inch to press tighter against me. I rolled her over so she was facing me. I need you to know you're everything that's good in the world. 
You're all the best parts of me, all of them. Then I kissed her, a long, deep kiss. I don't want you coming east, not this time. Alexis gave me a quick peck and then rolled back over so she was my little spoon again. I wasn't planning on it. Me and Lilith were staying behind. I never want to see something, something like that again. And I would do everything in my power to make sure she never did. Just promise me you'll come back home. She squeezed my hand as she settled her head into the nook below my chin and closed her eyes. I grunted in response. I don't make promises I couldn't keep anymore. Another week rolled by. Farmbridge's population grew exponentially as soldiers from each of the settlements arrived. Farmbridge was already the biggest of the settlements in SoCal, but its population grew by 50%, big enough that people were having to pitch tents outside protective walls. But nobody feared an attack. Right now, we had a greater concentration of firepower than any place in California, I was willing to bet. Clay showed up along with a group of people and I was glad to see a familiar face. It's always nice to go to war with friends by your side. It was nicer when they brought friends along who were largely hardened combat veterans from America's wars in the Middle East. Clay's people were mostly former soldiers, marines, and sailors, with a few airmen sprinkled in. They were the Sparta to our Athens. They were the military superpower in the Republic, and we were the cultural and political power. I'd hoped we wouldn't go to war with each other anytime soon. So far, things looked optimistic. A welcome change of pace. He introduced me to his girlfriend who'd come along with a group of volunteers to set up a logistics center at Farmbridge, where the Republic could more easily funnel supplies to its expeditionary army. They were a cute couple, been together for a few years before the war. I wondered why they'd never gotten married, but I didn't push the issue. The days seemed to speed by, the entire settlement filled with the nervous energy of an army about to deploy, and the pending heartbreak of its loved ones eagerly awaiting its return. Some of them would get their wish, others would get nothing more than even more heartbreak. Lucky'd been extra clingy lately, though he was excited by all the new friends. That dog could sense every time I was about to leave though, and stuck to me like a shadow for the course of the week. For my part, I made sure to give him extra pets and hugs every chance I could. Robbie seemed torn. He wanted to join the army and march with us, but Ruslana had instituted a policy. No family would send their only son or daughter, and as Robbie only had his sister as surviving family, she decided that technically that counted. The time would come when everyone might have to give everything, but not yet. For now, Ruslana did not want any family to bear such complete, devastating burden. I agreed. It was sensible. At last, the day to march came. 1,058 combat-ready troops, well-trained, well-disciplined. Not quite a professional army yet, but on its way. Everyone wore old US military fatigues as well, a move strongly endorsed by Clay's people who had supplied the uniforms. Uniforms meant uniformity, a shared identity. We were no longer a ragtag group of survivors banding together and huddling in makeshift tents. We were, what the president say? Ah uh, yes, nation builders. The California Republic was marching to war. We all said our tearful goodbyes. Clara gave Watson a lock of her hair, which she immediately kissed and tucked away inside a pocket. Like a lady from the Middle Ages saying farewell to her knight, I hugged Alexis tight, breathing in the smell of her skin deeply so I could capture it and hold it as a memory forever. Next to us, Annie hugged a sobbing and wailing Lilith, who apparently was letting out all the emotion everyone else was keeping locked up inside. Finally, I hugged Robbie and Meg goodbye. Robbie wishing me good luck and turning on my heel, joined the army on the march. Once more, the family was split apart. Annie, Watson, and myself shouldering our rifles and walling up the aching pain in our hearts. I thought about Alexis, I thought about that little cul-de-sac at Big Bear, where we all could have our own house and live together. I tried not to think about the slowly burning fire in my brain growing stronger, louder with every step east. We had what was in effect a battalion of troops, split up into three oversized companies. Each company had one heavy weapons platoon, which typically consisted of two strikers and two dismounted squads, with either a 50 cal machine gun or two M240s. The composition wasn't exactly US Army standard, but we weren't exactly US Army. The strikers were old, stuff that had been left in stock as the modern army moved on to better vehicles, but they were a significant addition to our firepower, especially as one was of the mobile gun configuration. I doubted the Aztecos would be packing any sort of mobile firepower, but if they did, it would come in handy. We deployed scouts to flank our main column just in case, but the Aztecos had never showed a real aptitude for tactics. The fact we were moving like a professional military force, though, made me feel a whole lot better about what was to come. When we crossed into the Iron Lady's territory, she had an escort waiting for us. Watson and I immediately requested a meeting with Ruslana before stepping further into her lands. Ruslana had been busy dealing with various logistics and personnel issues. Morale was high, so interpersonal problems weren't really an issue. But anytime a military moves, it suffers from a host of various random problems and hang-ups. 
Soldiers get inadvertently injured or fall ill. It was a full-time job being in command and I didn't envy her task. Finally though, she had time to meet. We walked the perimeter of our camp, out of earshot of the sentries on duty there. The nights weren't quite as dark as they had been. The perpetual cloud cover had cleared somewhat, letting a little bit of moon and starlight through. Watson and I, we need to leave. Temporarily. We'll rejoin you guys in a few days. Ruslana cocked an eyebrow at me. What's this? Right when I need you to the most? Listen, darling. Watson interrupted her with his mountain drawl. Something ain't shaking right here. The Iron Lady's territory is three times the size of ours. She's been doing nothing but losing to the Aztecos this whole time. I ain't buying it. She pursed her lips, a familiar crease formed on her brow, like it did every time a new disaster reared its head, which seemed to be every other day since the world ended. You think this is a trap? I shook my head vigorously. No, not a chance. We're way too heavily armed. She's smarter than that. She knows taking this force out would cost her three, four times our number. She might have more men, but we're better trained and equipped, and she knows it. Watson spit on the ground. Not a trap, but she's planning on getting us used up in the fighting, getting weak. And when we're weak, we got a sneaking suspicion she's going to be sending a reserve force west across the border. Ruslana thought for a moment. What's your plan then? Watson and I know this territory well. We'll slink away, do some scouting. It's what I'm good at. Try and locate this reserve force. If nothing's there, all good. If not though, now Ruslana spit on the ground. We're screwed. You cut the head off a rabbit raccoon and the body will die, sure as shit. Watson had steel in his eyes. There was an edge to him that hadn't been there before he got married. Ruslana thought long and hard. I had a feeling I knew most of the thoughts going on through her mind. An assassination, even if it was cutting the head off a poisonous snake, not an auspicious start to a new republic. I can't be involved in any way. Alexis has made things difficult back home. You two do what you need to do. I don't want to know any details. Just let me know if you find this reserve force out there. Ruslana left without a further word, leaving Watson and I to contemplate our next move in the dark. I told Annie I had to go, but I'd be back. She didn't question me, merely gave me a long look before nodding. Somehow that was even worse. Watson and I easily slipped past the sentries and out to the night. We were dressed in civilian clothing carrying regular rifles so as to look like a pair of regular survivors. Our knowledge of the Army of the Dawn let us easily get through any checkpoints or patrols that we encountered. To my surprise, I was recognized a few times. I guess that was the price to pay for having spent so much time as the Iron Lady's special guest. I didn't even want to know what wild rumors were floating around about her and I, but I could guess. We had to move fast. In four days, our forces would arrive at the front, and if I was missing, the Iron Lady would get suspicious. Luckily, I had a good idea of where to head. Havasu City was the capital of the Iron Lady's empire. Not only had it survived the war, but it was built right on the shores of Lake Havasu and the Colorado River fed directly into it. No place had truly safe drinking water anymore, but with filters at least you wouldn't die as fast. On the south end of the lake, where the Colorado outflowed and went south to Mexico, were the pens. This was where most of the surrounding areas and all of the Iron Lady's military forces had livestock processed. The river carried the steady stream of blood, guts, and animal filth downstream and out of the local drinking channels. The pens was a sprawling compound at least a quarter mile big. I heard similar butcheries had been set up back in the Middle Ages for big population centers. Not all animals here were killed right away, only a select amount every day. Without refrigeration, fresh meat had a very short shelf life. And not all animals were actually animals. The Iron Lady had at least decreed that the human livestock be kept separate from the animals, not for humane reasons but to prevent the spread of animal to human disease. The entire miserable complex was like the exposed heart of the Army of the Dawn itself. I wished I could burn it all to the ground. It didn't take long to corner one of the slaves working at the butchery, the animal side of the butchery that is. Slaves were taught to be obedient to all free folk, and anyone was free to punish a slave that was out of line. It was shocking how quickly the world had turned modern average people into subservient slaves or outright monsters. The guy looked up at me with fear in his eyes as I ushered him into the corner of one of the work shacks, which could have been my bank teller three years ago. I'm not gonna hurt you, unless you lie to me or waste my time, understand? I could feel the fuego warm in my brain. Just the tease of violence was enough to rouse it from its slumber. The slave eagerly nodded his head. I was confident he wouldn't lie. The penalty for lying was the loss of one of your limbs. And that meant you were no longer useful. And then it was off to the pens with you. Food shipments, not east. To the fighting, somewhere else, big ones. You see or hear anything? The slave looked confused. Sir, I, I, we process large shipments for local sediments outside Havasu all the time. I shook my head. No. 
This would be recent, in the last two months or so. The slave thought hard, which was made more difficult every time he looked up at Watson. Watson wasn't trying to be intimidating, he was just being Watson. But man, that face was hard as a mountain, and I'd only ever seen Alana or Clara crack a smile from that weathered granite. I, I mean, sir, yes, for the army, but I'm sorry, I don't know where it was going, just somewhere north. Watson and I exchanged a quick glance. Our suspicions had been confirmed. Wish I could say I was surprised, but nothing surprised me about the Iron Lady anymore. I was glad I was at least keeping up with her schemes, though. I was learning. Suddenly, one of the foremen walked into the shack. He was wielding a large club and looked angry. Hey now, you can't be harassing my workers, and you better not have been in here abusing it either. I need it in working condi- Hey, you're that scout fella, the one that got the medal and the lashes. Fire roared to life in my brain. Maybe it had been the tease with the slave, maybe it was the deep hate of this place that had only grown since stepping inside this house of misery. Maybe I was just starting to lose it, like Vaccaro had warned before I blew his brains out. I lashed out with the right hook, catching the foreman completely by surprise. He staggered backward and I followed it with a knee straight to his gut, doubling him over. I spotted the large knife on a leather sheath on his belt. Moments later, I buried it in the man's spine. Next thing I knew, Watson was hurling me forward as we both ran out of the pens. When we were in the clear, we finally stopped to catch our breath. I had no idea what had happened. Did someone spot us? All I remember was the knife in the spine and then running. Did I kill that slave? Watson turned around and slapped me across the face hard. Hell's wrong with you, boy? You done lost your damn mind? I didn't even flinch from the slap. The fuego made you fast and strong, but it also dulled pain. I concentrated on the burning willed it away, willed the flames to quench. When I was sure I wouldn't murder Watson, I finally talked. I told him everything, about the arena, the fuego, about murdering Vaccaro. Nobody knows, not even Annie. That's a tough break, kid. I liked you. Watson reshouldered his rifle and started walking away. I was stunned. Then I rushed to catch up. That's all you got to say? The hell you want me to say? You know your fate? Ain't no word gonna change that or matter one lick. At least you're trying to do something meaningful first. I respect that. We both walked in silence for a bit. Thanks, I guess. Watson mm -hmm, his approval. Just one thing. If the Lord sees fit to let us cross that border home again, I ever think you're a threat to the family, I kill you. Honestly, I wouldn't expect or want anything less, but I plan on being gone long before that. Watson mm -hmm, one more time, then we moved, putting as much distance between us and the pens as possible. The good thing about living in a post-apocalyptic raider punk alternate reality is that murders are common enough. Nobody investigates much. It was illegal per the Iron Lady's rules, but unless you got caught in the act, nobody was really going to make a huge fuss about it. We left Havasu City and marched southeast. It wasn't hard to guess where the fighting was. A steady stream of supply convoys left Havasu for the front every day. An army marches on its stomach and is in constant need of resupply of everything from bullets to underwear. I'll say this about the Iron Lady. She'd made the road safe again in her territory. That was an incredible achievement, something the Republic struggled with to this day. This allowed us to make good time, and we didn't even have to set a watch at night as we camped. The night before we were due in camp, we managed to catch up, sharing the news with Ruslana. She'd invited all of her commanders into the briefing along with Annie. The group discussed plans amongst themselves. They couldn't just turn around and march back now. The army of the dawn would assume we were either reneging on our deal or trying to surprise attack Havasu. Either way, we were deep in enemy territory and surrounded, on all sides. But Ruslana told them about our plan. The assembled commanders agreed, but just in case they dispatch messengers back home at double speed to let them know to expect a possible surprise attack, the Republic could still muster a significant defense force, but the fighting would be brutal and costly, and there was no guarantee of a victory. It quickly became clear that everything rested on my ability to get close to the Iron Lady when she was vulnerable, no matter the cost. Don't worry, I'll keep your secret, again. Annie was tossing her boots off in our shared tent. Watson was out somewhere, leaving just us two. She finished taking her boots off and then bent down to open up my sleeping bag and slide in. She lay there with her back pressed to me. We did this often when we traveled together. It wasn't sexual or romantic. It had started out as a necessity during cold up in Big Bear, but we kept doing it. It was like sleeping next to a sibling, and it was comforting. It was the only times in the years I'd known her that Annie ever dropped her guard and talked about her life back home, or her dead brother. Honestly wish there was another way. I really want to do things Alexis's way, honestly. Yeah, I think I believe you. Annie didn't say another word all night, and it stung. There were wounded everywhere. The rearmost areas of any front is where casualties and equipment were sorted. If the Iron Lady had enough manpower to take this many casualties while holding off the Aztecos and hide an invasion force, she had a hell of a lot more of it at her disposal than I'd given her credit for. Tents full of cots stretched for 100 meters in both directions 
as we made our way through the camp. Her command post had a row of trenches dug around it about 5 meters wide and 15 deep. It was basically a moat that you had to cross by wooden bridge. She'd learned a lot after her first assassination attempt by the Aztecos, one of two times I'd saved her life. You're ahead of schedule. Excellent. She met us coming out of her tent. Despite being at the front, she was dressed in her traditional uniform and, like always, looked immaculate, not even a hair out of place. She smiled as she saw me. I'd like to request that he act as liaison between our two forces. He knows your people and he knows my people. It's an easy fit. Ruslana nodded her approval. I hadn't even thought about the need for a liaison between the two groups. It made perfect sense. It was basic human resources 101. And just like that, I had all the access I would need. We discussed the front and where best to place our various assets. The Republic's forces would remain intact, Ruslana insisted. It was only natural. Neither side truly trusted the other, and Evan agreed. We would be responsible for shoring up the southern flank. Evan warned us that that's exactly where we'd get hit the hardest in the coming attack, but her people had been bleeding for months and needed a breather. Ruslana and I had expected as much. Naturally, she'd put us where the heaviest fighting would be to weaken us, but after seeing the scope of her casualties, maybe they really did need the relief. Ruslana agreed and set off with Annie to speak to her commanders. Annie gave me one of her typical brief looks as she left the tent. The Iron Lady sighed deeply once we were alone and sat on a chair in front of her map table. You know what's good for keeping an army of psychopaths and maniacs together? What? An even bigger army of even bigger psychopaths and maniacs at your border. Has the fighting been rough? They threw bodies at us for two months straight at our previous position. Had to fall back to here. This is our fifth retreat. They have that many numbers? 30 to 50,000 when this started. Despite myself, my jaw dropped slightly open. How is that possible? South of the border didn't get hit by many nukes. Polar jet stream got all messed up, blew most of the rads from here down south. Then you had disease and chaos, but all in all, they made out a lot better than us. How many do you think they got left? Eben seemed to do some quick calculations in her head. Another 20,000? Most of them all jacked up on the fuego, even bigger doses than you. I was stunned into silence again. How did you know? You mean nobody else been able to tell from that growing red rim around your eyes? Probably thought you were tired. Also, sweetheart, you should know by now. I have people everywhere. So then you know what's going to happen. I do. You're a tough one though physically, but mentally that's more important. It's a battle of will between you and the fuego. Some people last a few weeks, others a few years. I got faith in you. She looked up and smiled at me, a genuine smile. That's why I'm going to ask you to defect and join me. You can bring your woman and your friends if you want. You'll have your own place, safe. I reeled as if I had been physically shoved. What? Defect. Join me. Work with me. Use that little gift of yours to make the world a better place while you can. You know they won't accept you back east, not when it becomes obvious. Eben stopped for a moment, thinking. No, you were planning on doing something incredibly reckless before then, something stupid. Don't. Work with me instead. Why did she make so much damn sense sometimes? The sound of the distant horde was faint. A mass of drug-fueled maniacs that would soon make the earth tremble from its numbers alone. The sound of the drums and various other instruments they used for their various black magic rituals drifted to us in the wind. It was primal, shamanic magic from an ancient Aztec history and the depths of the jungles both. Combined with the powerful fuego and other psychedelic drugs, it filled the horde with courage, strength, and an insatiable hunger for ultraviolence. I felt my own fuego rise up in my brain, almost as if in response to the distant rituals, and then the instruments died, and instead there was the roaring of thousands of maniacs. Now they come. The Iron Lady surveilled the distant plain through night vision. In her command trench was myself, the Iron Lady, a few assistants, and her personal guards. Ruslana and her own people, including Watson and Annie as guards, shared the opposite side of the trench. We were located just off the center, south, and closer to the Republic forces, on a slight hill that gave us excellent view of the battlefield and our lines of defense both. Ruslana turned to one of the men with her. An older man I suspected was one of Clay's people. He had the look of a seasoned professional soldier. The man nodded to her, then reached for a battery-powered radio. Despite the screaming of thousands of psychopaths about to flood our position, he spoke in a calm, almost bored tone. All right, boys, let's give him some of that boom boom. Order relayed. He looked up at the battlefield, finally showing some excitement. This is my favorite part. At first, there was nothing. Then, just as the horde was beginning to materialize in the darkness, several voices shouted from somewhere behind us, Hang it! A moment later, Fire! Several sharp cracks sounded. Already, there were the sounds of Hang it! repeating behind us. The old veteran grinned from ear to ear. Wish we had some proper scouts with radios out there. Could have been working them for the last 10 minutes. But with visibility this limited, no point in chucking long-range rounds around when they're already in short supply. 
A series of explosions lit up the landscape from above. 120mm mortar rounds exploded above the enemy, scattering thousands of anti-personnel submunitions. The resulting mini-explosions on the ground reminded me of popcorn going off. If the old vet grinned any harder, he'd split his skull in two. Anti-personnel. Not as satisfying as HE, but definitely the best show. The sound of our heavy weapons opening up now made any future conversation a shouting match. Our side unleashed hell on earth on the advancing horde, as more anti-personnel mortars exploded on them from above. Yet they kept coming, running through the metal storm even after losing limbs. These were captive, slaves, the sick or unwanted, all expendable and turned into vicious, fearless killers by the power of the fuego. Their job was to soak up our fire, run us out of ammunition for the regular forces that followed in their wake. It was beautiful in a sick way. Tracers from our rapid-fire weapons turned into laser-like streams in the night, cutting into a swath of humanity and bathing the night with blood. The tracers from individual rifles were miniature shooting stars, tearing and ripping their way through a wall of flesh. My vision was running red. I fired with my rifle at the horde, but it wasn't enough. It took everything I had to stop myself from climbing out of the trench and start running at the enemy with nothing but a knife and gnashing teeth. The orgy of violence lasted for hours. There are Karos, regular riflemen, followed on the heels of the screaming horde. But the horde had failed to break our line. Our 120mm mortars and all the firepower we brought to bear finally tipped the balance against the Aztecos for the first time in months. Besides, their arqueros weren't nearly as good shots as our guys, and they didn't have the benefit of defensive trenches. The Aztecos seemed surprised at our arrival. They hadn't brought any of the heavy firepower I knew they had, or maybe this was just a probing attack. Even the few thousand we killed over the night were expendable to an empire built on human flesh. Eventually, the sun began to rise, and with its first few rays the Aztecos withdrew. A cheer went up from our ranks. Victory had been costly, but for the first time in weeks the Aztecos had bled worse than our side. Skipping out on the congratulatory cheering, the Iron Lady retreated to her tent with me in tow. She entered, heading straight for the wash bin. She began washing the grime from her face. She didn't say anything, but she felt tired yet relieved to me. She never admitted, of course. She continued washing her face, speaking between splashes of water. We wouldn't have had a snowball's chance in hell of holding out the next attack if we've taken casualties we took in the last one, before your people got here. Your guns made all the difference. She turned, wiping her face dry, to face me and my gun leveled at her chest. She instinctively reached for her own firearm, but stopped, knowing she'd never get it in time. The Iron Lady was one of the most manipulative, cunning minds I'd ever met. She knew when she was beat. Guess this means you've declined my offer. I told you a while ago, you're not always wrong, but you're not always right either. Eben nodded sadly. It pushed the fuego away. I buried the surprising grief I felt rise up inside of me. You're too dangerous. What you've built out here, and what you were planning on doing with it next? I can't let that happen. I can't let that be what we become. Eben grinned. She got to you, huh? Beat me to it. Come on, don't look confused. I knew this was a tug of war the whole time. I was just hoping you'd see reason. We could have done great things together. I know about the reserves. We already sent messengers to prepare. Of course you figured it out. You're a bright boy. You know how rare that is out here? Stop it. I mean, don't get angry at me for stating the obvious. We could have done great things. You know it. But you made your choice. She motioned to one of her chests by her cot. Let me give you one last piece of advice. Don't use that gun. It'll be a dead giveaway. Go, in there. Warily and with the gun leveled at her, I towed open the chest. Then with my free hand lifted out a small wrist-mounted crossbow, the type that has Teco assassins use. Use that. My last gift to you. I lowered my gun and raised the crossbow, cocking the bolt into position. Remember what I told you, though. Remember what'll happen if nobody's at the reins of this group of psychopaths. I nodded slowly. She was right, as usual. Oh, one more gift. I have people in your camp, Robbie. When he learns what happened here, he'll kill your family. Those were his instructions. My eyes widened despite myself, throwing off my aim slightly as I pulled the trigger on the crossbow. The bolt still managed to punch through her skull, piercing her brain, and granting her a mercifully quick death. Tears streamed from my eyes as I ripped my way out of the tent into the rising sun. I didn't know if they were from grief or rage as I thought about Robbie. She's dead! The Iron Lady's dead! My shout sent the camp into an uproar. None of her commanders responded though. They'd all been dealt with by Watson and the other men with the necessary skills to discreetly kill in the middle of an enemy camp. There would be nobody to challenge me. I held aloft the Azteco crossbow as her body was carried out, and the crows around the tent grew. Azteco assassins! A hundred cannibals, raiders, and slavers howled with grief and anger. I stoked that rage into a burning fury. They tried to cut us off at the head. They killed Our Lady. 
The roar grew to a challenge the best the Aztecos had thrown at us, and I plan on making them pay. Who's with me? Now go find out how this epic story all began with I Survived 100 Days of Nuclear War, or click this other link instead.